Uh, welcome to another episode of Nuns in Space, our episodic tale, or episodic series of Nuns in Space with our hero Scooter, uh, who's uh, flying the ship here, the Monte Carmelo, across space in search of delusion everywhere. Uh, Scooter's right hand is the stand, a freestyle soda machine, a best friend, and a software interface stand. And the crew of the ship is made of a nun from Scooter's childhood, uh, which was explained in the pilot. But you really don't need to know because it's episodic. It's just, a nun, just, just, just some nuns. And Scoots in space. They're in search of the Nichez, a ship that disappeared many, many moons ago. I guess that's not a good thing if you're in space. Yeah, they've passed a ton of moons. So, yeah, m m m many, many moons ago. And they follow strings of delusion across space in search of uh, hopes of finding the chess where the secrets to save the universe are contained. Luckily, whatever is trying to undo the universe is, you know, slowly doing it through delusion. So it's going to take a while. Um, I think that's all you need to know. And each episode's episodic. So that's the setup. Uh, you don't need to know what happened last episode. Usual plot goes, uh, you know, they they try, you know, they do it. You know, it's episodic. They try to do it, and then, uh, you know, maybe they get one step closer, and maybe they get one step further away. And here's our setup. Oh, my friend, you you're looking wonderful. Thank you for buying me a coffee in Los Angeles. Oh, no problem, Antonio. Thanks for saying on air to the public that I hung out with you in Los Angeles. Oh, no, my friend, I was saying it, uh, you know, uh, sarcastically, because you didn't tell me you were, you were in Los Angeles. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid of people, Antonio, even you. So I, I, I didn't tell anyone I was there, except for, well, the listeners that came to the show. Is Dan very, is it, Dan seems like a very nice man. Uh, he is, him and Jeff and Cody, Spencer, everybody, they're so nice. I wish they would have me on the show, but you didn't. Did you tell them you know me? No, because you. Anyway, can you say okay? Is next time you tell me you're in town, could I stay at your house? Of course, you could stay at my house, my friend. Anyway, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the boys and girls, and the friends beyond the binary. It's time for the nuns. In space. Yeah. Okay, that that was a little intense with that noise. Could you just do one more take in case I have to delete it? Is this one of the takes? Is it the nuns in space? That's much better. That's much better. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, my friend, uh, you, do you have my gas money? Okay, and anyway, nuns in space, everybody. Uh, hey, pen pal, it's me. You know, of course, it's your pen pal. I guess I kind of just say that, you know, I never know how to do dear pen pal. It doesn't have to sound a little too formal. It's kind of fun, though, pen pal. Maybe I need to, because I, I do know sometimes need some structure and kind of, dear pen pal. I'm, I'm sitting here sending you an audio letter, uh, thinking of you, or I guess imagining you, and that's where my problems always sometimes start, Pen Pal. And that's where this one started, Pen Pal, because you know, like, uh, you know what they, they say, Pen Pal, I'm not familiar, if you're, if you're probably more familiar than me, but there's a song called Daydream Believer. And I think it's about Sleepy Jean. And I don't know if it's by the Beatles or the Monkees. I'm embarrassed to say a pen pal or someone else. Uh, but none of those probably matter to you anyway. Uh, but I, I'm a, I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm not a, I'm no longer a day, I'm no longer a daydream believer pen pal. I don't think I ever was. I'm a daydream b b comforter because I have this part of me. Uh, you know, that uh, uses daydreams uh, to escape. For, I escape into my daydream thoughts to escape my thoughts. And, you know, Penn Valley, I always figured that was great because I had a place to go, you know. 
where I could at least be, you know, where I, I was actually, com- command, you know, d- metaphorically commanding my own ship. And, you know, I guess as people have tried to understand, I don't think I ever had like an actual construct because I knew their fantasy. I, just my fantasy would be to be competent uh, or I guess more, you know, highly competent in all context, you know, in all contexts where I could be highly incompetent on the other side, and I have this pendulum-like thing. But until this recent thing happened, Pen Pal, I didn't realize, uh, you know, this. I don't know, actually, I didn't record anything, but this this planet, it doesn't matter. I, I, I'm sure I'm going to, like, because I, I have something I'm nervous about here that I'm going to explain to you that, that, that again, this issue is going to come right back up for me to grapple with. Well, let me see if I can explain it to you. So I have this part of me that says that, you know, when I'm in, well, now with the nuns, I actually have an external team of people that agree with this part of me. And the data seems to be kind of skewing in their direction that, uh, if anything in my hands will, will cause, I mean, they're saying it's going to cause the doom of the universe. I usually just have it in the ego way that it's going to cause my doom and trouble. And, you know, if I ever get back to Earth to fix things, you know, the the, the mess I left behind there, it, it kind of did. But it, there's pretty high stakes when you'd think it would lower the stakes, but I, it never works that way. Okay, anything, so anything I do is going to end in doom. That would seem to lower the stakes, but for some reason it makes me made me feel anxious, you know. Yeah, but I never realized. I said, "Well, geez, it's just who I am, or whatever." And then I would just start daydreaming, and I guess that was a way of self-soothing, pen pal, or was it? That's what I innocently thought uh, until I realized that that part of me also raises the stakes. It says, "Ooh, you're going to have some comfort here." When you're perfectly competent uh, or highly competent, obscenely highly competent, uh, then all your troubles are going to go away. If only you could just, you know, see this movie I'm playing for you. Look at how suave you are. And, it's, you know, and I didn't realize how high it ra- 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 raised the stakes, Ben Pal. That not only was it unattainable, me being competent, yeah, unattainable, yeah. Highly obscenely incompetent, uh, but that it, it like set me up so I was on either side. I had a long way to fall, or so it, it was like any. But so why am I talking about the? Oh, because I'm nervous, Ben Pal, and I'm just vacillating between those two states. But how would all? How did it all come up? Right, like, uh, and why am I kind of like you'd say? Well, at least you're not blindly blundering like normal. Or some of the sisters would say that. Also, I get the sisters' names mixed up, and I don't know if I've been doing that all in the recordings. But I think the sisters, because now I just assume, I try not to say their names. But for you, so for you, it's probably even more confusing. Because I wish I would. But so, Sister Leanne, I, I hopefully, is the one I've been playing board games with. And we've been playing games so long, we've kind of run out because uh, we've been trying to do like, you know, games based on not technology. You know, the, the whole blue screen thing, they never figured that out. So, uh, and then we got, so then we got, but like we, uh, I don't know, we've gotten really bored uh, because you can only play these games so many times. Uh, so then we said, uh, we, we each took a board game, board, and we said, let's make our own games and then we'll take turns playing them. Then we realized that we would, we would, so then I came up with this idea just, 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 just recently because it turns out we're neither one of us are great at making a, a whole game. And I said, let's play half of one of my games and half of one of your games, like because the boards line up, they're board, standard board game boards. I don't know if, uh, let's just assume you know what that is, Pen Pal. I guess you'd say it's half of a square, but I think it's half of a rectangle. But so, sister and I, we decided to play ha- like as if it was one game. And I said, "Oh boy, this is going to be fun!" And also, it was a way to introduce our new games in a like in a random way. Also, we, neither one of us we'd kind of had a lot of like letdowns with these new games uh, that we had come up with. And my game was called Finding Gartok because I said, "Well, let me gamify this search for Gartok and maybe my subconscious." 
So it's a quest, you know, two players on the board. You know, you spin the dial. Uh, we have a leftover life, life spinner. I don't know why I said life spin, pal. So uh, finding Gartok, pretty simple. Uh, also pretty much like life, but with Gartok, because that's the board I was using. Um, anyway, not, not that important, but that was the game. And then Sister, she I guess she has a thing for Selena which you might have to look up. Selena uh, was a singer in the 1990s, maybe, Pen Pal. And then there was a movie with uh, J-Lo, who was an actress in the 2000s. And uh, after that, maybe even in the 1990s. Uh, anyway, maybe I may, may have my dates wrong, but Selena was a famous singer that Sister Leanne loved, and I guess she liked the movie. And let's just say, you know, this is a game is called Saving Selena. So why would you need to save Selena? Just play the game. That's what I would say. But play half of it. Uh, but here's where the magic happened. Actually, the games were pretty much both based on life because uh, uh, or some other game. Anyway, it was a bit like life. Uh, and maybe that's why the games are no offense to Milton Bradley or the Barker Brothers or whatever. But uh uh, even renaming the game and changing around. I guess Sister and I, we didn't really build the games from the ground up. We just redid the boards. Uh, but here's where the kicker is, Pen Pals. So she, Sister, in her all her brilliance, she had this career thing with the life. Like at some point in life, you got to choose your career. But Selena had our, like, we. I guess we're some... Uh, um, what is it, omnipotent or whatever, benevolent third party for guiding Selena. But she had this, this career boost section for Selena. And as I was trying to, I was pretending I was trying to save Selena to find Gartok. I, you know, I was trying to get myself in the game zone. And I was taking it very seriously. I guess a method game, you know, like I get really into it. And so I was really into it. And then the career boost came. And you, there's different things you could do to boost, you know, Selena's career, some of which are, you know, not. I said, sister, that is, uh, and she said, whatever works, you know, you got to be a realist. But the one I chose was uh, TV time. And then you roll some dice to see if you get good interviews or whatever. But it, like ended up that Selena, I booked the big interview with Selena did, or I did for Selena. So, so I'm having trouble saying Selena, Selena Pen Pal, uh, S-E-L-E-N-A. Lovely, lovely, lovely voice. And so that, then I said, wait a second, I'm going to find Gartok. By, and they said, wait a second, sister. You know, I can't talk about, I can't spend too much time on entertainment out here in, sub, in subspace and then trying to get subspace, uh, pick up some, some kind of subspace entertainment sometime, like kind of like heading to a too complicated pen pal. And since I can only, you know, give earth metaphors, you know, they used to have over the air TV and I still have an antenna, and every once in a while, if I'm bored, I'll hook it up, and then I'll go through the channels. This doesn't have anything to do with the board game either, by the way, Pen Pal. No one won because I gave up at this point because I said, I've got a plan uh, to find Gartok. Sister's also a method gamer, so she said, to save Selena? Madre de Dios. And I said, no, 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 Sister. I he said, no, 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 to find Gartok for real. Because we could watch some subspace broadcasts, and there was this, I guess, this hugely popular show called Long Lost Buddies. And it's a very, it was a very popular show, Long Lost Buddies, or it is. Uh, and, uh, you know, the show is hosted by this creature, a humanoid creature called Dolcia, Dolcia. And it's two Dolcias in a row, Dolcia, Dolcia. I think you say it like that, but though, though, though I'm not positive because I'm nervous, Pen Pal. Because I pitched, I said, what if we go on this show? Uh, they reunite people with their long lost buddies, especially in space. This is not a strange thing. You know, people are getting separated in space. Planets are being discovered and undiscovered. 
And it's always a good story. And one of the ways they do it is they have an intro episode where you like sometimes they edit it all together. But anyway, I said, let's get in touch with this the, the, the show, Long Lost Buddies. We did some research. It wasn't that far from where we were. The sisters, they, they, they didn't hate the idea because they, they said, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'll go on there. And well, my, Gartok is my long lost buddy. And then they said, well, isn't stay really? And I said, no, no, I loathe Gartok, uh, his business associate that I dislike. And I bought, you know, purchased Stan from. Hold on, Stan, I'm keeping Stan off the mic right now, pen pal, just because I'm nervous. Um, so, but I didn't, then I didn't think about, so then the sister said, okay, okay, uh, they said, so I'm, I'm in the quartermaster quarters right now by myself. I've isolated myself because then I would said, oh, wait a second, I'll actually have to go on the show, Long Lost Buddies, and it goes out across the universes, and Dolcia Dolcia is like a very, like, so I said, oh boy, I'm nervous here. And then I started thinking, what would I do? Because I actually don't like a gar- I said, well, I could. I guess I could act. And then I said, yeah, I'll just do an ode to, to, to Gartok. Oh, hey, where, oh, where is my little Gartok gone? Oh, where could my Gartok be? And then I told the nuns about that. Uh, they said, no, no. So we're doing a rehearsal right now. So hold, hold on, pen pal, because uh, you could walk with me. Uh... But yeah, just so, so we're going to do a rehearsal. And they said, don't do the where, where the Gartok be. Just you just uh, talk about Gartok. And I said, well, they said, well, so we'll, they got to go down for the rehearsal. Hey, sisters, I'm ready for the rehearsal. Okay, what's standing my mark? I thought, is, is this a real rehearsal? You're taking every, ready for air? Okay. Hey, pen pal, it's me. It's, uh, we're going live, I guess. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me on, Deluca. Dolcia, Dolcia. Yeah. Uh, oh, from Earth. Uh, the Earth, the new, the new planet that got covered up in clouds. It was, it's hard to reach. Yep, that one. Oh, my friend. Yeah, my friend. It's great. Yeah. Thanks, Dolcia, Dolcia. Yeah, it's great to be on. We're live. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so a friend, Gartok, and I really want to see Gartok again. What do I miss about Gartok? His friend, our friendship, and uh, so we shared a lot of sodas together. Why? What do I miss most about Gartok? Like being for because it's my buddy. I've long, long lost my lost my friend Gartok, my buddy. Okay, what exactly do I miss the most? How does it make me feel? Oh, how does it make me feel when I think about Gartok being gone and where where my Gartok could be? I feel I sick. I just think, no, oh, no, my Gartok's gone. Yeah. Um. What is some koala cool Gartok? It's good, 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 great, great, great stuff. And uh, you know, I think about. I mean, I prefer to communicate in odes when I think about Gartok. No odes. No, no. Yeah, odes like uh, Gartok. Uh, Artok, Martok, Montok. That's not a note, that's just rhyming. Gartok is gone. Aware. Okay. That's just repeating. Okay, so can we just cut, please, with the rehearsal? Can we just cut, 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 all this glaring, uh, it, along with the lights, is stressing me out. I did not bomb. I didn't bomb. I did. I did my best. I, I answered. I think I was very sympathetic about where I'm missing Gartok. It's an international broadcast. Okay, then they'll just cut it. You're saying they're not going to air that. If it's like that, they'll throw me out of the studio. Well, I mean, I think I'll do fine, sisters. It's okay. I, I think it's going to be fine. It was a disaster. 
Well, I think you, you know, your, you, you, your crit criticism and meanness is not going to encourage me. What will encourage me? I think I, I think I, 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 if I can do an ode, I think I, I'd, I'd prefer to do an ode. I think no one's going to go for an ode. What do you mean? Like, what about a space ode? Uh, Gartok, my friend that I miss. My odes are ta Why can't I be less nervous? Uh, because you're making me more nervous. Thanks, sisters. This is a pretty good idea. The, my first good idea. I mean, if one of you wants to go on. No, none of you want to go on. Of course, yeah, because you're right. So if none of you are going to replace me, I mean, I guess what I could do, I think if I just curl up in the fetal position till the till we get there for the broadcast, I'll be good. I'll just get under my blankets. Blankets, that's a good idea. Oh, like Sister Leanne. I don't think we could gamify it. I don't think that's going to help me. I mean, Sister Leanne might be nice. Oh, you're going to tell me what to say when we go on the show. Okay. So I'll bring Sister... Okay, so how, how... Sister Leanne doesn't want to go on. Oh, Sister Leanne just needs to pretend it's, uh, she's going on for Selena. Sister Leanne, do you think that'll work? I guess I could think about it, it, it like Selena, too, because I kind of like... Uh, I could pretend it's J-Lo for me. I mean, I like... I, see, I feel sympathetic. Yeah, like I could give her... But yeah, I could have feelings for J... I mean, J-Lo... I mean, I don't have strong feelings, I'm not going to lie, but in the gamification, and I know Sister has strong feelings for Selena. I mean, as long as we get it, you're right that this is, that, uh, like, if we can get this broadcast for Gartok, it'll help us, right? They're going to find Gartok for us. Well, I think I'm glad you're trying to build me up uh, instead of break me down. So we're going to pretend we're looking for Selena. Okay, let's start again. What is sister? Uh, can we be brother and sister and not? Uh, can we be the fag, the friends of Gartok Society or something? Just ready. okay. Go ahead. Get ready. I'm ready. Well, thanks, Dolce uh, Dolce. Thank you for, for having me on with my show on your show. Yeah, I'm here with my sister here. Yeah, my sister Nicole are here. Do you have, we're here. We've, whoa, thank you so much for having us on. Don't repeat myself. Don't repeat what you're saying. Pretend this is a live broadcast. Sorry, it's hard when you're talking in my ears. Okay, let's. can we take it from the top again? Okay. Sister, how you doing? Just pretend it's Selena. Hey, okay, sister... I just don't have, like, a clear vision of J-Lo or Selena in my head. I don't know if I ever did. I have a vague vision. Picture someone else. That'll just mix it. That'll be worse. Uh, I can do it. I can do it. Don't worry, sister. I, I can be an actor. I think I can be an actor. Okay, thank you, Dolcia, Dolcia, for having us on. Oh, my sister, uh, Nicole, and I are here. And we're just so torn on the inside. We're just we're just rendered because our we've been we're here in search of our long lost buddy. So much more when you use the word buddy, it has the right a number amount of softness. And we know it captures so much more than just a buddy for us, right, sister Nicola? Right. She's she's too overcome to speak. She's just communicating with her eyes and her mouth and her quivering lip and, and dulcia, dulcia. But yeah, we've come across the universe to send out a plea uh, to help find our long lost buddy, Selena, your Gartok. Yeah, she 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 could they. Gartok is has has been miss, has gone from our lives, and we we're just so torn up about it. We, the last we saw Gartok was on it was I think it was Bengal Base, Earth yeah, in far Earth orbit, and that was the day. You know, it wasn't it something with Gartok has a lot of fans, not just us. You know, fans of Gartok we call them FOG. Fog, and there was that fog around Earth, 
and it separated us from our friend Gartok, and we don't know if Gartok's on Earth. Oh, but we're so torn. We are. Uh, so could you please, anyone out there, help us find our friend Gartok? Cut, right? That's, that's pretty good, huh, sisters? As long as I listen to you, I'll be fine. Okay, we'll just do so. So I just do it like that. I may have to answer some questions, but you'll answer them for me. So I shouldn't do any of my own thinking, right? Uh, great. This is it's terrific. I can't wait. Uh, oh, we're approaching, Vector. Okay. Well, hey, Pimpale, that went pretty pretty okay. Sister, how you doing? Miss Selena, so you're just going to stay in, in character? Okay. Yeah, I can't do that because I don't have a, I don't have an emotional connection to either one of those. Pretend Gartok. Well, I, I guess I could try that. Uh, Gartok's uh, Selena is a little bit weird, but uh, thanks, sister. Okay, hey, Pen Pal, I'll be right back. I'm going to um, uh, get off the ship and stuff, and I guess I don't know if they put makeup on me. Hey, Pen Pal, it's me. It turns out uh, uh, the people that work in wardrobe and makeup still, like, uh, they either lo love me or love laughing with uh, with w with me and sympathy, laughing at, like, something like, uh, what's that called, Fraunhofer Zeitgeist? And it's not one of those. It's the other one. Schunder, Schunderweiss? But, uh... They do, but not in a mean way. However, there's been a very few times I've gotten makeup, like powder puffed on me and wardrobed. But they always love dressing me and makeuping me. And, of course, you know, my hair always gets a lot of, you know, laughs and puzzled looks because it's not human hair, it's fur. Um... And, you know, because I don't, like they say, well, can you move your hips in those pants? I say, I don't know where my hips are. I don't know what, I don't, I can't control my hips. And then they say, well, can you relax your shoulders while I put this on you? And they say, no, I can't, I don't know how to, I can't do that. I'm try, I'm relaxed. And they say, no, you're not. And they seem to give me extra powder puffs or whatever you call that stuff. And, you know, I guess some of it's a comedy. So I think I was at my, I was, I was, I was doing great during the makeup and the wardrobe. You know, because whatever I was wearing, they said, oh, you can't wear that. And they said, oh, we said, uh, well, great, uh, terrific. What do you, and they said, oh, well, we have something. I don't know, it's good to, anyway, pen pal, it doesn't matter. Uh, so I'm just here with sister. We're, I'm just trying to pretend this is like a board, like a live board game, right, sister? This is all or nothing moment. Clearly, I mean, just like in life, I guess in the game, more or less, you're either going to roll a lot of sixes or twelves, or I guess you're spinning, uh, or you're not, and then so you'll either win or you'll lose, and then say, well, if you get a doctor. And you're behind, you still say, and a chance, and there's some randomness that, you know, if there's enough players. Uh, but mostly once you get that career, you're stuck with it, and you hope you get lucky or you get a lot of good rolls. Uh, good luck. Uh, and that's kind of what this appearance, I think, is, sister. It's, I, I, I've, been, I've been picturing myself acing this, sister. I tell you, I've been using positive... Uh, Positively perfect visual imagery, even when I've tried to stop, uh, because I don't think it works, I, to pr proven that. But that I said, man, I, I, you should have seen these jokes I was telling Delucia, Deluc, Del, Dolcia, Dolcia. Like, I was totally crushing it. And then I was also seeing the downside. Um, But then I thought about the reality. I said, well, I said, I guess if they... Uh, I said, you know, how could things, and I said, oh, yeah, they can always get worse, right, sister? But I think we're just going to, this is all or nothing. This will be the thing that helps me find Gartok. We'll, we'll find your ship, and I'll be, you know, then I'll get, have to go deal with the other stuff at, at Earth, ideally, and, and, and also the dessert plan, you know, all the, some of the other things I have to deal with, and, you know. So that's why I don't think about it with that side. It just much if I, I think so. If I, you know, if I do really good, sister, 
you know, maybe there's like a Selena like figure out there that would join our ship and, you know, that, that, that she and I could be, you know, that we could share the quartermaster quarters and she could sing for you. Like she could be your best friend. Cause you've been thinking about that. Oh, you just want to save Selena. You don't care. You don't need anything from her. I don't know. Well, you could, you, you, maybe we could, when I'm done role playing with this, uh, Selena figure, you could role play like in, okay, never mind. You're right. But just as simple as if we, we're going to do great sister, we are going to do terrific. And we're going to do this for JLo and we're going to do it for Selena and we're going to do it from the, for the crew, you know, obviously because the, the stakes with your crew don't remind you about the crew of the Natchez. Well, this is as much for them and the universe. So no pressure. I mean, if we're not perfect, that those are the stakes. Uh, maybe the, maybe there's like a, a chance we could discover an alternative universe where we could actually save Selena. Sorry, sister, I didn't mean to cause you emotional. Oh, boy, it's time for a pen pal. I'll be back. I'll, I'll talk to you after the appearance. Uh, hey, pen pal, it's me. Um, just got off stage. It's uh, It didn't go good, pen, pen pal. I think we were booed, and it was a live, it was a live broadcast. Uh, uh, like, uh, I mean, I don't know how fast these waves travel. They said something about it being amplified, uh, but it didn't, it didn't, it didn't, it went worse than bad, uh, pen pal. Just like I said, you know, it could happen like that. It, it kind of did. Um, now I can't take total blame because the nuns were in my ears and they're still in my ears. I, well, I took them out. Sister, sister Leanne, still, they're listening. If she's listening to the nun, so that was a, that was distracting. Actually, can they hear that, sister? Good. Yeah, they can listen into this uh, because it would have gone bit poorly enough. But with the sisters yelling at me and uh, uh, trying to course correct, as they said, uh, I mean, uh, like it can't when you're froze when you're frozen. It doesn't help to have somebody say, pull it to get, you know, in your ears. Uh, but that didn't happen. It, it didn't happen right away, Pen Pal. What happened was, you know, it started slow with me kind of stumbling and mixing up Gartok and Selena and J-Lo. And I guess because we should have had Stan up here, but it, there's no, ro you know, there's no uh, software interfaces or things, you know, out on the show. Because Stan was the one that made the call, you know, that got us booked on the show. Uh, but so at first, you do, I, it was, I, I couldn't do anything. And then the sister started yelling. And then I said, you know, first we're here for Selena. And then it was like, uh, then the host said, well, what's your favorite? Just like in the, what's your favorite part about Gartok? And I said, well, t t tentacles. And then he said, he said to my sister, you know, uh, she, she, I said, well, my, my sister doesn't speak. But then she said, the joy, joy is singing because they said, well, no, 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 we need to know it's your, your long lost buddy. And she said, well, jo the joy is singing. And then that, that caught the host's attention. So, okay, the, 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 tell me more about Gartok's joy is singing. And I said it was it's like this like the song of a bird combined with the song of uh, like a, a demigod you know like a but for lack of a better term an angel. And they said a tentacled angel, and they said exactly like like a young girl who's become a woman, and you know have had a domineering father figure. And now is about to set out on her own, but she 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 she's trusting and trying to find her way. And this is why we miss her so. Gartok so. And then this is when the sisters started yelling because it gets the hosts and the audience. You know, I wasn't aware of it. I was actually in the zone. I was just picturing like a tentacle J Lo. And it was working. I thought it was working, but I guess uh, 
they they said you know it wasn't and, and sister Leanne was just started had started singing I guess Selena songs I didn't I didn't hear any of it because I guess I was kind of having a brownout or blackout or whatever because uh, then I couldn't oh, once the sisters were yelling and then I was trying to say okay they, and they said wait yes I don't know why they didn't just pick one of them to yell. And then the host said, so, so, like a song, and then the host said, Dude, just uh, this, uh, you, you, your friend Gartok sounds uh, uh, just like a Latina pop icon, Selena. And then the audience started bowing, and I said, just like, just that was just, just like Selena, you're, you're so, Selena? Who's Selena? And then they, you know, talked to, and they said, you know, are you familiar with the movie by uh, uh, J Lo, Jennifer Lopez? And I said, oh, the Ed, with Edward James Almost. You mean that movie, the that one, the with Edward James Almost? And then they, the the host said, are you wasting my time. Like, is this a joke? Are you trying to? And they said, no, we're we're trying to save our friend Gartok. Uh, uh, and then they said, cut the feet, you know, and then that was it. The host said, yeah, you know, the host was not happy. Audience wasn't happy. They cut the broadcast. The host said, you know, can't believe this. And then we had to go get, had to go return the wardrobe. And so we're back here. And they just said, sister, turn your back while I change out of my clothes. No, no staffs back here. But you know what, Pen Pal, I really feel bad about this because Sister's really upset because the, the, the other nuns are very upset because uh, they, you know, it pretty clear it was a great plan until it was enacted. And uh, uh, if, if I don't see how it could have gone any differently, though, Pen Pal, but I know I feel bad about this. I, I'm sorry, Sister Leanne. And I'm sorry that I don't have a mechanism to deal with the conflict with the other nuns to manage their behavior. And so he's repeating this pattern. I thought I had it sorted out. Uh, but I think what honestly happened, Pen Pal, was that I forgot about the human aspect of this whole thing. And what makes the Long Lost Buddies work is that there's real, it's non-fiction, it's, you know, it's got a little fictional bent to it, uh, you know, to give us some fa-va-voom, but that it was the real people looking for, or real beings looking for real beings, long lost in outer space. And that I should have developed a story around that, that, you know, that has a feel to it, like maybe I should have been... Uh, maybe I should have been the, the Selena's father and that I had chased her away. I should have gone with that. Uh, so that, uh, you know, but I really feel bad. I guess, like, I'm ashamed that, uh, uh, I guess I didn't have, I don't know, Pen Pal, I'm really down about this. Because if I, maybe I could have just been honest and been like, uh, that Gartok's not my buddy. In that we came here to appear on this show, uh, because Gartak, you know, they have a best friend that's a soda machine, a freestyle soda machine, and software interface. Oh, who I'd met the moment the machine went sentient in a Burger King in Alameda, California, and we struck up a fast friendship, uh, also having to do with my soda addiction. And, you know, many visits to Burger King, crushes on Burger King workers, increasing my, you know, a cyclical friendship uh, with a soda, sentient soda machine that then, you know, when we were exposed to outer space, I think it was in some scientists that had also been in there, some, you know, that, of course, said they had the ability to go. Anyway, that's my, then Gartok stole my best friend or gained ownership and Gartok's probably behind all the stuff with Earth, and, you know, I had to cheat Gartok, and probably in Gartok's opinion, if you would talk to Gartok, uh, how to stand, to save Stan from servitude to Gartok, but Gartok really set me up with these nuns who I'm now trapped on a ship with, 
My only hope to the nuns from my childhood, by the way, uh, Dolce, Dolce, the, 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 the nuns, you know, they're, they're still yelling in my ear because they say I'm not going to be a good guest. And then I've been, I'm on a spaceship with them. Uh, and, you know, part of me feels like right and wrong that I'm supposed to help them. And I also drank some, um, a cloud of delusion. So I'm, I can detect delusion better than anyone in the universe. Feel free to put jokes in there. Uh, Dolcea, Dolcea. And I just want to find Gartok so I can, one, because Gartok's up to no good and people should know about it. Two, uh, because, uh, like, we could get some answers and then maybe find this missing ship that uh, has some serious stuff on it that could affect the future of the universe. And that's all I really want to do is to try to help these nuns uh, get off my back by continuing on their mission. Save the universe because I got to live in it. Uh, and I tell you what, it'd be a lot nicer if it was around to live in. And also this gives me time to avoid all the messes I've left behind. And also it was pretty mundane existence in navigating a ship across a cloud of delusion. It was really boring. Well, not boring because it was also, uh, you know, very, uh, whatever you call it, surreal, but it was boring too. So if anyone here, like if we could just call this one episode Long Lost Buddies in quotes and you could just help me track our talk down, that'd be great. Uh, and maybe everybody could just, because we were going to come on here and pretend it was the beloved uh, Latina pop icon, Selena. Long, you know, it was t torn from our breasts too soon. Uh, and because we, we, we like, uh, because we don't like our talk, really, we like the universe, you know, so if you, you're, you know, you don't want to say about the universe was my long lost buddy. Because no one will be saying it, probably, depending on how, you know, belief systems and whatever, you know, dark matter, quarks, any of that stuff, you know, could come into play. Oh, wait, here's the sister. Here comes still Chia. Chia. My mic's still hot. Oh, boy. Is that an insult because I did so bad? No, my mic's still hot. Oh, you've been listening in from the control room? What was I saying? Well, I was saying that Gart, did you, did you, I guess you maybe heard what I said. Gartok's a jerk. Uh, I guess I'm a jerk, too. Different kind of jerk, though. I'm a small-scale jerk. And I guess I got, I got nervous about being on this show. And I'm not, I guess I've never been on, I've never been on Long Lost Buddies before. But we want to find, okay, you got all that. Uh, why weren't we honest with you? Because uh, because uh, yeah, honesty is too scary. We we because we figured if we could just put a description of Gartok out there, and then people would call in. You broadcast my tirade, and it's doing. People love it. Oh, most of the audience tuned out though. Well, yeah. I mean, that's just. I just got. I just uh, had to go. I was just telling my pen. I have a pen pal, or I will one day, I guess. Uh, Dulcia, Dulcia. And uh, so, meet my pen pal. That's uh, nice to meet you. But, uh, on behalf of my pen pal. Well, yeah. I guess it's just like it's hard because I, I, I guess I wanted to come on the, here and be oh, oh, uh, obscenely competent at uh, tracking down Gartok. And I thought I would just come on and be like, you know, Gartok, this is my best friend. How would you have felt if I did any odes? No odes. Well, that's good, I guess, because I didn't do any odes. Uh, but it's hard being me because I guess I can't win with my brain is what I'm saying. Uh, well, in, in the end, I did great. You Well, thanks, Dolcea, Dolcea. And it's kind of hard for a sister here because she's kind of saddled with me in my security blanket, so I feel bad for her. But I guess what you're saying is there's going to be some good out of this because we should get some good info on Gartok, right? Uh, there's thousands of messages coming in. That's awesome. So you could send those to my ship's computer? 
Uh, you have to tell me what, oh, most of all those messages are all, every message to your show is almost always a fake. Okay, well, you could just send them uh, to my ship's computer anyway, I guess. I mean, you just think like a tentacled uh, uh, purveyor of delusion. is Somebody who could spot uh, Degar talk, right? Well, thanks, Dolce, Dolce. I appreciate you having me. Oh, yeah, the makeup, you want to puff, powder puff my face, too? Okay, go ahead. Maybe we should have just done that on the air, huh? Okay, thank you. Well, Pimpel, I'm going to head back to the ship with sister here. Sister, sister, you heard. Maybe they'll find, maybe we'll find Selena, sister. Yeah, I can't wait to get back to the ship either. I mean, I guess in the end, uh, it all worked out how it was supposed to, kind of. Uh, yeah, sister, I realize it's kind of a pain being with me. It's hard be I mean, I don't mean it will. It is hard being me, sister, believe it or not. And I guess it's just as hard being affiliated with me. Uh, but I did have the idea. And in the end, we guess we saw the idea won't bear fruit. But hopefully it will. We don't know that, right, sister? Why are we, why are we going into all or nothing thinking? Oh, because the host said that nothing was going to come of this. Yeah. I mean, what if we go, how about we sit out here and we play, uh, if you, do, do, do you ever daydream about, uh, like, uh, like a Selena? Well, yeah, like, let's pretend these, uh, this, uh, sidewalk here is this little giant Selena game board. Okay, sister, uh, what are you going to do next to save Selena? Uh, your choice, okay, throw that rock and I'll tell you which. Oh, you got a four. Please take four steps. Oh, you're on payday, sister. Selena just secured a gig at uh, the Palladium or something. Oh, I, I landed on, just skip my turn. Go ahead, sister, roll again. Oh, wow, you got a uh, uh, fan club manager, sister. What are you going to do? Oh, you're going to ban the fan club. Oh, boy, sister. Oh, dear. You rolled one, sister. Fans uh, demand fan club. So you're going to have to find another solution. Roll again. Oh, boy. Uh, Selena's dad wants to, to, to manage the tour. Yes or no? No. Smart move, sister. You're doing great, sister. Let's keep playing this for a while. Hey, pen pal, good night. I'll talk to you later. All right, so this is our 61st Spanish story. And this is the one where I tried to do my own luau back in the day. And I called it the Bahar Luau, but, but the get low luau, you know, because uh, of the, uh, the thing you go over. It's now when you jump in line and rack your body on time, it's... Uh, the pole thing, which is the name that escapes me. We also had a uh, uh, Aspidorus race at this little, uh, well, I scheduled. These were the things I was planning for at uh, Bahar, getting low. Aspidorus, vacuum cleaner racing, just like, uh, you know, there's some witch movie or cartoon where they had vacuum cleaners instead of brooms. I always liked that. A uh, fachada contest, a facade contest, which is just like that uh, Madonna, like voguing. Uh, but you you can't move, you know, but a human statue contest, I guess, you you know, artistico, ar artistic a little bit. Really, the fachada contest, the human statue contest was made for because I was running behind with cooking. Because uh, they didn't know, you know, I was trying to look up po po boy, boy, or po you know, all those things. You know, lyrics to Tiny Bubbles. Uh, I say, con esto, like, what am I going to do with this? How am I going to, like, a sonrisa, I got to smile. That's part of, uh, you know, I got to be agradable, you know, nice. Uh, you know, welcome people, salgo para ala, you know, go to there. There's your seats, those are your tables, uh. Uh, you know, no, no one has to be placed to Sotano in the basement at the kids' table. This is a, uh, 
And they said, what is this? What is this? And, you know, this was as a child, you know, so he you know, handed out tickets. I charged, uh, you know, I blocked the street that we lived on. Not a true story. Don't worry. It's not a true story. And charged people for tickets to come. Uh, and he said, oh, look at that baby of yours, Quinta Sucaris. She has your face. And people wanted to know when, what was going on. Like, they said, is this the actual uh, luau? I said, oh, boy, is it. Oh, oh, horario, horario. So, you know, the schedules will be coming. They're pending. And then they said, well, where are the lays? And I said, uh, well, you, you could lay in your seat. Uh, Eva Tarlo, Tarlo, we're have, using imaginary lays to avoid uh, anybody has flower allergies. It's a new thing. Uh, Toda via though, be still because right now is the time for the for, for, you know the for, for, you know facade contest. Uh, so Verlo, look over there. That's Moistra sample. That that person there is a human statue. That's what Los Vamos. We're going to all do that together. Time everyone for compro, compromiso. Uh, make a commitment to being a human statue because I got to play some musica toque. I got to touch up the music. Uh, I don't know tiny bubbles yet, you know, but if I can locate where my hips are and the muscles that control them, I'll be doing some belly dancing. And watch me, votam, votamios, you know, I'm, I'm turning. And don't worry, Daban Prensa, you know, I give I got good press for this luau. You know, luau de la nada, out of nothing. What are you saying? Where's the pig? What pig? There'll be poi. There'll be poi later, yes. Uh, Mai Tais? No, 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 no Mai Tais at this luau. Uh, uh, Disparo. We'll just be shooting the breeze here. Uh, SL Mismo. This is the same as a Hawaiian luau, except it's in the backyard of my house in Syracuse, New York. Otista Acabamos? I'm sorry, what did you say? Uh, Tenerlo Vimos. I have it. I saw, I've seen, I saw Hawaii Five O, so I know how to do a luau. Excuse me, can you, uh, Kitamos remove this person from the luau? Okay, so everybody's, is everybody frozen like a statue? Cones, uh, Meta, and Seno. That was what the goal I was teaching all the, all the guests. Uh, keep still. And if you get tempted to move, Peya uh, Dita Segulia, you know, keep following that bald head right there. They call him like Cabeza, yeah, the, that head. Okay, we're going to get ready for the next thing, which I call Vaquita, the little cow. That's like because they have a little piece of cheese for everybody. That's the appetizer. So line up. Uh, no, 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 not laughing cow. This is a, a different version, Vaquita. This is a little cow cheese. Oh, no, instead of wax, this comes in uh, your hand. It's cheese curds. It's just like the laughing cow, but different. No, it's not brie. Uh, I'm not sure I bought it on the side of the road at a stand. Uh, Ordones, what are you putting in cheese orders now? No, no, this is your, uh, this is a moose bouche uh, Tomando fresco. We're taking, this is as fresh as the cheese as it gets. And I know some uh, some people here, Saber Mayor, they know better than me about organizing luau's. Oh, do they? You know, they want to sueldo a gatillo, pull the old salary trigger, and hire some consultants to do pro. Yeah, I can hear the complaints coming in here. You know, Ponera, Hacer, I'll go. You know, get a consultant, and we'll do we'll do actual Syracuse luau, take over Hinden Waddles or whatever. Uh, we won't leave a soyo detail. You know, that's what they always say. Not a single detail will be unfocused, unlike Scooter's Luau. Well, you know, Haga una lista quince. You know, make a list of 15 things that are in my Luau. Uh, but do it as a statue. Uh, cinco anote. It's also $5 to use that pen and paper. Uh, qual dro, dro, trabajo, which job would the consultant start with? Uh, look at my hips, they're almost moving. Okay, Toto Suhente, I want all the people here. Uh oh, excuse me, guests. Uh, Roborom mi plata, somebody stole the uh, money for the pig, that's what happened. 
Uh, is anybody Alguno want to make an extra donation for the, the, the fund? Maybe we should just say, let's just have boy and then no no harm, no foul. You know what I mean? PNC, what do you all think about that? You know, because some pigs are supposed to hit to, to hijos. You know, some they have a wife and kids, these these ones. Uh, okay, good. Cubier to everybody get cover, covered. It's raining now. That's not great for this because uh, this is an outdoor luau. No cover. So let's just stay outside. You got to let's get the uh, no, 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 no need to move away. Uh, what I'll do is uh, if someone gives me a couple hundred dollars, Digame, Entreguer, Pega, you know, I'll get some delivery over here. I'm sorry, you need, you know, no, they, we don't talk like that here. You know, how about some Pez Gordo, some fat fish pizza? That's like a new pizza place that uh, has specials because they have their terrible name. It would be good if it was a fish shop, but it's Pez Gordo, fat fish pizza. Oh, yeah, I do own that pizza shop. Yes, I did name it and open it. And Seguro, this luau is actually my insurance for all the pizzas we didn't sell today. Uh, no, not Domino. No, 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 no. Fat Fish Pizza, it's on its way. Don't worry. It'll be cold when it gets here. Okay, who wants to? Let's get those vacuums plugged in. And don't worry about the rain. The vacuum cleaners are broken anyway. Um, and every, who wants two photo? Who wants their photo taken? Everyone, look at the winners of the statue contest. at Charlie Manya, lay your hands on the statue people. Uh, those are my siblings that I forced to work here, the ones that are still frozen in statue form. Uh, yeah, no hey coma there it, as it is. There's uh, this doesn't get any better. Conjunto, set set up everybody, set up in a group. Get get a little closer. Uh, Kitar, you know, r remove what clothing you can because you're getting wet. Uh, propongo que te quedes. I propose everyone stays here in the rain. I don't have any p pina coladas. Uh, uh, oh, hey, you, uh, huyendo. Some people are running away. Well, they won't get any. They won't get their photos. Uh, no, Antes, don't leave before the uh, vacuum races. Uh, you know, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be sorry. Todo es to bien. This is all going to be good. Uh, bien. Okay. Uh, juntos a regalen. You know, everybody get together, fix, every, does everybody have a vacuum? You have a dustbuster. Yeah, that's a vacuum. Okay. Tenderlo. Now lay it down at the, at the empezar, at the start line. And a cacaba. Just wait. Now everyone, uh, uh, Susader sus fincas. Uh, think about the finances that you know. E, e, you know, because I could give you a head start, but I'm going to charge for that. Uh, it's a delicado. So who wants to put up poniendo uh, money for a, a, for a start? You do with the dustbuster. Ooh, Forty dollars. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Guitar Lomano. Remove your hands. Uh, clear out away from your vacuums. Uh, Mencionaire, did I mention if you want to get a head start, you have to pay me? Okay, I'll go there. Get ready some of it. Uh, wait for my palabra. Say lo juro, I swear. Uh, uh, you, 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 yeah, we're fuera. We are outside. That's that's outside rain. It is. Okay, Tomo, take uh, your head start. You that gave me the money. Uh, sabe un cosa. This person knows a thing about winning races. Uh, Bonga Sita. So I want to put some quotes up while that person gets a huge lead. Uh, you know, pass on them inside. Go, everybody go. Hey, I was messing with you. Uh, no, Tomar, take you. You know, go ahead, get get started. Uh, Vio Mikara. You saw my face. I was kidding. Asusustata. You know, don't worry. Just get racing. Egal. You know, get, get in the course there. Uh, por ciento como antes, uh, it's almost, you know, it's a percentage of the time, you know, I feel blue, 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 like a azul, blue Hawaiian, uh, like about 40 of them, I feel like drinking 40 of them, nivel, that would give me a little, oh, it looks like the person with the huge lead came in first, 
Uh, segundo mejor, second best was you with the, the uh, old metal vacuum cleaner. There, you're strong. Buscando move air. You're really looking to move. All right, everybody juntos, get together. Uh, nos convenient. Now, should we wait here for the pizza, the fat fish pizza to get here? You want your deposito back. Sorry about that. There is no, uh, you know, believe it or not, I got a Grano Nevera inside a grain fridge. You, you know, they do, that means a beer fridge. You could go in there. It's not mine. It's not plugged in. It's been calfaccion, heating up the uh, a beer, like just like it was covered in cohiba. It's like blankets. But feel free to serve on yourself whatever you wish. Oh, and everyone else is leaving. We'll just announce it to everybody as you leave. Bez Almez, uh, I'm going to do this monthly, a monthly luau for everyone. Now, Cobrando, I'll be sure you, you could sign up, you know, for a monthly fee. And, uh, you know, if you get here early and pay, you know, Yega Senal Tampoco, you wait for the little signal, you'll get a head start. And, you know, I care, okay, you know, if you approach me on the side, I'm more than happy to uh, sell here, help you get out on the race course, practice your statuing, caminar, you know, go for a walk with you, sing tiny bubbles. I think the uh, poise done, or whatever it's called. Also, I have a Poe suit. I was going to dress up as Poe from that movie. That doesn't have to. Do, I was going to do like that's when we we're going to do the thing. We forgot to do the limbo. Well, everyone's gone. Advierta, I guess. Uh, and Carga, I'm responsible again, and I'll just uh, you know get low under this uh, limbo because limbo time's here. But I'm by myself again. Even my siblings left. The ones that were statues. Well, just lay down and slip under the. Bar of the limbo sticking into your dreams. Good night. All right, so we're talking episode 61. Uh, it opens with a red van, YAZ524. And it pulls into the ABC uh, maintenance, vacuum maintenance. Uh, so it's actually an a actual vacuum cleaner repair place. And the van backs in and, uh, you know, get, goes inside and then the doors open and the guy lets out Walt is what I put in my notes. But then I realized uh, a few seconds later it was Saul. So I was played for the fool. And Saul's carrying two suitcases and I'm like, oh, snap. That's what I wrote. Uh, no, Saul, three exclamation points. Oh, snap, I got tricked. Uh, Saul gets his picture taken for a future ID against, like, a, a pull-down background. And Saul says, uh, should I take my Band-Aid off? And he says, nah, let's uh, I'll Photoshop it or something. And I really like the casting of this vacuum guy. He's cool, very calm, but a little bit odd. Asks a lot of questions. He talks to Saul about some problems or some situations. And Saul seems surprised, almost like he's going to change his mind about something. Uh, uh, something unsure, will I see, double question mark. And then it said Walt, double question mark, because Walt's on like, a security camera, like uh, pacing around a room in a bad mood. And then we kind of get an ex the uh, Episode title. Then we see Maria is in black. Uh, she's in the car with Ruben, future superstar, this actor that plays Ruben, I'll tell you. Uh, they're in a black Chevy pickup. They pull up to Maria's house, and uh, then they realize all the evidence has been taken and scattered around. Uh, they find a video camera, but no tape. And then we're at Pedo's uncle's, and they're watching the tape with Jose's confession. And at some point, he names Peto is doing something. And Peto's just in the background reading a book. He doesn't seem to care. Uh, but the uncles are very mad, and they want to deal with Jose. But Peto's kind of protective of Jose somehow. I don't know if it's his skills. Mucha mas, like muchas mas platas. They're going to make more money because of him. 
And then they kind of laugh at Beto, and they're making fun of him. I don't know if it was about his crush on Lydia or because he was protective of uh, Jose, but uh, Beto almost seems confused. I mean, this is this character, uh, what was his name, and uh, uh, Todd and Peto, like a strange character, uh, off-hinge. I wouldn't say unhinged, but off-hinge or reverse tinge or something. But Jose sits in a room. He's looking at a picture of Andrea. Then he realizes there's a paper clip on it, so he tries to pick his lock. And then, this was funny, we see the exact thing I'm reading from right now, a yellow legal pad, and Walt's scribbling like a madman on his legal pad. And we see him and Saul are bunk mates now. And Walt hands some of the paper to, like, uh, uh, to Saul, K. I put, oh no, Walt's hand hurts, that's what that said. Uh, but he says, to, so he goes to Saul, what are you looking at, I think? And the room's soundproofed, so you could have recorded a podcast in there if you wanted. Walt gives a paper and then a long speech to Saul, and Saul does not get why Walt's so bent out of shape, and Walt's like talking about my money and Henry. Uh, still me, 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 me with Walt. And Walt yells at Saul, who's like, chill, bro. He goes, it wasn't my fault. And he goes, besides, what are we going to do about it right now? And Walt's still like, no, no, no. And there's lots of breathing and pointing. And Saul tries to reason with him and, like, use common sense or something. And Walt, like, pounds the walls in frustration, like, oh, oi. And so still tries to talk to him, but Walt's like, yeah, what about all my money, dude? All my money, like 80 million or whatever. And then he taps his barrel. And then I think he said to his, uh, something to Saul, like, are you going to help me or what? And then the vacuum dude pops in. He just kind of appeared there. And he goes, hey, Saul, you ready to go? And Walt goes, no, 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 we have a new plan. But, I mean, first the dude was like, sorry, did I interrupt something? And they're like, uh... Uh, but then Walt says, I have a new plan. Me and Saul are going to go out on the town and take care of some business. And Saul's like, no, 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 I'm not. And then Walt goes, he says, he goes off. And he's yelling at Saul about not, you know, not helping him. Uh, you know, come on, Saul, you got to get into it. And then he coughs. So you realize how selfish this is because he's like, he wants, Saul's got his exit strategy. And Walt wants to drag him back in. But Walt's not going to be around because... Uh, He's not feeling good, but Saul will be. Um, let's see. And Saul says, you, then Saul's like, you know what? Goodbye, Walt. And then we're at the DPA office, and the, there's cops and lawyers in suits, and they're all pointing and talking. Uh, but the sound's kind of drowned out, and we see CLO's kind of there, spaced out. There's no sound. She's at the end of the table with this empty look. And then they're waiting for her to answer, and she says, see, and she kind of confirms something. And then she's home smoking and looking out the window. She goes to check on the baby, and then Peto's there with a the stuffed animal. He says, here's a message. She's like, don't don't talk about Walt. Here's some stuff. To ca- oh, there are cabbage patches. And then everyone does the cabbage patch. Then we see Peto and Lydia. They're sitting back to back at that same fancy rooftop restaurant. Uh, they talk, but they're interrupted by the waitress. Beto has, like, Lydia's tea or, like, a sugar substitute on him. He's all sly, like, hey, I, I know what you like to drink. Uh, Lydia, on the other hand, she's much more business-like, thoughtful, chill. Uh, but then Pet- Peto says something that catches her attention, something about Heisenberg, she says. And then he says, no, 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 Rosas, uh, and then he turns towards her because now he has her attention. He touches her hair or her shoulder, like picks some, like, uh, you know, whatever, strike, strike hairs off or something. And he thinks that's it, that they're in love now. Maybe. I don't know. Then we see a horse truck in, like, out in the countryside, and it's the vacuum dude. Lots of green grass, and they go into this far. The truck goes in this farm thing, and then Walt gets out of the truck. Uh, he's like hidden behind all these boxes and stuff. And then he says, "Well, follow me." And they go across the farm to this really nice country cottage, the lush garden. 
They go inside. The house is all stocked. He's got food. There's a bathroom. And he tells Walt all, you know, the deal of how he's going to stay here and be fine. Of course, Walt complains about how much he paid or something. And the guy's like, WTF, bro. Like, this is how you go off grid. And then Walt says, speaking of going off grid, where's the phone? I need to make some calls. And the dude's like, what is this, amateur hour? He goes, this is my show. I'm the vacuum guy, not you. And he well, still won't let it go, and the guy tries to reason with him. He says, listen, you want to stay here and be okay or not? And he says, I got to go. Then Walt sits on the couch. His arms are crossed. He's got his barrel full of money in his suitcases. And then he takes some money out. He loads up his jacket. He gets the Heisenberg hat on, and then he starts to walk. And it's like, oh, action time. But then he gets the gate, he pauses, he changes his mind. And it's like, not yet, double question mark. Uh, then we have Jose. He gets his arms free, but Pato comes. Uh, so uh, Jose goes to bed. And Pato's all happy. He's like, I have a treat, uh, like a donut or something. And it's, it's in beautiful night sky. So Jose says, can I look at the night sky? And Pato says, well, it's going to be cold out, but you can look at it if you want. I'll see you in the morning. And then I put, yeah, this is where I said, did Jose ask to see the night sky? Double question mark. Jose eats the donut, and then he gets into action. He climbs out, but then Pato looks out the window because he hears, he makes so much noise. And so they catch Jose right away. Jose yells. Uh, then we see Walt. He's in a plaid fleece with a beard, long hair. At the cottage, the vacuum man pulls up. He's got newspapers. Walt needs some reading glasses, uh, so they, he brought a bunch with him, the guy. So Walt starts going through the reading glasses, and they chat. And it seems like the vacuum guy actually likes Walt. And he even has Walt's aspirin that Walt needed. So he's like, here's your aspirins. And then Walt's asking him something else or some more info, or maybe he's like, I'll pay you just hang out here with me or something. Or Walt, like, wants it to, to confess to him or something. I couldn't tell. Uh, then there's, like, a nighttime shot establishing the cottage. We see articles about Cielo on the walls. Walt's wedding ring falls off. And he's in bed asleep cold and he, with blankets and jackets, and he realizes his ring fell off, so he takes one of his chucka boots and takes out a shoelace and wears the ring around his neck. Uh, then his wall boxes up some of his money. It's a morning. He goes walking with his box to the gate. He's coughing a lot. Then we see Junior at the library. He gets called to the principal's office. She's like, I got a call for you about some scholarship or something. And Junior gets on the phone, and it's Walt, of course. There's, you know, someone says, hold on, and then Walt gets on. And Junior's shocked, but curious. And then Walt's talking about the money, and Junior gets mad and sad. And Walt's begging, and he's asking some questions to try to make a plan to get the money to Junior. Or, like, keep a secret from your mom. Walt was at a red payphone with a stack of coin, coins at the top. And then Junior says, this is what you should do with your plata, bro. And Walt's crushed, and he hangs up. And then he gets uh, some coins. He makes another call to report himself and leaves the phone off the hook so they can find him. And then Walt takes his box. He sits at the bar. He orders a drink. Uh, he thinks for a while. And at first I thought it was a soap opera. I was really dis disjointed on this one. And he says, hey, can you turn it up? And then it was a new show, and they were talking about Walter Blanco. And Walt doesn't like what they're saying. It hurts his ego or something. And he looks away while one of them talks. And then I started to unpack it. So he was listening, and then he looks at the next uh, next part. So it was a woman interviewing a man and a woman. And then I said, oh, wait, this is Elliot. Uh, this is like, uh, and I said, who is it? I do I just lost the name. Oh, Dan. No, not Dan. But his old business partners. And they're talking and being interviewed about him. And then she kind of seems like she made a call to Walt to like give up or something. And that hurts Walt. 
So he leaves, and then the cops arrive. Uh, it's raining, but right when they go in, they realize Walt's gone, and there's a $100 bill under his drink at the bar, and the episode ends. All right, here we are, episode 61, and uh, second to last episode. I don't know if that's Pent Ultimate, uh, but uh, let's get to it, I guess. I don't know what I'm talking about. Oh, that name of the episode is Granite State. Uh, does anyone know what the Granite State is? Anyone? Anyone. It's the title of this episode. Oh, boy. This opens with a red minivan, best quality vacuum. Uh, well, it looks like a, a quick granite block building. I don't think I meant granite, though, but it like one of those industrial, uh, I think those are granite blocks or whatever those uh, blocks are that they use for building things. Uh, not bricks, but the ones when you're in your 20s, you used to use this coffee ta- for your coffee table, the ones with those two holes in it. And uh, Robert, we see the great Robert Forrester, like uh, go, the the building, then the building's unlocked. We see the great Robert Forrester. And out of the van climbs not Walt, but Saul with uh, some turquoise luggage, a very purple shirt. Uh, Forrester's all business. Saul's like, oh, geez, I, didn't, I figured the vacuum cleaner repair was a term of art. And he takes Walt's picture. Uh, he says, hey, get your hair out of your eyes. He says, what about this uh, thing in my nose? He says, no, I'll airbrush that out. And Walt sees Nebraska. He says, what's in Nebraska? He says, you from now on. Uh, and he says, by the way, it's going to take a little while. You're going to have to stay downstairs. You know, I got a little, it's not the Ritz Carlton, but it's a short term stay. And Walt says, well, how long? He says, well, you're, you know, you're on TV and stuff. So he said a couple days, two, maybe three. And he says, oh, by the way, you got a roommate, too. And Saul says, wait, he's here? And he says, yeah, for the moment. And Saul says, well, geez, how are you? He says, he's a special case. He says, oh, boy, yeah, for sure. And he says, well, how's he doing? He says, hey, t- you be the judge. Uh, and he looks down, he sees the camera. Uh, Walt's on a live feed. And he's pacing around. And then the episode opens. And Marie's in black. She's in a car. She's sad. She's distant. Uh, they pull up to her house, but all the evidence is gone. Then we have Jesse's voiceover from a video. Then we're at Todd's uncles. They're drinking beer, watching Jesse's video. Uh, Todd's in the background. At first, they thought he was mixing milkshakes, but it was. It looks like it was takeout, like wonton soup or something. Maybe, maybe pho. But he's mixing up some uh, takeout uh, in the the liquid, the ones that contain soup. Uh, then Jesse kind of tells on Todd. Uh, Todd has this odd little grin because uh, he's so pleased. Then the uncle says, Jesus, Jesse's a tattletale. Let's go deal with him. And, you know, J- 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 Todd tries to stick up for Jesse, but why? Uh, and he says, Jesus, he, he goes, well, we got 600 gallons of methylamine. And the uncle's like, dude, we got to like $80 million. Uh, yeah, he goes, why would we still make math? And he says, well, geez, uh, he goes, we could, we goes, he goes, we could make more, you know, more than millions. You know, why are you gonna, why would you turn your back on more money, Uncle Jack? And the uncle goes, are you sweet on Lydia? Is that what it is? And then they all have a laugh. They're like, Todd's, in, you know, Todd's in love with Lydia, K I S S I N G. And Todd goes, actually, that's exact. He goes, actually, I do want to be in a baby carriage, Uncle. Uh, he goes, is that weird that I'd like to be in a baby carriage? He goes, and I'll take it for first come. He goes, I, like, I'd, I'll take being in a baby carriage even before marriage. Uh, in fact, I'd prefer to marry someone that's comfortable putting me in a baby carriage. And the uncles are stunned at that, but he says, can we keep it to Jesse? And they say, okay, well, that's fine. Uh, he, the uncle says, "You guess that's weird, but the heart wants what the heart wants, my boy. 
Then we see Jesse's looking at a picture of Andre and um, uh, Brock. Paper clip, and he plays with the paper clip. Then we're back at the vacuum uh, shop. The guy's on the phone. Is that right? Mild. Oh, yeah, he's talking about uh, mild steel, a deal on mild steel. And this is great stuff because if we go down to the bunkmates and Walt's writing on a yellow legal pad. So I kind of felt like I was in because I was writing on a yellow legal pad. And he's still trying to make some kind of plan. He's trying to rope Saul into it to deal with Jack. Uh, and Saul's like, you don't mind if I give you a nickel's worth of advice, do you? Uh, just for, uh, you know, old time's sake. He goes, maybe you should stick around and, you know, uh, give yourself up. You know, be good. He goes, are you really worried about your family? Because he goes, I think that would be uh, uh, the best thing for Skylar and the kids is if you just go in. And he goes, that phone call was good because that'll get her off at least one mistrial. But he goes, I don't know. Then uh, he goes, I don't think they're going to let up on Skylar, Walt. And you're the one that put her in this position. He goes, I hate to be a downer here. But she's really got no assets and she has to, had to get a job. Uh, you know, no money. You know, and Walt says, well, we got plenty of money. He goes, dude, he goes, you're watching... He goes, uh, he goes, don't you remember what happened to Mike? He goes, Mike knew what he was doing, and he lost all his money, too. Face the music. He goes, you're sick anyway. Come on. And he says, you bring in all that money. They'll be happy about that. Maybe they'll, you know, take care of Skylar. They'll let her keep her house. And Will says, oh, you think I am just, just want to leave? Oh, boy. No, 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 no. He goes, I want that money, all the money for my kids. And also, I liked how there, there's a lot of nice moving around, pink insulation on the walls. And then Walt gets all Heisenberg, you know, he goes, hey, Jim, you're, you're working with me, Saul. I never, I never let you uh, get off the job. And then the vacuuming guy comes. He goes, are you ready to go? Uh, what's going on here? Everything okay? And Walt tries to, he says, no, no, Saul's staying here with me. Uh, and what does this mean? Walt, uh, all white t-shirt. Oh, when Saul says, you know, I'd, I'd prefer to leave, Walt says it and sprays it on Walt. He goes, it's not over till it's uh, cough, 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 over. And that's it, that's it. Uh, you know, he coughs. Oh, one point, Saul goes, you know, I'm not your lawyer anymore. He goes, I'm just a guy with a job and three pairs of Dockers. And then we get a little prequel because he says, in the best case scenario, I'm managing a Cinnabon in Omaha. And that's when Walt says, it's over uh, when it's over. And then Saul walks out on him. Then we have Skylar in a white blazer. Uh, sounds totally off because uh, Skylar's kind of drifted out. And they're like talking, and they're like, Miss White, are you following all this? Do you understand? And she goes, I understand I'm in trouble here. And that you want me to tell on Walt, but I don't have any information on him. And they say, okay, go talk to your lawyer and see if you can remember and come up with something we can use. Uh, and then we see this, uh, their house at night. Uh, oh, the lead agent was a jerk, I also put in parentheses. Big Sky. Big Sky from Lead Agent. What does that mean? <laughs> Interesting. Uh, but the ha we see, then we see Skylar's house at night, like exterior shot with the surveillance police there checking in. Skylar's smoking and having a drink, looking out the window. And Todd shows up to show his respect for Walt and say, hey, just to, you know, let's keep an eye. He goes, by the way, Skylar, good news, I'm in love with Lydia. Then we see Todd in an Oxford, in a blue, like a blue Oxford with a button-down collar. I was like, is he going, going back to Catholic school? I think those are the only shirts I was allowed to wear at Catholic school. And Todd's drinking some tea. He's got on khakis. And Lydia shows up. This is at the same coffee house she used to meet Walt at, but they sit back to back. Lydia's on her high nerves. Waitress comes, Lydia's very concerned, very concerned. And she tries to manipulate Todd. She goes, you know what, we're going to have to take a break here. Or maybe it was real. 
And she says, I wish you all luck. And Todd goes, oh, the last batch was 92%, and it was blue. And Todd gets this pleased look on the face. And she goes, that's Heisenberg quality almost. And she goes, geez, how, how are you doing that without Heisenberg? He goes, Pinkman, you know, next best thing. And she's like, well, they're looking for him. He goes, hey, he's, he lives with me now. Don't worry about it. Uh, no problem. And then Todd, like, turns his, he puts his hands on his chair. And he goes, she, don't you think we make a pretty good team? It's kind of mutually good. And Lydia has this great quiet, she goes, 92%. I don't know how she said it, but it was so good. She just kind of lets it out, 92%. She touches her lips, like thinking about the money and the quality of the meth. Next thing we see is Walt hiding in a propane truck uh, in the snow. And the Robert Forrester lets him out the vacuum, and he says, hey, "Welcome to New Hampshire." The Grand—I don't know—he didn't say the Granite State, but he said Mr. Lambert. And the cabin here is much more cold and bleak. There's snow, and this cabin looks like a kind of place you do. Like uh, the other one had an English garden. This has got no garden, just cold, bleak snow, some pine trees. So it could have been nice for hiking. But he says, yeah, you got a month of food, canned goods, some steaks in the freezer, like a propane generator, enough for the winter, for the lights, the TV, and the freezer. And then there's a wood-burning stove to warm you up, and you can cook on it. He goes, the TV doesn't really work. Uh, maybe you could buy some Montreal TV. He goes, DVDs. And it looks like they had two copies of Mr. Magorium's Wonder Emporium. And he says, well, geez, I'm not a movie guy. Full vacuum says that. He says, well, I'll make a spy run next month. Put it on the list. And Walt says, supply run, 50 grand to go to Costco. And he says, it's a risk, man. He goes, you're not paying me for toilet paper. He goes, it's a risk in 4,400-mile trip. He goes, I usually don't deal with people on an ongoing basis. But he says, you're the, you know, you're, you're the most uh, wanted man I've ever dealt with. And Walt says, where's the phone? He goes, phone? What, are you kidding me? He goes, hey, you go, you, you, we're hiding you. He goes, no internet, no phone. No nothing. He goes, you want news, I'll bring you the papers. Whatever, whatever you want, put it on the list. And Walt goes, I got business to conduct. He goes, your business, he goes, your business is your business. My business is keeping you here. He goes, so I got to keep you out of sight. And Walt goes, well, what's keeping me from walking somewhere? He goes, nothing. He goes, uh, there's a town eight miles down the hill. He goes, I can't stop you. But he goes, you go down there, you're going to get caught. And he goes, if I find that out, I won't be de coming back. And uh, he goes, Walt's well, like, okay. And then Walt, he goes, I got to go. He goes, you, and Walt, he goes, you want to use the, show, how, you show me how, you show you how to use the stove. Walt's like, I got it. And he goes, you know, you paid good money for this. Uh, why don't you enjoy it? You know, think on things. It's kind of beautiful. And he says, all right, I'm out. Uh, and he says, thank you. See you in a month. Also, there's like old snowshoes on a wall, a couple of deer. Then we see the red cabin, we see the woods. Uh, what does this say? Panda with hood. I don't know what that means. Oh, parka. Walt, Walt's wearing a parka with his hood on. And he goes to the money. Uh, he stuffs his coat up with money. He pauses, he goes to his bag, he gets his uh, hat, the Heisenberg hat. 2630, this is the moment we've been waiting for. The hat goes on, the music goes on. Walt starts to walk, and we see. Then he sees the snowy road. He changes his mind. He says, "Tomorrow, tomorrow, I love you tomorrow." And he lights the wood stove up, warms up. The hats on the door or the deer. Then we see Jesse on Gorsh Run. What does Gorsh Run mean? Oh, garbage can on his bed. And Todd shows up. He's like, hey, we went to um, ben, ben and Jerry's. You got some peanut butter cup and some Americone Dream. 
It was a guy we got to celebrate. Dale Asperich was 96%. And Todd smokes and kind of watches him. And he says, well, tomorrow's going to be a big day. Another work, you know, another round. And he says, hey, Todd, can, I'd like to look at the stars tonight. You don't mind, do you? He says, that's fine. He goes, it'll be cold. Good night, Jesse. And then Jesse tries to get out. It really creative of Jesse was he rolled up his mattress, then folded his blanket, then put the garbage can on that. And he jumps up, he gets out, but he doesn't get away. And the next thing we see is a gate in focus, and Walt's out of focus. He walks into focus, and it's Parka in the cold, gloves on, Parka waving. Red Jeep pulls up. We see a newspaper bundle cut loose, a couple of cases of insure. Put some weight on Walt, according to the vacuum man. Uh, Walt needs some glasses. He's like, okay, I got a bunch of... Uh, uh, glasses for your your old house is up for auction. Then he says, I got your aspirin here. I'm going to put it on the deer's head. And he says, sorry about the last time. Uh, like, oh, Which kind of filled us in the time has passed. It's not just been one month. It's been a few months. Well, it's also got hair and a beard, I think. But it's like, okay, a lot of time has passed. Uh, both guys were in plaid fleece just shirts. And he gets ready to leave. He says, all right, I'll see you in the afternoon of the 15th. Uh, Walt says, stay, you know, please. Uh, anyone want some company? And he says, uh, well, uh, and he says, two hours, I'll give you 10 grand. And, and the guy says, 10,000, I'll give you an hour. And he says, all right, seven cards. We'll play some cards. Seven cards, stud, I assume. He says, I'll deal. Well, it says, what are you going to do if you come here and I've, got, you know, bought, bought, purchased, a, you know, another farm? And he says, what about my money? Are you going to give it to my family? And the forester says, if I said yes, would you believe me? Which was hilarious. And he says, we want to cut the cards. Then at 40, uh, 30, his no. Oh, just the way Walt said no, I guess. That was so weakened down, his answer. Then game to a night shot of uh, something, oh, of the house. And then the inside, we see pictures of Skylar from the newspaper. Walt's asleep, cuts off, his coughs off his ring, puts it on a piece of twine. He had like yellow mustard PJs on. I think it was just a sweatshirt, though, or Long John's. Uh, twine, and then he looks across the room at the insure box, uh, and the next thing we see, it's the daytime, he's carrying a wrapped package all tied up with string at the gate, walking in the snow, first steps, first tracks. Then we see a school classroom, it's either a chem or bio lab classroom, there's a test going on, and then there's a call, Flynn White, to the principal's office, please. And the principal says, it's your Aunt Marie. And then we see a woman on the phone at a bar. She says, hold on a second, honey. And it's night there. I couldn't, I couldn't, I said, well, maybe, maybe that it kind of works. Or I guess it was just a dark bar. Uh, there's kind of a hockey game audio going in the background to give us, and there's nice school audio. So really good audio design. And Walt's trying to explain things to Junior. It's Walt on the phone. He said, I just I never intended this to turn out this way. And he says, what's Lewis's address? I'm going to send a package there, 100 G's. And, you know, Lewis will cover for us, right? 4848 Newcomb. And he says, you know, don't say anything because the cops will take it. And then he says, can you even hear me? Uh, and he goes, well, it's just so sad. He goes, I wanted to give you so much more, but that was all I could do. And Junior's like, by the way, I don't want anything from you. You need to shut up. Uh, goodbye. So Walt's sad. The, the bar is empty. There's like a shot glass of quarters on the bar. The Walt calls the DEA. He says, hey, I got some info. Uh, why don't you come by and talk to me? 
to Walter White, and he just leaves the phone off the hook and then gets a drink of Dimple Pinch. Don't know what that is, honestly, and I can't think about it. Neat, and then Walt kind of savors the drink. Bartender starts changing the channels, then Elliot and Gretchen are on Charlie Rose. You know, like, you just gave $28 million for drug abuse centers through the Southwest. And they say, well, Charlie, uh, this is our home. We couldn't ignore what was going on. And then they said, well, geez, in the New York Times, they said maybe this was publicity since gray matter, you know, is associated with Walter White. To cleanse yourself, so to speak, uh, of Walter White. And Elliot says, glad you brought that up, uh, you know, we were dealing with someone who had nothing to do with the creation of the company and less to deal with growing at what it is today. And they say, well, what did Walter White contribute? And they say, well, to the company name. And they said, well, to, what do you mean? And they said, well, Schwartz means black and white means plus white uh, makes gray, gray matter technologies. And I think Gretchen goes, his contribution began and ended right there. And then we get even deeper. Walt starts grimacing the whole time. You know, he doesn't like this. Uh, uh, you know, you're glad you brought that up. Oh, he's totally emasculated. That's what I put. Uh, you know, and what grabs his napkin? Uh, just the name. And then they say, "Well, Jesus, well, you know, no, there's still blue matches. Walter White's still out there." And Gretchen goes, "Walter White, no." He goes, "You, you sound pretty sure." She goes, "Yeah, I am." Uh, she goes, I'm not sure about that Heisenberg, but whoever the kind, brilliant man we once knew long ago, he's gone. And then the Breaking Bad theme kicks in as Walt grimaces. And then we see the bar later, and there's a $20 tip on the bar. Walt's drink's empty. Walt's gone, and the police come, and the episode ends. Hey, so I'm here. Welcome to another episode of Sleep With Me. Uh... I don't know where I'm like, but I'm here with my neighbor Ray. So, is like if you if you've, you haven't listened to a lot of episodes, I have this neighbor Ray Perkins, who is an older adult. I don't know again Ray's age. I would guess uh, like he's in here, so he can't really guess someone's age. It's uncomfortable. Somewhere between fifty-five and. A hundred, I don't know. I don't think he's a hundred. Ray, are you a hundred? No, he's shaking his head. Uh, but to say Ray is an optimist, to say Ray is charming, those would be true. Ray is the most, uh, I like to call him the most well-adjusted person I know. But that wouldn't be saying much, but probably maybe even for the most part. I mean, Ray, you know, Ray's a human, so you got, you know, Ray's got some things going, but... uh Really nice, friendly guy. And one of the things that when Ray comes on the show, for the most part, is because Ray loves theme parks, uh, particularly Disney parks like Disney World and Disneyland. But I think tonight, ideally, I never know. You know, I can't control Ray because he's my neighbor. But we'll talk about a different, another theme park tonight, uh, hopefully. Right, Ray? So, like, uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to my neighbor, Ray. Oh, hello, 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 everybody. This is your neighbor, Ray, your friend, Ray. And it is so good to be back here in your ears, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and friends beyond the binary. I'm your friend, Ray. I'm Ray Perkins, by the way. Pr pleasure to meet you if you're new here. I don't know how many new people are here. Now, S Scooter is, uh, I, I like to call him Little Andy. Sometimes I call him the pod boy, our little pod boy, little Andy. Uh, but I've been his neighbor now for, for, for quite some time, and uh, I have a great affinity for this young man. And then he became the pod boy when he started this podcast. Of course, he didn't tell me about it right away. But, you know, I have a keen eye for these things, so I say, because he was always, and, and ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends beyond the binary, you should pat yourselves on the back because you really have affected this young man. I mean, because he used to come home, you know, in various states of di disarray, we'll say in a pol polite way, with disarray. It's, uh, my name is Ray. 
but what, even when he wasn't in disarray, he was a little bit of a, a little bit of a grouch would be an understatement, and he would like to he would pretend one of his best moves. Like he has a lot of moves to avoid talking to people like me. He he the fake phone call like uh, he'll see me and then he'll be like oh yeah yeah anyway and then he would try to turn away and just give me a wave. But many times you know I knew he was not on the phone. He'll do the uh, he'll see me out of the corner of his eye then do a stop pocket check. I forgot something somewhere. That's another move he uses to avoid talking, uh, acting like he's interested in something either on his phone or where he's out of my eye line. So he'll pretend like he's looking at a bird and just walk right by me. And I know it's, you know, it's just the pod boy. I, I, I wish he would love the world as I see the world with love. And your friend raised no Pollyanna. I know the world's not a, it's a, it's a, it's a place with rough and sharp edges, but I like to view it uh, with an excitement and a palpable. But but I got to tell you, speaking of excitement, oh, oh, my friends! By the way, it's so good to be back in your ears. Thank you for having me in your ears. Uh, this is your friend Ray, and it is good to see, good to be talking with you again. I'm just so happy to be back here. But speaking of delightful was this summer that I spent with this young man, Pot Boy, and his family that he said, leave, him, leave them out of it as much as I can with the talking. Uh, but this summer we went down to Orlando, Florida, and we spent some time down there. And I talked about it a few months ago, about all the hotels, because one thing the Pot Boy loves to do is save money. And he loves to figure out the deals. So we talked about that a few episodes ago, how we had to change hotels almost every night to save money. But also the poor pot boy, he thought that would be exciting. And it was, there was some, some fun things about it, but it was, uh, I think he even realized the time you want a hotel room when you're on vacation. I mean, think about it, any vacation, whether you're with a family and you want, you have a young one, or whether you're with a, like a romantic partner, or whether you're even flying alone, you really the nicest time to have a hotel room is when you're supposed to be not in there between 11 and 5 p.m. Especially in Orlando in the summer, because you could take a nap, you could get cool, you could you know if you, if you could make some sweet not with the pad boy, but but you know you could make some sweet nothing if you know what I'm saying. You know, you could take a shower, before, you know, or you could combine, don't combine a nap in the shower, but you, the other, you know, all nice things you could do. And anyway, I, 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 but so the pot boy and I, he said that the listeners are really looking forward to hearing about Harry Potter land. And he said, Ray, you got a nice, but we went to the water parks. Shouldn't we talk about the water parks? And he said, no, skip the water parks, and next time we'll record, we'll talk about the water parks. I think he also likes how I say water park. So he said, Ray, mention the water parks, but don't. So I think this was a cheap one for him to get me to say water park. But, oh, so we had this time. So let me think about how did we get to the Harry Potter land. And let me set the stage for all of that. I remember we took an Uber. Because we, would, of course, uh, spoiler alert, we were changing hotels. And now this is when you when you're working with the pot boy that you have an adventure. Like the adventure is good because we were staying at a hotel near the Universal where the, where the Harry Potter Land is. And this would be a pro am tip for all of you that I learned from Scooter. Like, so Scooter, so the, the Universal they have their own hotels. And now they have more than a few hotels, but the, the the three there's three of the hotels that cost a little bit more money. And what Scooter did was he found out that if you stay at those ho three ho one of those three hotels, you get uh, to go to the front of the line with the day of check in and the day of checkout. But Scooter also said these hotels they obviously cost more money, so Scooter ran all these sort of friggin crazed searches trying to find the one day in two weeks that was the cheapest rate in one of those three hotels. 
Uh, then he figured out if you get some sort of pass, you get another 30% off of the room. So he got a room for one night at this this nice hotel, but at this, the lowest rate he could possibly find. It was still, uh, you know, Scooter doesn't like to pay over $150 for a hotel room. And that's out the door. And let me tell you, if you run a hotel, don't don't ask Scooter about paying, paying for parking or a resort fee because, he, you know, you could consider the reservation canceled. So I think this was right around that, that he, he had found a way to get it down around that price. And then he was already worried, like, about the resort fee and the parking. You know, because it is a bit like buying a car. You say, well, how much is the room? And then they say, well, we've got to... It's 150 plus the taxes, and Scooter said, no, 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 it's either 150 or get hit the road. But he had already dealt with all these things before. So we had staying at this hotel, but Scooter, you know, he gets he gets uh, intense, and then the, we, we had gone over there. And I'm, not, I'm wondering if the I don't think the hotel room was ready. It was not because Scooter had work to do. So we went over to the hotel, we checked into the hotel, we got it a passes so we could go to the front of the line. And we were with his little one and her mother, and we we all got our passes, and then we uh, took a, I believe we took a boat. Uh, Scooter's not in the room. But they have a little water, oh yes, because Scooter talked about this on the show. So they have a little water taxi that goes from the hotel to the Universal Park. Now, it doesn't actually go to the park. It goes to, like, where they have the club, like, the restaurants and the nightclubs and those things. But it goes close there. And and, uh, and that was the first. And, and this is good for me because it, it starts to get me in the theme park zone. Now I'm not walking or taking an Uber, a bus, or a car. I'm in, I'm, in a, I'm in a little boat so I can say, oh, boy, Ray, here we are. We're shipping off to another world. Uh, but so we 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 got in the water taxi, and the one observation that was made was that the water was a strange color blue. And now Scooter refused to ask the boat captain, "Is it because the water is the water colored this strange color, blue green? I would say, or is it uh, is it uh, the 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 bottom of the water? You know, because it's a man made. Uh, these were canal like things." But oh boy, we were having a time on this uh, this this boat ride, and you go down a little canal, and you pass a couple. Of, I think you pass one other hotel, and then you pull in, and and it was I, I believe it was like a, a, in the morning, like ten eleven in the morning, we will say, and then we went into the park, and it was already pretty busy at this Universal Park. It was very uh, very busy. Uh, what can I tell you? And then Scooter, he also has an application that he would pay for that tells you what rides to go on in what order and uh, what, what the wait times are. But when you're with a little one, she says, she's not a little one, by the way. She's a young lady. She's nine, nine years old. But when they say, oh, there's the Gru ride. Can we go on the Gru ride? They say, well, it's a, that, that's not what you do. When you go in, you don't go on the first ride. But then any child said, well, I'm here at the park to go on a ride. And it was very hot, as I said, it was very hot. So then we went into the Gruel ride, and you're supposed to go to the front of the line, but this is very busy. So this was a bit of a buzzkill. Even, even Ray, I'll admit it, like we got into this line, and it's heat, and it's waiting, and we're saying, what are we waiting for if we have these passes here? And then you feel guilty because the line was, I think the regular line was 120 minutes, two two hours to wait in this line uh, to go see Gru. And and, uh, and it was one of those, uh, what are those called? Uh, it, it was a theater where you watch a 3D movie in chairs that kind of move, but they, they just, they don't move. Uh, they have motion. They do not, they do not move. And, you know, the lovely Steve, this was the Despicable Me ride, and you have the lovely Steve Carell, I believe. He plays Gru. And there was it was good theming on the inside and lots of funny jokes. And then, we you know, the minions are very cute. Kevin is my favorite minion, in case you're keeping score. And Kevin, I think, is the most, uh, Kevin may be the only named minion, at least the one, only one I know about. 
but so we waited and then we went on that ride and uh it was exciting ride very good uh i think uh, i just remember going through a factory or something but then what was a little bonus afterwards you know all these rides they go into the gift shop just like a banksy said exit through the gift shop they say that was the Banksy movie, but we we exited it before we got to the gift shop in the exit mini cham middle chamber. Uh, there was a dance party with uh, with minions, and then even Scooter was was ready to dance with the minions. And then unfortunately, when we got there, it was time for the break. But we, you know, it was fun to see minions dancing. Uh, so we did that, and it looks, from the outside, it looks like Gru's house, which was cool. Now, after this, I get a little mixed up. Like, I believe what we have, like, uh, this, the other big rides. Now, we, we are there with a nine-year-old, remember? So this was when things got difficult, because there was a, there's a, a Transformers ride. And I think that is probably the next ride we went on. Uh, we may have, I'm trying to think, Ray, what did we go on next? It was either, I believe it was a Transformers ride. Now, with Transformers, they're a little bit bigger and louder. And even for a nine-year-old, they're a little intimidating. And so we went on that ride. And that line was not very bad. And that ride is was one of these kind of rides that I think Universal specializes in, which you kind of learn, which is you're in a car, and the car is moving, but there's also three-dimensional uh, movie screens that your car and physical sets that your car moves in between. So kind of like a hybrid between a uh, roller coaster ride and a, just a three-dimensional movie. And this was very well done. It was... It was uh, but it was a little intimidating for the young one. Not, t not, not anything, you know. But she said, oh, well, I don't know about that ride. And let's see, I think Bumblebee was in the ride. Optimus Prime. Uh, Star Scream, Star Screecher. Mega, Mega, Mega Brain. There was some sort of thing that sucked stuff. I think that was called Scavenger, Scounger, some such thing. And your job is to rescue the blue spark. And as far as getting now, Ray, I, I even like to judge these cues. You know, I like to get into the zone. And this one, the universal cues, the waiting in line, that's what it's called. Uh, they're just all right. Now, Disney, I think the Disney people have gotten, I'm sure it's internal debate about what you're going to spend your money on. But they still have an upper hand there. But I don't think Disney has very many, or if any of these rides like this. Universal may have too many, in my opinion, but they, they, they're, they're quite exciting. Uh, but that one, it tried to get you in the zone. There was buttons you could push. They didn't do anything. And then there was TVs with cameras because you're waiting. And I think the yeah, bad Transformers had taken over New York City. But the, the ride itself was very, very good, very good, uh, very loud. This is a loud place, this Universal. Also, at some point, this is when Scooter would go off the rails with the soda because he bought one of the unlimited soda cups at some point not long after this. And then he would never be the same. But so we went on the Transformers ride. Now, if my memory, this is only if my memory serves me, but the next ride we went on was the Mummy ride. And this one was even tougher on the young one because this one is a roller coaster indoors, but also, I mean, very impressive. Oh, my friends, like this one, it is a roller coaster, but with kind of like moments like a little bit like Indiana Jones in the Disney or Pirates of the Caribbean, not so much like Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, but there are parts like that where you're like, am I on a roller coaster or a car or a boat? Uh, but just a little bit too much, uh, and again, very loud, and it goes upside down, which I don't think the little one liked, and if you don't like going upside down, uh, but, 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 oh boy, Ray, Ray liked that ride, uh, I liked it a lot, that was a good ride. Now, another thing, this, these parks here at Universal, you gotta remember, 
is that these parks uh, that you can't really bring any things on the ride uh, because it's, the rides go so fast. So you always have to put things into a locker uh, outside of the ride. So the ride the ride is normally free. The lockers are free, but if you have a bag or a backpack, it can get irritating because you constantly have to stop and put everything in this locker. So, but, but but they make it pretty convenient. It's just it's just one extra thing you got to get used to doing that Ray was not used to doing. Now, not like I'm an old man with a fanny pack uh, or a sling, but I like to have things, you know, to, to charge my phone. And with you, when you're with a young one, you like to have a bag so you could get, you know, to make sure all the needs are met. So after this, it was a little bit hard because we lost the trust of the young one because he said, well, I don't know if I like these rides anymore. I won't be going on the Mummy of Transformers ever again. So we said, okay, okay, that's that's our bad. So then we went, uh, we said, well, there's a little E.T. ride. That should be easy on you. So we went over on E.T., which is an older ride where you ride on a bicycle. Scooter dropped his water bottle on somebody's feet, and then he didn't know what to do. So that was awkward, because he had a giant uh, metal water bottle, a humongous water bottle. So this was early in the trip before he became a soda, a soda lunatic, and then he said, well, what do I need water for when I could just drink soda? So that was embarrassing, and Scooter was very stressed. But the E.T. ride is very pleasant. It's very strange, beyond strange, this ride. If you have done any sort of hallucinogens, you may have written this ride. Or you, if you've ridden it, it'll be... We've gone through Scooter and I and his brother, and we tried to plot it out. And it, no offense to Steven Spielberg, a genius, a genius, but... Uh, a uh, strange ride, very Disney-like of the Disney, they call them the dark rides, where you just ride through and you see things and they sing. And But I said, what is this with the singing with the little ETs? The, the little ETs, why are they singing? And they, because I think we had gone to save the planet. Uh, so it was just, it did, it, I said, there's no singing in E.T. as far as I know. Does, it, it, did E.T. ever sing? Where the uh, Reese's Pieces? Uh, but you do ride a bike, and then E.T. says your name at the end, and that's some older technology, but it's in, then E.T. doesn't always get it correct. I think he called uh, the young one Saba, Sababa, some, some such thing. He said, thank you, Ray. Like, it's more robotic than that. But it did sound like E.T. at the same time. But E.T. sounds a bit like a robot. Now, of all the things, that that ride does have a pretty good cue because you're indoors, but you're in a forest. So, uh, but there's usually not a wait for that ride anyway, which is nice. Then we didn't have to wait. Now, I believe after this we went to see an animal show, though don't quote me, but I, I believe we went to see like a performing animal show. Scooter does not like those things. Scooter, you know, Scooter can't sit still, and, you know, he doesn't really like to laugh. And But it was one of those, you know, cute little animal shows with a lot of trained animals, very talented animals at this park. You know, they had dogs, they they had cats that performed. I didn't, I, I couldn't believe my eyes. Many cats performing. And there was cats performing with birds. I mean, not exactly together, but on the same stage. And, of course, you got otters. I mean, give me an otter show. I love the otters. And I think they may even had a seal. I don't know what the star of the show is. Usually it's like a bird, like a two, like a, some birds and dogs, uh, the stars of those type shows. A pig, they had a couple pigs that were funny. And then they had audience participation, which is always nice. And uh, the, But then there was also advertisements, which I said, what is this? There was an advertisement for a movie in the middle of the show. And I realized it's a brand thing and all that, but I said, well, I'm not here to watch a freaking three-minute trailer of a movie uh, that, I, that I went and saw with Scooter later, and I did not enjoy Scooter, did not like that movie either. Uh, and it's a little bit of a tie-in. 
uh, but we went that now after that and after the animal show we went into springfield from the movie simpsons they have a springfield set up here now at first this was very hard on scooter because of right on the water they have a bar where they served off beer and so that was very hard on scooter i mean he, he uh he was in, you know, he had to, he, he had to be keep it constantly distracted and constantly drinking soda because he cannot drink the alcohol. But not as hard as, not as hard. He didn't really get bummed out, but he, you know, he, and they also have Moe's Bar, so that was hard going in there. But Scooter just ran through there. He, he but then he had to, he did get in an argument in there. But, but we'll get to that. Not a big one. Uh, but so we went on a little ride where you the the aliens from Simpsons they have a little ride, and the aliens tell jokes and you kind of spin around, uh, like on uh, like arms like in little UFOs and the little one in Scooter and I went on that. Now at this point, my friends, it was brutally brutally hot there, so it was very oh boy was it hot. And then uh, we uh, we went uh, we had lunch and that was horrible. Uh, Scooter was that's when Scooter got an argument, uh, be, just because it was so busy and hot. And it, w w of all, most of this park is very very well run, but the Simpsons they have all these different places to eat from the show, and it's very popular. And so they try to like uh, to show you to your seat, and you're waiting in a long line, and it's just awkward because you it's like your cafeteria style. So a lot of people aren't used to what you know. It just it, people, people can be really human beings sometimes, especially at these parks and the standing, or the bumping. And you say, "I got a tray full of soda here. Why are you bumping into me?" Or you know, the kids are in different stages of meltdown or unsupervised running into my legs. So that was tough. But when we did get the food, it was, it was, I don't think it went in, in, in any way. It was fun because you could order different things from the show. And this is when Scooter made his soda purchase of unbelievably, always fillable soda. And immediately he, he was wondering where he could, like he drank his soda before he ate his food. And then he said, I need a refill. And there wasn't a refill machine, and it was so busy. So he said to the one of the workers, where can I get my soda refilled? They said, go into Moe's bar and tell the bartender. And Scooter made this sound, you know, because he didn't want to do that. But then he went in, and this was like a regular bar, a Moe's bar, and a Moe's tavern, whatever it is. And regular bartenders, they don't want to refill sodas so that they're not going to get a tip on. So him and Scooter, they had a little bit of a thing because Scooter said, I need a refill on my soda. And they said, well, I'm going to have to charge you. And then I believe Scooter said, well, you could talk to, no, you know. And they said, well, that's not our policy. And then I think Scooter said, well, you know. And then they said, so, but the soda got filled up and Scooter was watching. So they didn't do anything to his soda. Luckily, I think that, you know, kept Scoot out of Moe's bar forever. I mean, and also he said, you know, hopefully I don't, you know. So then we finished our eating there. Then we went on the Simpsons ride, which is a very fun ride. Holy moly. It used to be the Back to the Future ride. And then it became uh, the Simpsons ride. And it's it's an older ride, so the, the graphics are a little bit older. And it's a giant motion projector. So you sit in a car. And then it's a big projection on the screen, a huge screen. Uh, but very, very funny. Very fun ride. Oh, what a fun ride. And very funny Simpsons jokes while you're waiting in line. And Sideshow Bob, and, you know, everybody's favorite uh, protagonist, uh, antagonist from Simpsons and Homer. And there was smells, and it, it was a good, good we, I don't know how many times we've been on that ride, but then we had won the young one back, because now she had had E.T. and then the Simpsons ride, and the little spinning ride. So, And we may have gone on that thing twice in a row. And then we went on uh, Men in Black, which is a ride where you go, and uh, that was very much like a typical Disney ride, where you're shooting at the aliens from Men in Black. 
uh, like a like a shooting arcade back in the old days, or an arcade game, a video game, a console game, I believe we would call it now. But you're in a car, it's a dark ride, as they call it, when you're driving around a metropolis, whichever, I don't know if it was New York City or Los Angeles. I guess it was New York City because they had the uh, uh, flushing meta. But anyway, you go through and you're supposed to save the day and you're keeping score. And Scooter and his daughter are very competitive people. So then they were trying. Now, Scooter, he won every time. He He's very good at... Uh, 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 pretending to shoot aliens. Uh, so aliens out there, don't bother Scooter. And that ride is fun because you have uh, Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones and Rip Torn. The voice of Rip Torn is always nice to hear. And so we went on that ride. And then, my friends, it was time to walk over towards Harry Potter land. Now, there's two Harry Potter lands in this park. Oh, I should say the Universal, because there's two Universal Parks, Universal Studios, which is the park we were in, and then uh, Mons- uh, what is it called, uh, Islands of Adventure, which is next door. And so in uh, Universal Studios, they have London, Harry Potter, London. And then the uh, Universal Adventure, they have uh, uh, Hogwarts. Uh, But you can buy a ticket and you can take a train, the Hogwarts Express, of course, between the two places. But they also have the exterior of London. So we walked over there. They have the night bus. The night night. And my friends, I haven't read any of these Harry Potter books or movies. But this little one, she was so excited. It was a joy. So she couldn't believe that the night bus was there. And then we met the night bus driver, and he was very funny, and pictures were taken with the night bus driver, and it's a London waterfront, and so many details. There's this giant fountain and these giant lamp posts with the sort of carvings and decorations and things. Uh, there's a red phone booth, which you could call and find out secrets about the night bus and things. That was fun. Oh, there's a night bus even had like an animatronic uh, little thing on the bus that was talking to the night bus driver. That was funny. And I think it was even inactive. Like the audio animatronic thing must have had a camera somewhere so they could make fun of like uh, uh, talk to the people. So that was very nice. You can't, can't go on the night bus, but you could look at it and take your picture there. And then you go in the phone booth, and also outside, I don't know the Do- I think Dobby's the name of the character, or something. But you yell up to a window because there's these like London brownstone type buildings, and then I don't know if it's Charing Cross Station or what. Uh, that's the exterior to go into London, so you can't even see into this Harry Potter land. It's very cool. Uh, but she called up to Dobby, a snobby or something, and then it opens the windows and it looks out at you. And everyone was delighted, and then she was a little afraid to knock on a door. Then we knocked on the door, but nothing happened. Scooter at this point needed to go get soda two more times, run to machines to get soda. And then, believe it or not, Scooter, at some point, Scooter had to go back to the hotel to uh, to, to work on the podcast, which uh, we, we, we'll we get to here. But we'll get into little Harry Potter. So we then we made our way. Now, I was waiting to hear. I'd heard there was some sort of walking through a wall delusion. So I was thinking it was there. But I think you just walk around some corners. And then you come out, and it is so impressive. My friends, this place is, uh, you you do gasp. Literally, you gasp when you walk in here. Like, because you're already in this manufactured theme park world, but then you go through here, and your senses are cut off, and you're in this uh, uh, Harry, Potter, P- P- Harry Potter version of London, as they say. That was my, my oh, my friends, that was my little Harry Potter but you see, you see this uh, Gringotts Bank with this uh, giant uh, lizard on top of it, 
and there's just shops. It is so detailed, my friends. At one point, we will go through the details because I'm just going to give you a little overview here. But you look down, and up the, up the street is the Gringotts Bank. Then the Weasley shop is right there. And I couldn't even believe just the one shop. It's like a three-story shop. There's like a giant uh, three-story figure uh, coming through the roof and tipping its hat or some such thing. And every window is decorated, and they have jokes and different, like, things you could purchase or imaginary things from the movie. And, oh, the kids, as soon as they see it, they are shaking. Holy, and they go in, she went into the Weasley shop and shopping around. And then there's a couple of the shops near Weasley's. I don't know what, what else. The, I mean, I see there was shops for everything. You just, just like the movie. I mean, you're pretending you're shopping for your cauldrons and your broomsticks and your robes. I think there might have been a robe shop. And then across the street from the Weasley's was a restaurant we would eventually eat at. I don't know if it's three broomsticks or the other one. Uh, but also to the right is another area, which we did not go in this time, but I think where you could get some butter beer, you could get, the, that's where they have the shows, and it's nicely over, covered over. There's like enclosed train tracks running above you. And I don't even know if there's a real train in there, but every once in a while you'd hear train sounds. So that was very impressive too. I'd say, well, hello, like... uh like you could hear a train coming, but I, I said to myself, is that a real train or just a train sound? I don't know, my friends. Uh, but then you could walk down the street and there's there's just different things from the movies. So you could, you, and like Scooter had said, you could just spend so much money, like, uh, but in a joyful way, it's like spilling out of you. Now, of course, this little one wanted to go to the wizard, the wand shop, and I guess they have a wand shop show. So we, were, she wanted to get Hermione, Hermione Granger's uh, wand, Hermione, Hermione Granger. And first we went in the shop, but then Scooter actually asked a question to someone standing. He said, "Where's the shop?" Where? And she said, "If you come right in here, you're just in time for the, the wand show." And then you go in and you're immersed in a world, my friends, where you're pretending you're in the back of the wand shop and you're having a consultation. And all the people that are working there, very even the ones that aren't characters, are characters, and they're really helping you get ready for the show. So she was kind of like, there's all these wand uh, things and there's magical things for you to look at, little uh, animatronic things. I think there was, like, one where Wanda accidentally, like, there was brooms cleaning a room out of control, but you can't quote me on that. But then you go into a room where you meet with a woman. I think the wand, the the, the queen of the wands is some such thing. I'm sorry, but, uh, like, the she's in charge of the wands. And now every kid can't do this, so it's a little bit disappointing, but at the same time, it's magical. They pick one child. I don't know if it's at random. But she picked a young man, and she said, come over here, what's your name? And then the, the a wand chooses, she tries to pick out the perfect wand for the boy. And there's all sorts of magic happening in this room. Like, it's literally like you're meeting in a wand consulting room. I've never been in one of these things, but it was exciting. And so you're meeting, and you're finding out, and, and the boy, you know, they have a couple fake-outs, and then they say, well, this is the w wand for you, young man. It's got, you know, a little bit of ash and, you know, the tail of, a, you know, what a bezel bub or some such thing in there. And, you know, they save the day, and then everyone claps and cheers, and the kids are a little bit sad they didn't get picked, but what are you going to do? Uh, then we bought Hermione Granger. We I almost did another London. Uh, we bought Hermione Granger's wand, and they give you a map, and they have all sorts of interactive things all around the park there for you to interact with. So you can so you do the wing uh, wand in front of a window, and then a certain thing happens and it reveals, and it's all so much fun. Oh boy. 
Now, also, like I said, my friends, on top of this building is this uh, lizard. I think I can't remember what it's called. It's from one of the movies. Uh, and it breathes fire, like literally breathes fire every certain number of minutes. Uh, it does like this thing, and it sounds like it's going to sneeze, and then it breathes with fire. It's all safe, but you can actually feel the heat, and it's very cool. So then we were running around with the little one with a wand, and Scooter said, well, I got to go back. I got to take a call for the podcast, and then I got to get an episode released. And, you know, of course, we didn't want to do anything without Scooter. So as soon as he left, we bought ice cream at the Floaterine's Fortuitous uh, Ice Cream Parlor. And they had this, oh, no, 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 we went, we got butterbeer. And is it butterbeer is N- N- N-A, no, no alcohol in the butterbeer. But we got some butterbeer, and it was delicious, frozen butterbeer. And, uh, and then we, we was, for the next time, we were saving the uh, Nocturne Alley and then the uh, ride on Gringotts Bank and then the ride to the other park. And then I think we ate at the restaurant. So we'll talk about that another time. But uh, so we drank the butterbeer and then we made our way back through the park and it was brutal. Now, at this point, it was raining or getting ready to rain and thunder as it does in Orlando. So we made our way slowly drinking a butterbeer and uh, the little one and and. and uh, and we went to see Shrek 4D, which was an interesting and funny movie. Mike Myers and uh, Eddie Murphy and uh, an older 3D movie, but still very funny, very good movie. And then we exited the park, and it was raining, but or it was getting ready to rain. And this was one of these great moments for me because I got to walk back to the hotel. Now, the little one and her mother, they took a boat back. But I said, I think I'll walk, and you walk along the canal, and there's all these trees, and it's landscaped, and you pass the the one hotel, the Hard Rock Hotel. I had meant to go in there, but I just did not did not have the time or the energy. And then Scooter texted me that he had had a hotel, and. Uh, we went back, then there's a butterfly garden there by the Hard Rock Hotel that I walked in. There were some butterflies in there. And there's people walking. And you might say, Ray, haven't you walked enough? And then the boats were going by. And, oh, I like just sitting, I like, you know, I sat on a bench for a little while. I listened to the sounds of other people being happy. Oh, that makes me happy, my friends. Just like, like here talking and knowing some of you are listening and smiling along, and many, many more of you are just resting with uh, visions of uh, uh, Butterbeer running through your head. Um, with, with me and my, my, my handkerchief in my pocket, wiping the sweat from my brow, and saying things like, Harry Potter, Harry Potter. But so then I walked, in, and then after the butterfly garden, there was a little bit of a walk, a little bit too much exposed to the sun. Then you go under a bridge. So I said, well, you need to grow some trees here. And then you head back, and it looks like a little harbor where this hotel was, you know, with a little bit of, uh, a little bit like a harbor. And then the rain and the thunder came, and it was it started pouring. So that was exciting. But then Scooter had already got into the room, and then he was saying he was going to get on the phone. And then it was time for a nap for everybody. My friends, oh, did we get back? It was they said, well, well, Scooter. Everyone went to the hotel room. I was talking to to this person that was riding driving the boat. You know, I said, wow, this boat. Is it, uh, is this all it's cracked up to be or what? And she said, well, it's, it's not bad driving the boat, but it's not great either. And I said, wow, we. And then I went and got myself another ice cream. There was a gelato shop there. And I went and got gelato. I said, well, and then I said, well, I, I asked the boat driver. I said, what did you do? Do you ever have a gelato, uh, and she said, I prefer pistachio gelato. So I brought her a little surprise gelato. And, you know, Ray made, I made a friend for life, I believe. You put a little pistachio gelato. 
and I never, I, well, I did have a taste of that. It was, it, it, I, I never, I was like, I never had a taste of p- pistachio gelato. Do you, what, what do you love about it? And then she said, well, I'm, you know, I've got one more boat trip. Why don't you come along? And then we went, you know, I went on the boat with her. And again, I just soaked in all the other people that were going, heading back to the park, heading home from the park, and people were soaking wet. And eventually, you know, I got back. To, I, I met up with Scooter later, you know, after I, me, my, my friend and I, you know, we did that. Uh, and it was a wonderful afternoon. And that was so that was our first dose of Harry Potter and the Universal Parks. And then, uh, you know, the next time, my friends, I'll catch you up on the next part of the little trip I had with little Scooter, little Andy. Oh, but it's so good to be back here with you. Thank you, my friends. Thank you for listening to the pod boy. Thank you to all of you who spread the word or try to support him and help him do the show. And you know, the, 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 thank you, my friends. Oh, my friends, good night. I'll talk to you soon. All right, so it's Spanish story 62. Uh, last one for now. Uh, and believe it or not, because this is an audio podcast, uh, and no say be nada, like you're not going to see anything, you know, uh, nothing. Now, I do wonder, la retirata, la retirata, you know, will I have BB Metasta Snooze Breaking Bad, poor language, uh, like withdrawal, will that happen? And when things like that happen, you know, I head out, I try to head out on, a, like, an, 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 you know, unintentional adventure. And I headed down to this shop, and uh, it is in Cargo Del Resto, a custom rest shop. Uh, and they had seen me before, because I always pitch, I said, well, if you have a custom rest shop, why can't you hire old scoots to come on in and... Uh, you know, a mi me encantar experimentar, you know. I love to do experiments uh, with sleep stuff. That's what, you know, podcasts that put you to, to sleep, we do it the bedtime story. And they said, no, 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 we're a rest shop al contrario, unlike your sleep podcast. And I said, well, what could uh, get you to uh, change your minds about me coming into your custom rest shop? And they said, la comida fusion a toda hora. And I said, you want fusion food at all times in order for me to come into your shop and put people to rest instead of sleep. And I said, I could barely afford fusion food in general. Then talk my daughter into eating it. And so to offer it at all times, I said, you know, that whole uh, Postmates, Uber Eats, that whole thing, you know, that could that could be my undoing. I only let myself do it once a month because uh, otherwise I'd do it all the time. And then they said, lo que pasa es que estoy harto del tema. Like what happens if they're sick of this, you're sick of this. They, they were saying, I think they were trying to say they're sick of my talking. They said, what happens if we're sick of the subject? And I said, well, excuse me, rest shop. I was just out, one, you know, uh, like on an adventure. Uh, Pero estaba rica, you know, looking for someone who is rich in rest uh, to help me with my forlorn feelings about uh, fin- finishing out uh, watching uh, like 60, 120, you know, 200 hours of uh, or so of uh, Breaking Bad and Metastas news. I uh, can be on Ando. I'm be changing, the, changing it up now. And then the breeze carried a message Tenemos Mare Cuya. We have passion fruit. And I said, All right, I'm hard to, I'm fed up with you two. What kind of, what's your favorite, but before I leave, what's your favorite kind of fusion food? And they said, Peruana. They said, Peru, that's a good one. Peruvian, it does seem like Peruvian food gets fused a lot. I said, are arepas, is that a, 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 a Peruvian food? Uh, is it like, those are like corn cakes. Uh, they're different than, is that how you say it? They said, because you could fuse anything. Like, a, a little, what, are the, what are the ones that I like called the, uh, 
They're similar, but they have a different name. The meat pie. Can't think of it right now. You could get them at like a good Puerto Rican restaurant. I'll have them sometimes. I remember getting some in New York City. Now, of course, you know, because the ones that they have to have that golden, those are the ones I like. Uh, and they said, you don't even know what you're talking about. I said, I know what I'm talking about. I just don't know how to communicate it. That's the difference. He said it has to have the golden flaky crust. It's got to be golden or yellowish golden. You know what I'm talking about? The meat pies. I said 20 minutes from now I'm going to think of what it's called and you'll be wishing I was. But I said you could fuse anything with it. You know, with those kind of things, you just stick something in there. You know, throw some lemon and it's fused. Is all fusion contain lemongrass? That's another question I have. A little pedazo of uh, lemongrass. And then I found it was Kedado. Time for me to leave. Uh, bar a pro bar to try to find the solution to my sadness. But then I said, Pero sabes que? You know what? I'd really like to uh, disrutar, to enjoy those that are hombre for resto. You know, those that are hungry for rest at this rust shop. But it seems like I'm a big peña, peña in their butt, you know, pain. So I guess I figured I'd have to figure out a way, way to idea, for them to think it was their idea to hire, hire me. And cruda son muchos. Raw are many things, you know. Toca a bear. It's up to sea. Uh, Gustan. So I started, what I did was I set up a, in front of the rest shop, I set up a, I only had Play-Doh. But I set up my own fusion Play-Doh restaurant uh gustan como mejor that i like like everybody liked it the best uh and it get called it play he couldn't call it play-doh fusion because as soon as i did they you know shut me down and uh they say he said de hen de hen me you know leave me you know arriba la vista i get a great view of this play i can say it's play-doh fusion it's just not in the official documentations correct and then I started having entrevistas, interviews, and, like, a lot of people came that I paid, you know, secretly I paid them to come. And I had a Camara camera. This is all in front of the uh, rest shop, and they would come by and ask for samples and, uh, and uh, like, what was it? And I, I, to be honest, Daniel, I was hurting their feelings. I said, no, 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 no samples for you. You didn't want me. I said, this is a Play-Doh fusion shop. You wanted regular. I said, there is some play I, I do have lemongrass-styled Play-Doh and lemongrass-scented of my own creation. And I also sing songs by ABC, another bad creation, BBD, the East Coast Family. You know, I sing all those songs sometimes here at the fusion shop. You know, I also have some mixtapes. But you you can't come because you you know you didn't want me. I said I mean I I was wondering. Well, never mind. And then I did that move, which worked so awesome. And then I paid people to come. Asta Aka El Caro, like line up their cars and let Costa to see things were so busy. Like I was like I got more tables to serve people on. This was all a ruse. So day it cost me so much money. Uh, credit card, you know, de la mesa of the table, sobre esa mesa on that table. We had like contest, you know, we eat Play Doh eating contests, a fusion, la gane winners, uh, mis hijos, you know, children's meals, and chill, you know, we did like those TV shows where kids cook. We did that with Play Doh, like we talk about it easy. Uh, but also, they, they didn't want to really make it. They said, well, there's, there you go. It's fusion. It's smushed Play-Doh because it's all, you know, the kids play with Play-Doh for a little while, but it gets boring a little bit. Then we had Kumpula meetups, and, and then I said, well, I'm looking. They, they said, well, geez, it'd be nice if I could find a place to expand that had a dentro, had an inside instead of uh, this pop-up uh, fusion, Play-Doh fusion shop in, in the parking lot at uh I found, I think I found some technicality that they couldn't kick me out. And then I started teaching BNS Star, Play-Doh based wellness programs, especially for, you know, older adults, you know, because it's tactile. 
And, you know, I had commissioned some studies, like reading some studies, searching for studies and uh, and that. So, and it was free. Actually, I was paying people. So everybody wanted to participate. Uh, there was no Odeon. And, but then everyone said, well, what am I going to get paid? And I said, receive Ciberon uh, soon. You know, you'll receive your payments one day. And then we did a big drive because uh, we wanted to, to, to quite and Tonsets remove hunger with Plato. Imagine it didn't, you know, this one was a little bit of a stretch. Uh, but people came by by the thousands and Chaos and Don Aron, they were making donated Plato meals, which people took the wrong way. I said it was more, you know, I said it was just more something I thought of at the very second I thought it up. I didn't realize it would be foolhardy, you know. I know I'm one of the rare people that eats Play-Doh, but it doesn't cure any hunger. This is a hunger for me to get inside that store, not a hunger to solve any problems with Play-Doh. This is just a fake Play-Doh fusion restaurant that uh, has gone viral because I've overextended every credit card I have to try to, you know, make it look like a business. Uh, but Entender, Kaida, you know, I understand the fall, my fall from to disgrace, yeah, you know, disgrace. So then everybody left, and then I would sit in the parking lot, Sentendido, then Arce, you know, it was my damaged sense and my damaged fusion Plato restaurant. And the, the, the rest shop people would have a laugh at me. I'd say, hi, Ganalo, have a laugh, uh. I'm behind on my impuestos, my taxes, both CEO, my pockets are empty. And Validos, you know, I tried to validate people through Plato and it failed. And I tried to, to be honest, and then I tried the old be honest. I said, well, be honest, I was trying to trick you. You know, there was never a real Plato fusion Plato craze. Say, Gur vamos a hacer. You know, I could show you on the internet where everybody, let's make sure, I'll show you on the internet inside your store where everybody's making fun of me. You know, even musculos, muscular people, you know, we could stay out here where you could just laugh at me, but w what if you could see the whole internet laughing at me? You know, periphery, I'd prefer to stay out here. You know, sweldo, my salary of shame. But if you want to go in the shore, is your store or whatever, I could show you. So then we went in the store, and I locked myself in their store with them. And I said, hi. I said, well, here I am, uh, Centro, center your store. Uh, right and make a lot of rudio, a lot of noise of how correct. I said, I'm here. Actually, I'm here to, like, fuse some rest with your, sto your rest store. I, mean, I didn't realize it was an armrest store. So then I tried to say adios, but I had lost the key, even though I just locked the door. And I said, that, I said, you know, the real reason I'm here is because I'm worried about the end of the Breaking Bad season and total respect. I have so much respect for everybody behind Breaking Bad and the Tastus News. Mejor Mercado. It was the best market for entertainment. But De Tres Otra Bez, I don't know if I'll be back again. Genial, it was great while it lasted. Uh, De Heron, they said, what is this guy? He's really going to do this uh, for 62 episodes? And I said, Bolbio KBN, you know, all that returns well, ends well. And then people started lining up outside the store. So I said, you know, hola puesto todo, hello to all, you know, put all your rest in, in me. And people said, I just need an armrest here. This is the only, and I said, S, S in the wave, a new armrest, uh, Digan Algo. Well, let me tell you something about these armrests here. Suplico, I beg your attention. You know, there's a method, a method uh, that, that, that in control these, these, these people found. A sitio, a site within these armrests. Uh, Durante, w w during which your arms will be resting on them. Then I found the key, and then I said, oh, Ahorita, come on in right now. So let me ask you, Costa Rica, what would it cost for a normal armrest? You know, $1,000, $2,000? You know, respeto, regalo, I'm present here with respect. Uh, but Haberlo, I have some armrests that can prevent a disaster. You know, and I said, sit down, we test this armrest out. Abia NL Central, put your arms right in the center. 
Explain, yeah, uh, lose. Let me put a full light on you. Rizzo, feel that ripple of relaxation going through you. You know what? why that is? Pues no se sabe, because it's not known how to make a perfect armrest until solamente to this shop, only this shop. At Caso, perhaps it's the angle of the armrest. Mandar had said that it's the padding of the armrest. But ye garati, as I get over here to you real close with your arms resting on these armrests, Lahuro, I, I swear that something more, it's a Monero away. Entiendo that I get it, like, because these, in, in the inside of these armrests, Avisar, uh, I got to warn you, you might want to buy them right now because uh, ni, ni uno mas. There's not one more armrest shop like this. And many people before said, entrar, no, you can't enter in. But I've entered the boredom of my podcast into these armrests. Heriste no fue. It won't, won't hurt anybody. But when you do, really, go ahead, put your arms in there. Don't you see, pero me siento bien, but you feel good, right? Am I right? In este es el final. This is the end of all, like, this will be it, like, the, for the rest of the armrest business in the world. Uh, Terminus Toda, they're all going out of business. If you pay right now, Entregar, we'll deliver. Uh, bon Abanir, they'll come to your house. In este preso, you know, encased inside your armrest will be my... Uh, you know, bores, my, my, like, lavadero, like the sweet laundry of rest, uh, visto. And that was how I got, that's how I got over the end of this, you know. After the customers left, they said, no bon a bear. You know, make sure they don't return, you know, you can't crack the armrests open and see the bores. And then the armrest people said, pasa esta noche, what did you spend tonight actually putting bores into the armrests instead of making of a story about it. And so that's what I'm going to do from now on. Like, I'm going to inject armrests with the, the lulls of this podcast in order to create cognitive dissonance so I don't think about the end of the season. So that's it. Good night. All right, here we go. Episode 62 starts with rain, and there's a close-up on a car window. And looking through the window is Walt's face with the windows like steamed up and the camera goes, uh, zooms out a little bit, uh, steamed wide or wet, uh, glass, uh, wet glass. First it's a close up though, I guess that's what I meant. So it's really close up on the windows, just interpreting my own notes here. And then uh, the windows are wet. At first you're like, is that a window? I think there's a car lock, uh. Uh, then we see it's wet and steamed up. Then we see wet glasses and a nose. And then we see Walt's face. And he gets into the car. He's breathing very heavy. He's cold and he's wet. He's rubbing his hands. And it's an old car. And I don't know if he was stealing this car or if this car was left for him. But he's looking around for the keys. And he can't find the keys. And he finds a screwdriver. And he tries to, like... Uh, he tries to hotwire the car, which I said, does Walt really know how to hotwire a car? Is this a skill we've seen before? Like, Heisenberg, what are you up to? I mean, I'm sure if he, like, researched it, he could hotwire a car. I don't know. I just, I just it was like, huh. But then he kind of just slips. He cuts his finger. And then the police come. But remember, the car is steamed up. Uh, so I guess they don't see him or they're just driving by slowly. And uh, it's so rainy and foggy. Do I guess there you go? Is it so rainy and foggy? They do not see him. Double question mark. And Walt says, "Now this was a di di uh, divergence in the uh, like." So Walt says, "Por favor," and he looks up to heaven and he prays. Uh, in the Colombian version, this happens. In the American version, it does not. Uh, no, no praying in, in America. Uh, except if you're praying, you know, for the brave, for the home of the brave. But Walt prays for help. He looks up, and then the keys are in that thing. I don't know what that's called, a sun blocker. I couldn't figure that out. Uh, I can't, I'm still trying. Uh, windshield. Is it called a sun blocker? Hey, put down the sun. Sun's, uh, 
window shade. I don't know. I forget what those are called. I don't own a car, so. And then the car starts because he has keys. I can't believe I put car starts. Uh, in the windshield wipers take, and then there's like an airplane taking off sound. And then I was looking at a license plate. I don't know. Did the episode open? I don't, I don't see that. Uh, El Juego de la Vida, the game of life. I think that's the name of the episode. We see a car with a license plate BXA1 double question mark, and then a husband and a wife question mark. And I say, oh, does that Elliot and Gretchen? I said, Elliot, any you. I don't know what that means. Then Elliot again, question mark. Elliot, Gretchen's house. Uh, so that was what I, I said. Oh, wait, this is Elliot and Gretchen from Charlie Rose and Walt's old partners. And Walt's there, too. He's kind of lying low. Uh, what does this say? Uh, Walt is there right, ba right behind them. Uh, disoriented classical music or something. A distant, distant, uh, to a letter that, and then T E D, and then three, like two or three letters in between. It's distant oriented, disoriented, cla that doesn't make any sense. Uh, the la the, so, so there's classical music with strings, uh, while Elliot and, uh, Gretchen, and uh, her name's not Gretchen though. They're having a discussion about some inane subject, I think. And Walt's kind of looking through their house. He goes downstairs. They're in there like billiards. They have like a billiards room with a bar. And some family pictures. Walt looks through the pictures all the time. They're chatting. Uh, husband and wife uh, talking and opening and pouring wine. Oh, Marcella, that's her name. Edgar and Marcella. And Walt says, I'm como esta, and a surprise, and uh, he goes, I got to tell you some incredible, incredible stuff. You're not going to believe why I'm here. It's totally, and then they say, well, we don't, and he goes, oh, by the way, I think I, I think he says, I turned your cameras off, because, uh, of course, they said, well, geez, we got that ring doorbell, Walt. You're toast, you know, you're totally busted. Uh, but they stack money on a kitchen table, and then Walt kind of talks about the money, which, you know, that's for my family. And then Marcella, she's kind of got a rebellious streak. She goes, geez, that's not possible. And Walt says, no, 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 you're going to make this right. And uh, uh, Marcella says, geez, this doesn't make any sense, Walt. This idea is ridiculous. And Walt says... Uh, Oh, I heard you call me a monstro, you know, the whale or whatever on TV. And he, I guess he basically, the gist of it is he says, you're not going to tell anybody and you're going to get this money to my family on the down low. And Walt wants to shake hands on it, but Marcel is not about that. But then they do, and Walt's like, okay, we're totally square, right? And just like a couple of uh, super rich people, they say, totally, Walt, we're totally square. We don't even have a team of lawyers that could, uh, yeah, we're totally square. We're totally shook on it, just like when we started the business together. Uh, but Heisenberg's no fool. So then some la those cat laser pointers come up, and they say, then these cats come, you know, they're, they're, and they're knocking over all the glasses of wine, uh, uh, whatever, Marcella and uh, whatever, Edgar's or the cats. And Walt says, oh, are you planning on cheating me? Because I'll just have these laser pointers drive your cats batty forever. And they say, oh, no. And then more, you know, then they knock over a bottle of a truce or something. And Walt's like, laser light show, yo, that's what I put there. He goes, you got it? And they say, okay, we got it, good. Then Walt goes out to the car, and who hops in the back but Mono and Sweaty Mohawk, a Tripa. And they had laser light pointers, so their story gets a conclusion. You know, Walt pays them off. They look terrible. Don't give them any money. That's what I would have said. And then Walt asks a question. He gets an answer, something to do with Jose. He doesn't like whatever the answer he got. Then we have this heavenly music and heavenly woodwork going on. Jose's all casual. He's dressed in heavenly plaid and making a cigar box or something, just like his story back in rehab, using lots of lacquer. 
And then he steps forward, but he's still in the lab. It was a dream. And then he's cooking. And then we go 52 and bacon at the diner. That was a flashback earlier this season or last. Uh, then we see Walt's got his trunk all strapped. Then we're at a, he's at his old house coughing and looking up graffiti, trying to get his lily that's uh, concentrated lily juice that's still there. And we're back downstairs. He looks at the Heisenberg graffiti. And then Walt's at a cafe. He says, geez, before I go on a spree, I want to just have a tea or espresso. I think it was an express espresso. And who rolls in but Lydia? But Walt's on the, you know, he's playing spy. Walt watches. There's only one Stevie left, uh, Lydia. Bad news. Uh, that's, you know, not, you know. You know, it's made by Big big, big Sugar or whatever, by the way. Uh, but then, uh, P- what is his name, PETA? It's not PETA. That's the kid from the uh, that uh, from the Mockingbird movies. Petto, that's his name. He comes in, and Lydia's there. He, somebody's wearing, Lydia's in black and white stripes. And they chat, and then Walt turns his chair. He goes, hey, you mind if I join you? And Lydia tries to break right out of there, but Walt goes, whoa, 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 I got to beg you. you please stay. And he begs. Petto kind of listens and thinks, and then Walt talks to Lydia. He coughs. And he says, I'm in need of some serious dough, Lydia. And then Petto tries to talk, but Lydia kind of overrides him. And then they say, well, money for what? And then money, money for nothing, but the tricks are free, well, it says. But, you know, meth tricks. And they say, okay, we'll think about it. So Walt goes off. And then they put WTF for some reason. Oh, because Petto orders a beer. I was like, wait, what? And then Lydia and Petto talk, and Lydia gets all ice cold, and, uh, and then she mixes her tea. And then you're like, oh, snap, uh, or I was. Then Walt's in full MacGyver mode, which I guess they re- I see the ads because uh, I watch. I don't know, I guess because I watch Survivor. That's the only TV show I watch, but there's tons of MacGyver ads on there. And so he's in, he's getting prepped in MacGyver mode. And he's making devices with a car battery and a side to side thing with a car alarm. We see his wedding ring around his neck. Uh, then we see, see th- this was a great, I wish I wrote down the timestamps for this. Do yourself a favor, watch this scene in Metastasis. Uh, just for Cielo's ash, uh, she has this monster ash on her uh, cigarettes the whole time, almost the whole time. She's got a big button cordless phone. And she's very, very stylish. This felt like an old movie, the way she's sitting there smoking and her body language. Uh, great, great acting. But she says, Ola Maria, and they're talking. I saw purple glass somewhere. Maria looks like a combination of sad or mad. And this is when I started missing these characters that I was on. Like, I said, who should I have a crush on? Uh, you know, I wasn't I've been attracted to these some of these characters, but not in an overwhelming crush way. But now I started feeling forlorn. A little bit. Uh, plus, Cielo, it was just, she was she was smooth, you know, with the smoking. And maybe Maria's vulnerability and Lydia's cold unavailability, they, they, they both, you know. But they talk about Henry and Walter, C. Intendido. And then you feel this chill and cool with uh, Cielo as she says that. She, she said it in some chill, cool way, C. Intendido. Yes, I understand. I think that's what that means. And still this monster ash hangs off her cigarette, and she hangs up the phone, and she says, Cinco minutos. Uh, and then Cielo uh, motions. What does that say? Not even a word. I don't know if I had some sort of something, when, or if I was a lights route. M, and then two unidentifiable things, and then T-E-S. Motions, maybe, to Walt in the hall. They still talk. Still the ash is on her cigarette. Walt looks pretty good. And then there's this focus pull to Cielo and uh, beat ash. What does that mean? 
best best ash be be eight ash something about the ash and she talks still without looking at him uh she's filling him in on esta noche but i don't know last night and Walt pulls out his wallet. She's like, no, 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 we don't need any money. But Walt has the lotto ticket, you know, where where everybody's hiding. And so that makes Cielo sad. Her eyes fill with tears, and one rolls down her cheek as uh, Walt talks. And she breathes his breath, and then another tear comes. And then Walt talks, and this is a no. Uh, and she shakes her head, and then Walt says something... Mokes a pong. <laughs> the last episode, I still couldn't get the notes right. Makes a pong look, looks down sad. Mokes a pong. I assume it says makes a something, but I can't think of a... Uh, maybe, well, it makes a point, but there's a... a it's a P-O-N-G, it looks like, but looks down. And she puts the smoke out, but then she just pulls right out a fresh one. She says, Junior's going to be home soon. And Walt stands in the hall, arms at his side. They go upstairs to see Valentina. Uh, What does that say? I don't know what that says. They share a moment uh, with the baby. That's what it says. And then her buddy Lewis pulls up with Junior in the car. And they slap five. High five. They say, see you later, dude. And then Junior looks at the cops in his driveway. And then we see Walt hidden in the back and a swing set in the playground. He's watching Junior walk into the house. And it's nighttime and there's rain and Walt's at a gate and it's Pedo's number two uncle uh, smiling. Happy to see him. Uh, They pull up, they search Walt, they check for a wire and Walt's not happy about it. And this dude takes his wallet and his keys and then Walt meets with number one uncle, Jack. I don't know what he, I didn't even pay attention in this one. Who gets to Walt and the keys. He says, hey, there's not going to be any negotiations. You realize that, right? And they say, we're going to say goodbye to you, Walt. And uh, he says, uh, uh, and they just happen to be standing in front of, like, this was cool payoff. I don't think they did this in Breaking Bad, but they stand in front of that uh, painting with the father and the children going off to see, like, the hotel room painting or the uh, hospital lobby waiting room painting. They kind of separated the separation, the man in the boat and the family on the shore. And are they waving hello or are they waving goodbye? It kind of was a couple of reminders of Walt's internal state throughout the series. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, no negotiation. They say goodbye to Walt in front of the painting with the wife and the kids. Walt tries to get Pato involved. He looks at his keys. He says, Jesus, what about Jose? You guys are using Jose, I heard, from Tripa. So Pato goes and gets Jose. Walt does the old grab the keys behind his back. He pulls that off. And Jose comes in. And you can see his vacant look that Jose's kind of gone away. And Jose can't believe that Walt's there, so Walt jumps on Jose because he says, I want to give you one last hug and, you know, cover you up. And then Heisenberg, you know, returns for a little while. And, you know, he says that he he gets a, he had chartered a van for uh, Petzo and his uncles and everybody to go to that beautiful farm we've heard so much about, so much good stuff. All expenses paid, bingo, and two bathrooms, and, you know, open bar on the bus. So they all got on the bus, they went away, and then Walt wants to go, like, he says, she said, I'd like to go, Jose. Jose tells him off, you know, they share a couple face-to-face moments, but Jose says, no, I'm not going, and I'm not putting you on the bus, and I'm not driving the bus. Uh, we also get to see that the picture in the background is covered in holes at this point. Then the phone rings. It's Peto's phone. It's Lydia checking in. And Walt goes, yo, what up? It's me, Walter. He goes, hey, you got a cough or anything? Because I got to say goodbye to you. You're, uh, we got a bus stopping by to get you straight to the great farm. And Lydia says, will we be able to throw sticks instead of skipping stones like Mike does? He says, oh, yeah. Bye. 
Then Jose Gel drives off and he just yells a lot, like a little catharsis, emotional thing. Puts up the picture. What is that? Oh, he puts up the picture of Barack and yells. Then what goes in the lab and this gentle music starts playing. I couldn't figure out what the music was uh, uh, that, that it turns into. It was good, though. He looks over at the equipment and Walt lies down for a nap. Uh, I don't know what the, this looks like. It says come potatoes. I, honestly, Walt takes a big sleep and then come potatoes. What better way to end the series than the come potatoes? Then I have an arrow. Music camera pulls out slow and wide amnesia sing. <laughs> come potatoes. It really looks like potatoes. Come patates. Oh, maybe that's the name of the song. Uh, uh, patates. Uh, came patates. Uh, I don't know. And that was the, that's the end of a holy cow of a metastasis. Uh, 62 freaking episodes. I can't believe we've done it. Thank you for coming along. I mean, it's always like I do the Breaking Bad and stuff, but, uh, wow. And if you've listened or if you've watched, really great, great, great job, uh, they did with this series remaking it. Uh, I mean, it was tough. So I watched it a minimum of 124 times. Uh, Colombian Breaking Bad, probably more than that. Um, that wasn't easy. But you know, those other guys, those Australian guys, they got to watch one sh- one movie. So you know, they got me beat. All right, uh, let's get on with stuff. All right, everybody, here we stand, face to face. Just a couple, like just like Walton. Uh, uh, Jesse, like a couple of silver spoons. Uh, it's time for Felina, the last. I can't believe it's like at the end of a, uh, it's the end of an era. Also, I didn't talk about this too much, but it was the first time I see saw m- most of these episodes, especially these last few. I was really uh, out there, as they say, in the like really intoxicated when and when I watched them the first time. So I didn't really remember very much. Uh, so now watching with a clear head, it was really uh, interesting uh, how much I missed out on all the nuance and uh, details. Uh, so yeah, it was it was great. And uh, like, uh, so let's just get started. Felina was that, is that what it's called? La Felina. Uh, but the first image we see is snow on a window, and then there's a shadow there. And it's Walt, he wipes off the snow to see the uh, lock on the car unlocked. He gets in with his boy. What does that mean? With his boy. He gets in with, oh, his box. He said, what does that mean? Boy, that is weird, but it's box. I just didn't cross the X. He's got that box of money he was going to mail. I, and that was a mystery to me, what had happened to that box. And mystery solved. It's in Walt's lap. And he's cold. He's in a snow-covered car. Oh, Also, he didn't wipe off the whole window. I misspoke. He only wiped off a tiny portion to see if the lock was unlocked. Which makes me wonder if this was another move, a brilliant move by Walt, a.k.a. Heisenberg. Uh, but he's cold. He's looking for the keys to the car to get warm. So that would say no, because if he would have turned down the car, he would have been in trouble. He finds a Marty Robbins tape, and I think that's country music. I uh, can't find the keys to the car. He tries to jumpstart the car. It just slips and it bangs his hand. Police drive by. Walt was whispering. I think he said, just get me home and I'll do the rest. Uh but I'm not sure if that was where he said that or not. I just have that written down in the, or no, that's in the transcript. Uh, but let's see, Walt whispers, maybe that's what he said. Oh, yeah, just keep going. What is it? Is Jesk, just keep going? Oh, just get me home, one or the other. And we watched a reflection of police cars driving by on a search in his glasses. Uh, then Walt finds the keys. They're in the, the whatever that thing is that you pull down to block the sun. sun. I can't think of the name of it. This is it's still sun blocker, window protector. 
Oh, I just thought of it, and now it's gone. You, could you put your garage door opener on it? Uh, but let's see. So Walt, uh, oh, he finds the keys. Now I lost my spot. Uh, so he doesn't pray in this one. Then the music plays, the Marty Robbins or whatever, some country music uh, with, like, a subtext in there. And what does this say? Flash by. What does that mean? Flash by Stephanie. I don't know what that means at all. Is Walt well, well, Flash by Stephanie? That must have been the name of the song. I guess because they think maybe I told the, the woman on my phone to say, hey, what's the song? Yeah, I think that's it. Flash by Stephanie is what she returned to me. Uh, then Walt well, lets the wipers go to work and uh, he thinks. Then we're in the desert, and we see a white Volvo pull off the highway with New Hampshire plates. And Walt pumps some gas. He stretches. Uh, Thunder Falls crash? What does that mean? Trunk falla. Thunder Falls or trunk falla? Cash. Trunk full of cash. This is like a, I mean, Encyclopedia Brown of my own handwriting. Trunk full of cash. And he takes his medicine, he drinks right out of the water. People used to filter, uh, but I guess he doesn't care. Uh, then he puts 75 cents into a payphone. He said, man, that's inflation. And he calls someone, he says, hey, this is David Lynn from the New Yorker. Uh, something about Susan Elliott. Uh, so Susan, he was talking to Susan and Elliot, Elliot and Gretchen's PR person. And that's called, like, I forget what that's called. What is his name? Uh, that, uh, oh, the, the great hacker. He used to use this a lot. Uh, hacking humans. I don't know what it's called. What was that guy's name? I can't think of it. Uh, oof. The guy, I, I like, I think he's great. Uh, but yeah, so Walt tricks them, gets Elliot and Gretchen's address for their new house and when they're going to be home. Uh, they live by the opera house, which is, you know, typical. So then well, well, also Walt left his watch that Jesse had gifted him on top of the phone. And the next thing we see is Elliot and Gretchen getting out of like a cab or a limo or an SUV. And Elliot's in the middle of like, Elliot's doing material. I think he, he's just saying, he goes, oh, it's apples and oranges. If I want pizza, I go to pizza place. If I want Thai, I go to a Thai police place. And Gretchen's loving this. This is some real, I think this is, what do they call that, uh, foreplay. Pre, is it called pre-foreplay or flirting? Uh, but you kind of see, like, uh, I don't know if I bought it, but I could see, but, uh, you know, Ellie was really cracking up Gretchen, and she was like, and she goes, I can't believe I'm married to you. And they said, let's just get inside and have a glass of wine. And then, you know, uh, they didn't even have to, you know, say what's going to happen next because, you know. And then they go in and they're talking about, I think they're talking about fancy restaurants. Oh, they pass a pond where Walt's hanging out. Walt closes the outside doors. They, they they left their front door unlocked, which I don't I don't I, I had trouble believing that. I guess they live out in the middle of nowhere, or whatever. But uh, and Walt sl sl just slides in their house. He checks out their paint job, which was weird on the wall. Uh, Dakota Retta, what does that say? Dakota Retta. Don't who checks out their paint jobs. D-E-C-R-O-R-A-T-A-S. Is that a word? But he touches their photos as Ellie and Gretchen. They get the wine and they get their fireplace going. And they're like, whoa, Walt's here. Shocker. We were just, well, we were just about to make sweet love to one another. Uh, you know, depending on how much wine we have, you know, in Elliot's case. But, uh. They're totally freaked, and Walt says, uh, Walt, Walt does some material. He says, well, if we're doing material, I'll do a little bit. He goes, are we looking east? And Walt says, you must have a great view of the sangre de Cristos, like the the blood, blood, the kings of the blood or something. I don't know what that means, uh, mountains. 
And they say, what are you doing here? And he says, I caught Charlie Rose. You two look so good. I wanted to drop by and uh, check in with you about some business stuff out in my car. And they said, good gravy, you're not selling Amway. And he said, no, I got it. I mean, he goes, I want to have an essential oil party right now with you. And they said, well, which company do you represent? And Walt said, well, Heisenberg represents the, the one company, and Walter White represents the other company. So, but, you know, whatever ones I can get you to buy. And Elliot says, we don't, we have, we're rich. We don't need uh, multi-level marketing essential oils. Uh, and Walt says, I got to shoot, you know, this is a move they make. He says, well, let me show you how much money I've made. Let's stack it up here. And you can see how profitable my investments have been. And so Elliot tries to stand up to Walt and Walt has him stack the money while he sits there. And Gretchen drops some money. Walt says, pick it back up, you know, make sure it's all there because I'm going to give it to my kids. Actually, he goes, this, you know, this essential oil money, you know, you're going to give it to my son, irrevocable trust, you know, untraceable uh, German bear bonds or whatever for his family. You know, people feel bad for him. And they say, well, do it yourself. And Walt says, and I can't do it that myself. Uh, come on. And he goes, you guys are supposed to be rich and nice and full of guilt, which you should be. I was listening to those little ridiculous conversations you were having about freaking fancy crackers. He goes, just take care, man. He goes, and you know what he goes, if you want to call it guilt or whatever, bow gist or something. And he's like, my money never yours. I don't want one cent of your money going to my kids. And Elliot says, well, okay, sounds reasonable. Total, Elliot's the worst liar ever. What an ass. And let's say, well, let's just shake on it and then go. And then they give the two worst handshakes. Like uh, Elliot gives a very weak one. And Gretchen doesn't want to shake, so then she just does a hand touch, not a technical handshake. Uh, delay quick handshake. Well, of course, Walt was like, I'm not going to, he goes, I have other, uh, he goes, have I told you about these uh, laser pointers we have for cats? They're branded with our essential oils uh, to make, you know, with catnip flavored essential oil laser light warming the oil. Uh, because I don't trust you to, and that like gets them right on board. They say, okay. Oh, he puts his arms up. Does he say screeks? Walt screeks, then puts his arm up. I don't know what that says. S C R E E S or Z. But yeah, then that's when the essential oil laser light show begins. Uh, then we have Volvo pull out. Walt flashes the lights, and we see Badger and uh, Stinky Skinny Pete. Uh, and you know they get one last comedic moment. They're like, I don't know how I feel about this. And, you know, Stinky Pete's like, uh, for real, yo. And he's like, you're kind of you know, immoral. And then Walt gives them both a stack. And then they say, okay, we're, we're cool with it now, man. Yeah, Walt says, uh, how do you feel now? He holds up the money and they say, better. Then Walt finds out about the blue match uh, that's still on the street. So then he realizes, oh, Jesse's there. So then he drives off. Uh, then we see a close-up and the shots of heavenly work, woodworking going out with Jesse in his box. Uh, he's rubbing it down. He even kisses it as he holds it, and then he rubs it, uh, and he has a smile. Uh, then we see him cooking, and then we're in the diner. Walt's 52, happy birthday. Uh, then we see his trunk. Then he goes to his old house and gets his... Uh, He's actually, he says, oh, geez, I heard there's a market short on Stevia. He sees the Heisenberg graffiti. So we have a flashback to Hank, and Hank uh, talking to Wald about setting up the ride along that started all this, which was not in uh, the Colombian version. Uh, so that was a little bit interesting. And I don't know if that was a time decision or what, or they just didn't have that shot. Uh, then we, let's see, right along. Oh, then we see Lydia, she's at the cafe. Last Stevie is there. 
Walt's lurking around the corner at another table. Todd shows up. He talks about Lydia's blouse. Or he calls it a shirt. She says blouse. He goes, oh, yeah, it's like a cornflower. Uh, trying to flirt. Todd's so bad, better than flirting with me, too. But that would be the case. Say, oh, well, it's... Uh... But uh, then Walt pops in. And he says, I just got to, you know, just hear me out two minutes. I just got to ask you for some money because uh, I can help you. Since you're low on methylamine, I got a plan. And I could teach it to you, Todd. And uh, they say, how'd you find us here? He goes, uh, you're schedule oriented. This is Tuesday. You used to meet me here. Now you meet Todd here. And Walt says, I just need one mil and that's it. Yeah. Uh, and they're like, uh, like, uh, whatever, let's see. I don't know. Then the waiter comes and they send, they send Walt off. Lydia needs some more stevia. Then she tells Tad, she goes, this, the deal is, Tad, things are ice cold. Uh, uh, and anyway, we'll be doing Walt a favor. You know, he looks terrible. Uh, then we see a desert. We see Walt humming and working. He, instead of whistling while he works, he's humming while he works. And he's working with a garage door opener and uh, making wind-up toys. Sounds a uh, cool sound design. Wedding, his wedding ring on a string. Uh, then we see a house and a family portrait of Skyler and Junior. And the phone rings and the voicemail picks up. Marie's leaving a message. And she says, Skyler Waltz in town. Pick up... Uh, Pick up right away. Carol saw him. You know, he said, hey, Becky or Carol or whatever. And he's got some manifesto, so he's up to no good. And Skylar's smoking. It was really good dialogue. Marie has a real concern in her eyes, uh, especially at the end. Because she goes, uh, you be on the lookout for him, okay? And she says, thanks, uh... And then the camera pulls in, and we see Walt was blocked by kind of like one of the supports in the kitchen. Skylar smokes. Uh, she says, yeah, you look terrible. Walt says, yeah, I feel good. Uh, he says, so talk. Why are you here? And Walt says, it's over. I needed a proper goodbye. Now, like our call. You know, pull, he goes, she goes, are you going to turn yourself in? He goes, no, they're going to come see me. She goes, what about uh, that kid, Todd? Walt says, don't worry about that. Uh, and, uh, and she goes, what about that Lydia lady? Don't worry about her. And Walt pulls out of his wallet. She says, she didn't want it. we don't want any money. He goes, oh, I don't have any money to give you anyway. Blew it all. He goes, call the DEA once I leave, you know, because, uh, you know, and then you can use this. It's a little mappy po to find stuff that you can use that for a negotiation, get yourself out of trouble. And then Walt tries one. He goes, all the things I did, you need to understand. She goes, if you say you did it for the family, he goes, no, no, I did it for me. I liked it. I was good at it, and I felt alive. And then Skyler kind of looks down at the lotto ticket in her lap and shakes her head as tears come. Then she looks away. Uh, then Walt says goodbye to the baby. Uh, Skyler, lone, oh, she has a lone tear there. School bus comes instead of a ride home with his buddy. Flynn gets off the bus. Both Walt and the cops watch. She's incompetent cops. They're supposed to be guarding the house. Uh, and Walt watches Junior go inside, and uh, that's the end of that. Uh, then we see a, fain, a chain link fence that's locked. Uh, Walt rolls up. Uh, woo, Uncle Number Two. What does that mean? Uh, I guess he said woo about the car. Oh yeah, this thing's a classic. We got five hundred in here. Or what? And Walt's like, I don't know what the heck you're talking about. He goes, that's the one, 500, that's the one you want. No replacement for displacement, he says. And then they drive in. 
uh, does not like, uh, oh, the, one of the guys doesn't like how Walt parks, you know, but they still let him park that way. Then we see a close up of Walt's keys, and Walt gets searched. They take his wallet and his keys. Then we go inside, and there was, uh, Uncle Jack's talking about Walt's hair. He goes, look at that. Holy moly. Is that a wig? And Walt's like, no. He goes, uh, were you shaving it before? He goes, yeah. He goes, that is one fine head of hair. And he goes, you look awful. And Walt's like, don't you, did you, Todd tell you about my new plan? And, oh, also Jack had a purple sweater on. He looked very upper, upper class. You know, now he's got 12, 20, 80 million or whatever. And Walt calls out uh, Jack or Jesse. Oh, he says, you're partners with Jesse, huh? And he goes, oh, no, no, go get Jesse. And Walt manages to get his keys. And then Walt and Jesse share these kind of sad, broken looks. Then Walt hugs Jesse. Uncle number two was on the massage chair during this time, which was interesting. And then uh, Jack and Walt talk, and Jack wants one. They talk about Jack and Walt's money, and Jack wants one last smoke. And then Je Jesse and Walt face off. They have really nothing to say to each other. And Walt says, you know, do it, man. And Jesse says, you want this? And he says, say you want it. Walt says, oh, I want it. You know, I want this goodbye to be extra special. And Jesse says, well, then do it yourself. I'm out. And then Lydia calls Todd. She has a humidifier going. And Walt says, goodbye, Lydia. And then he throws the phone. I like that. Jesse looks back one last time. Him and Walt share one last look or a few, you know, with the camera changing in the edit. And then Jesse peels out, and he kind of laughs and cries and yells as he drives off. And then Walt heads into a lab, kind of where everything started, a bit different but the same. And Baby Blue by Badfinger, the song starts playing. Walt taps on a gauge, a pressure gauge. He looks around, he's got like this kind of skeptical inquir inquiry look on his face. He looks at a mask, and he, then the song kind of goes, Guess I got what I deserved. And we see the cops are on the way. Uh, we see a close-up of Walt's thumb in his hand, and his kind of a reflections on one of the stainless steel containers. And then Walt lies down for a nap, and we just see this slow spiral out from Walt, uh, up, up, up into the heavens. And the entire series comes to a close, uh, and uh, it was a wonder, it was a wonder, uh, Breaking Bad, a work of genius. Hey, hey everybody, this is uh, your buddy Scoots, and we got a little, it's time for, you know, it's it's it's, it's the holiday season here. Uh, actually, I mean, I'm just in, when I'm recording this, it's Christmas creep season, it's uh, whatever you call it, and it's not Halloween, it's not Thanksgiving, but, you know, I'm getting, I'm laying the track here. And, you know, I did some digging. I went down to the story swamp, and I said, what, ha you know, uh, it's important to me. I just almost said a Halloween, but what holiday tales have not been told? You know, that's what I am always in search for. The ones that they say, well, that story doesn't make any sense. Or, no, you know, nobody that doesn't have, a, like, a, the right. And I say, well, those are the holiday tales. I mean, do, do you have, it? Like, I, there's no store. And I think if I opened the store... Untold holiday tales. They'd say, well, those are untold for a reason. And I'd say, well, no more. You know, if, if you know, I live in a world where I defy those kind of rules. Uh, and this is, a, this is a treat. You know, you're in for a treat to, to sleep. You know, if you, if you sleep through this, you're in for a treat because you'll be asleep. But otherwise, uh, this is quite a story. You know, one of those ones that defies all the odds of being told. Uh, but this is a story that that has a place close to my heart. Uh, and it's called The Christmas Tree That Took a Walk. And so it is a Chris, It is a holiday. I guess Christmas, is it a holiday? It's not a holiday tree. It is a Christmas tree, I believe. Uh, but I think Christmas trees symbolize more than just... Uh, I mean, don't they, what do they, I, I'm not sure, okay, this is a material. I don't know what a Christmas tree symbolizes. I know it's a place to put presents under. 
uh, back when I used to go out, you know, and, and hit, hit it, if you know what I mean. It would be something that about four in the morning I would come and contemplate as I wavered being able to stand. I would soak in the Christmas tree. You know, sometimes even I'd sit down and just observe it. It would be pitch dark and turn the lights of the tree on. It's a place of, you know, it's a, it's a good thing to generate nostalgia. But I mean, I'm not kidding when I say, okay, so it's evergreen. So so is it a Christian symbol? I guess that's what I'm, I mean, I, mean, I went to Catholic school, so all the nuns, luckily, they're, you know, yelling at me from another dimension, so they can't get a hold of me. But, uh, and once again, I'm not doing this to be funny or irritating. It is an honest question. I mean, I would assume it's evergreen, so that might have something to do with it, but we've cut it down. So that kind of defeats the purpose. You know, if a tree could t- I'd say, well, why the heck did you make me evergreen if you're going to... But I don't, you know, uh, I don't want to get into the... the I don't want to speak for the trees because that's what this kind of story does. Uh, but the, like, uh, and, and this was a story I just happened to be a witness to, kind of, you know, indirectly. But, you know, when I was a lad, um, you know, my, my mom, she likes Christmas tree ornaments. Hey, my, hey mom, uh, hopefully you're asleep. But, I mean, in a good way. And that makes it easy for my mom to shop to when, you know, I can step outside of my own anxieties and worries and think, geez, what would my mom like for a Christmas present, a holiday present? It's normally would be a person, you know, a personalized or, you know, now that I have a daughter or somehow a Christmas tree ornament involving some of that. You know, it may be even also be treated with uh, dignity and respect by my son. I think we've gotten to that point, right, Mom? Now we're we're there. We've made it a visit. I, okay, I can hear you. Now you're in my brain. That's probably, but yeah, okay, I got it. I'll, I'll come visit soon. Uh, but so the Christmas tree, uh, like you got lights. I don't like um, I don't know. I probably shouldn't speculate on this. What the symbolism? Like are druids involved? Were, were like druids the original Christmas tree? Like isn't that where it all comes from? Or is that just my uh, thing? That uh, my misinterpretation of the facts. Uh, but this tonight's tale takes place at Christmas just like any other, uh, which is to say, like just like any other imaginary Christmas, but this one uh, took place in, in, the, in the city. It was so nice, uh, you can give it a short nickname, the Cuse. It took place in Syracuse, New York, 315 uh, area code, just in case you need to like dial information and you know, say, uh, is this story true? And they say, I'm sorry, this is information. And you might even say, put me on the phone with, uh, you know, the the Christmas tree. I think one of my cousins had thought about opening a Christmas tree farm. I don't know if he was kidding or not, or maybe he has one. This is unrelated to that, though. But, yeah, this is the t- tale of the Christmas tree that took a walk. And, and it starts, <laughs> I guess I already tried to start it, and then I, like, uh, but, you know, I don't want to start with the, to this stuff. Like, the, it, once originally this tree was growing. And just like humans, trees, especially trees at Christmas tree farms, in order to survive, you know, you need to use some cognitive dissonance. And, you know, as humans, we, we're pretty good. At, I mean, well, I, don't, I can't speak for anybody else. I'm great at it. Holy cow. If they're... If you could... I guess you can... There are certain careers that are based on cognitive dissonance. I guess like a telling a sleep podcast, I guess that's the definition of cognitive dissonance and some resonance. I guess I'm trying to go for a little cognitive rest and resonance or maybe cognitive, you know, anyway, enough, enough. uh, But just like humans, Christmas trees and Christmas tree farms practice, uh, and a lot of it's like subconscious or subtextual or just... uh, you know, we got to adjust, you know, and sometimes we maladjust and sometimes we can do. Yeah. Well, you know, Chris, like I guess the, like the way, just like human beings, I think a lot of our cognitive dissonance, we can learn from these trees. The trees know they're going to be cut down when they get to a certain size. And so they create like different mythologies. Now, I'm not partial, like I'm not partial to all the mythologies 
And these are a little bit different than belief systems or religions or anything. This is just like the things that trees, as little trees, start to yearn and hope for. And I think I'm telling you all this not to explain, you know, the you know the belief system of trees. That'll be out in Gingerbread Press for the holiday season 2028, the belief system of trees. And that is a pending title because it could use some tweaking. But it's to say that when trees, when the trees, when the holiday time comes and it's time, the trees have adjusted. So they're like, it is not like in the movies uh, that have never been made about trees and how, what it's like to be going from a tree just in a Christmas tree farm or a forest. Uh, you know, now, now if you take a wild tree, that's a whole different story. But these are trees that, uh, they're prepared for their fate and they've like, uh, you know, they've created a system of, uh, you know, anticipation so that when it time comes time to get cut down, we'll just, we'll just put it out there. Uh, for the majority of trees, it is not pain, like it's not painful or traumatic. It's, it's a time for celebration. Uh, you know, like it, at least initially, because that's the only thing, the downside of cognitive dissonance is it's not a, you know, you kind of kind of got to re-up or rejuice it. And there was this particular tree named Daryl. That was the tree. This is uh, the spoiler. That's the tree that took a walk. The Christmas tree that took a walk was named Daryl. And Daryl, like a lot of the other trees, had something going with said, I can't wait to get to, get to Christmas, the Christmas that I get chosen, you know, and that it's a big deal. And Daryl came. Now, Daryl was on a tree farm where it wasn't cut your own. Uh, so, you know, Daryl got cut and all the other trees got put in a truck and they were chit chit chattering, chitter chattering, oh boy, truck into the big city. And it was, it was a beautiful time. Like uh, it was dusk and the snow was falling and Daryl couldn't believe Daryl's like, this is the year I finally got a uh, chosen and here I go. And, uh, like, uh, I don't know what the trees told themselves. They could have known about Christmas. I don't know how that would have got back to the Christmas tree farm, though, unless they speak human languages. But, uh, you know, so maybe they thought they were going somewhere else, like Aruba or something, or wherever a tree would want to go. I don't know. I guess that would be hard because trees don't reproduce like you, you know, so it's not going for some place where it could practice re reproductive acts. So it's not that... Um, so I don't know what would, well, again, I, sh I guess I should have found out, but it would probably be boring. It'd be like, uh, you know, I think maybe love and connection. I don't know. This is just speculation. Let's just say that because it's easy for us to relate to, uh, that Daryl finally said, whoa, I'm chosen. And then if I, I guess this makes sense a little bit like the old, I guess this is a little tropey, but true, you know, like a pet in a pet, pet, pet store, a pound puppy. Like when a pound puppy, not the store-bought ones, but actual, like, says, you're the one for me, pound puppy. But Daryl was waiting, and Daryl then Daryl arrived in this Christmas tree lot. And this was a good one. It had candy cane-colored Christmas, you know, like they took the time to paint the wood that was holding the trees up. And they had music, and they had lights, and... uh you know, they had the different types of trees, which I'm not familiar. You know, you got your, like, the, I guess there's two. Is, there, is blue spruce one of the Christmas trees that you buy or not? I ask that every year. Uh, but, all, you know, Daryl couldn't believe Daryl's like. And Daryl was in, like, in that perfect range, like the six to seven footers or whatever. I don't know. Is that the perfect range for a tree? And Daryl had great, you know, even when Daryl was plucked, they said, wow, look at this, like, a." Uh, Look at the balance of these branches on this tree. You know, Daryl's uh, thistles or whatever they're called quivered with delight. And then a family came, a family with uh, six kids. They came to the lot, uh, a father, a mother, an old, oldest boy named Andy who was a giant, you know, and the kids ran through the lot and started hiding from their parents and one another, arguing, you know, and then they got to Daryl. Finally, the parents were able to find most of the children. Uh, little Sheila, they they find a little Sheila they couldn't find, but she was at she was getting hot cocoa from somebody, 
But they, 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 the boys, you know, led by a little Andy, said, well, we need a bigger tree than this, 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 this tree. You know, they were at the sixth, and they said, no, no, no. And our ceiling scanner, you know, what are you talking about? I said, yeah, just like we need a giant tree, giant tree, uh, more room for presence. And then the parents said, you know, no, no, this is the height of the tree. We need six to seven feet or whatever it is. I don't know. And Daryl couldn't, you know, Daryl, like, uh, and we've all had that feeling in our, somewhere on the, like, a diaphragm of our stomach where you're just, you're trembling, you're shooting with delighted, delighted anticipatory joy uh, that this is going to be, this is it, uh, like, uh, like, uh, this is it. And then the family said that we'll take this tree right here. And the year was like 1980-something, and uh, Daryl was, you know, d- d- plucked up, and uh, I don't know what a Christmas tree c- cost back then. Let's say $40, and they gave the person 50 And then Daryl was tied to the top of a station wagon with a fake wood side. I think it's a Chevy station wagon, if I could picture it. Maybe a Chevy Caprice uh, station wagon. And all the, the noise was going, but it was also school night, so they had to get home. And then the kids, led by Andy, decided to, to try to, because Sheila had gotten a hot cocoa, because she had ran into her friend Vanessa and her family, and they bought her cocoa. And Andy was incredibly jealous, so then the Andy tried, tried to talk his parents into stopping at the BK. Or in Mickey D's to get hot cocoa. And Andy was all the way in the way back. Poor little Ted was in the middle of the front seats. Uh, I don't know who was stuck next to Andy, but, I, you know, whoever, maybe little Ted was stuck next to Andy and little Kenneth, baby Kenneth was in front. Uh, but it does, doesn't matter because then Andy started saying, uh, you know, he tried to figure out a chant and then he said, you know, and Andy, and Andy was always a little bit up, so he started saying R H O A, and then clapping, and then finally his siblings fell in with him. And then Ted said, "What does R H O A stand for?" And little Andy had seen uh, the the Christmas. I think he he was confused about all. He had never had Ovaltine. Uh, he said it stands for rights for hot Ovaltine. Uh, for Andy and, and all of you, R H O A, and then they said, "What's old?" And he said, "Will they have Ovaltine in a Christmas story?" I think it's like hot cocoa. So, but they just want hot cocoa. And then, you know, the poor parents of these kids, six six kids, so the oldest being Andy. Oh. And it was a school night again, and most of these kids, it's led by Andy, you know, faked brushing their teeth. I don't know why, what what made Andy stop brushing his teeth, uh, uh, but he did. I don't, still don't know to this day. But somehow, you know, they relented and they stopped for hot cocoa, which took forever because the hot cocoa was so hot at these restaurants, you know. Uh, but, you know, we, there was a brief moment uh, when the kids, before, actually, before the kids, this was the 80s, started throwing the BK, uh, what do you call those, ashtrays at each other, like uh, Frisbee stars of doom. And then little Ted did get ashes in his, you know, not cold ones, ice cold ones, you know, and then the hot cocoa got dropped and then... Uh, it, it, no one got any. It, it just splashed on little Kenneth's uh, powder blue with a rainbow stripe across the chest, uh, like one piece uh, snowmobile suit. Uh, it, it's, you know, the hot chocolate kind of stained that uh, snowmobile suit of Ken, little Kenny's. Uh, but meanwhile, while this was going on, a snowstorm had befallen Syracuse, New York. Uh, combination of lake effect and the jet stream wind chill but it was a sudden one some would say magical storm and it settled on the city and and for these kids it was really a dream come true because this was like school night one uh, and uh, like uh, school was immediately canceled the only time in history it's happened 
two, they got stuck because there was a snowdrift action in the Burger King. And they were the only customers uh, except for a couple, you know, mall walkers that were, you know, already asleep at their tables. And so, uh, you know, they, 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 but that's another story. Now outside at the station wagon, old Daryl, you know, Daryl didn't know how, like Daryl could sense that Daryl's new family wasn't there. And then Daryl felt the car start to rumble and wondered, is this the earthquake? And then Daryl tried to self-soothe by saying, R-H-O-A, uh, R-H-O-A. And Daryl thought, you know, that, uh, like, Daryl wondered if this was part of the, like, Daryl didn't know what to think. And luckily Daryl didn't get cold, but if Daryl could, it would. And soon Daryl's binds, you know, the wind got so strong that the, Daryl started ch 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 shaking. And uh, and soon the, 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 the cheap uh, dime store twine that was holding Daryl on the roof was broken. And I think this was Onondaga Boulevard, I believe, was the road. But I'm not sure because even though I lived there, I can't even remember. But uh, Daryl was swept up in a swirling, swirling wind. Uh, up high, and Daryl flew by the BK, flew by Wegmans, and I think it was uh, Faze, a new place called Married to Med. I think it was a, like a med new Mediterranean restaurant they were attempting to make uh, out of the old Ponderosa restaurant, and then it flew by over Lorenzo's and Bryce Chopper. Overburn Dairy, Daryl flew into Dar to, to Daryl. You know, Daryl just assumed this was all part of the wonder of being a Christmas tree. Uh, but it was also exciting. And then Daryl was up in the sky seeing the lights of Syracuse. And this is beautiful stuff now. We're talking about a city, twinkling city lights with the holiday lights. And some houses, you know, this was early in the season. Uh, masked by uh, snow flurries and snow blowing. And if you have the distance in the, you know, the, the fact that you're a tree, that you don't see, you don't have a nerve ending. So you say, well, this is great. I'm spinning around in the wind. And Daryl almost thought Daryl could hear the laughters of the kids in Burger King, but they're actually crying from sugar crashes from too much, uh, uh, the uh, hot cocoa that they're finally able to drink because they put uh, tons of that whipped cream on there. You know, the kids would sleep on the floor of that Burger King with their heads on, you know, with, with pillowy sesame seed buns. Uh, but Daryl swept higher and higher above Burn Dairy, watching the yin and the yang type sign of Burn Dairy spin. Up above whatever side, like whatever side, the west side, I guess, uh, up against uh, above Burnett Park, uh, Daryl flew higher and higher and spinning and spinning. Strange, you know, strange because the jet stream was hitting the lake effect where, you know, I think it's because of the temperature of the lake and moisture and stuff uh, deep in the snow belt. Uh, Daryl flew, and then the wind stopped, and Daryl started to descend. And Daryl thought to Daryl self, okay, this, this can't be right. The, the proof that even holiday trees have uh, common sense, um, that Daryl heard the voice of the person at the lot say, oh, what a, what a span of, of whatever branches they said. And Daryl uh, inverted it, Daryl's self, and as the air, you know, the whatever drag, Daryl's descent was slowed and started a slow uh, helicopter-like spin. And Daryl crashed into 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 to the, the part of the Burnett Park that uh, no one had been in a long time back here, like uh, with, there's these trails of this old uh, city park with old rock walls that one time had water features that have long since dried up, or so they said. But Daryl hit one of those water features. Now, luckily, with the uh, 
face of Daryl's tree. And so Daryl was uninjured. But there must have been some magic in that old rock wall in the old water feature. Because uh, Daryl actually knocked some of this this old water feature. Like they said it was broken, but it was really just malfunctioning. And the water sprayed out just for a split second, obviously, because it was so cold. And then the water started to freeze. Uh, but as they said, there must have been some magic in the, this, this water that Daryl ran into. Because uh, the way the water sprayed out, it sprayed across the, the, I guess it's the shaft. It sounds so racy, but it is true. And gave Daryl two legs, and it was magical. And so Daryl, who was already sentient, which you know some people may have a problem with sentient trees, but I don't. I do not. I know of a few. Barky, or the tree god, tree beard, like a tree. I don't even know what tree beard. Tree beard's a wise tree. An ant, some would say. And we've got Groot. So there's a history of sentient trees. Daryl was not the first nor the last. Uh, but Daryl, like, uh, was also, once this extra level of sentient came, because Daryl now had legs, Daryl realized uh, that Daryl was cold. And uh, there was an oak that Daryl saw that, that it had a den in it, and, 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 and like, a uh, that looked like it like was carved out in the thing, and Daryl went into the den and went inside the oak and, and settled there for and waited out the storm. And Daryl slept for a while, you know, slept there in the, the heart of this oak tree. And oak tree, the strangest thing, I don't know if there was a language barrier, but they didn't communicate, but Daryl stayed there and stayed warm. And the sun rose, and Daryl slept. They think also, like, the, it was Daryl's legs adjusted, ice legs, magical ice legs, is if you want to be factual about it. And then night fell again, and then Daryl awoke, and Daryl set out, stood up, and stepped out of the tree. And said, she said, I don't even know where I am, but I know... Uh, I'm not supposed to be just sitting around here. I got to go find my family. And uh, they remember they were at a BK, not, really not that far, but for Daryl, all Daryl knew was thousands of millions of miles when really it was like about uh, like five, eh, 2,000 feet maybe. I don't know. I'm not good at distance. But Daryl just happened to set out in the right direction, and Daryl walked to the end of the trail and ran into a street. And then Daryl took a left. And it was, again, another cold, uh, stormy night. Not as stormy as the night before. And it was late at night, midnight, one in the morning. So cold, so cold. But Daryl was rested and determined to find the the family that Daryl had lost and, you know, save their Christmas, one would say. And then Daryl, like, spotted the uh, sign from the burned dairy, and Daryl's mind started. And then Daryl saw the price chopper sign and said, wait a second. Uh, and I think there was a place called the West Side Inn or something. I don't know. The Westwood Inn, there was that one and another place. And Daryl said, I think I flew over those things. One smart tree, if you ask me, the Daryl. And Daryl put one icy foot in front of another. Now, there was this was not an easy trek, as you might think. Daryl had to make it through snow banks and snow drifts and slush. Uh, just to, 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 this is Daryl's first full day with legs. Uh, look who they were magic. So I think they kind of, you know, had some self balancing going on. And then Daryl had to navigate the streets. Now, the streets were more or less empty. The only people on the streets should have been driving, probably. Little Andy might have been in one of those cars. And the cars would do the things, like those of you that have seen. This is when this was thick, thick, heavy lake effects coming down now. And the roads hadn't been plowed uh, since the day before. Uh, you know, they, they said, let's just wait this one out. Or maybe they had been plowed, and, they, and I don't know. So cars were, 
we're going slow anyway, and they had that slush and heavy snow on them dropping chunks off. And Daryl headed towards the neon signs of grocery stores and bars and grocery stores and uh, drug stores. And then Daryl saw a sign that Daryl had seen before, before, but it was blocking. Daryl just happened to be in this corner where Daryl didn't have a view of the Burger King because blocking the view of the Burger King was the sign for the two-screen movie theater. Uh, Genesee, I think the Genesee Cinemas, maybe. And but Daryl, something in Daryl's mind said, head towards that sign. In the two movies that were shown, I never even heard of. One was called Ninety Day Finance, and the other one was called uh, Bud Black. And uh, I think that was, I think that was an ad for some sort of new Budweiser that they were trying out. Uh, this might have been before Dry. But Daryl headed towards that sign, or maybe it was a movie. Maybe that was like the Spuds McKenzie movie, but that was a different. But, uh, and as Daryl got close, Daryl, you know, did the signs of the movie theater, the blinking lights, the spinning lights, uh, the, the, you know, the, the smell of popcorn lured Daryl towards a movie theater that wouldn't, you know, those days were numbered just like a Christmas tree's days were numbered, you know. Uh, well, maybe not exactly like that. Uh, but Daryl headed towards the theater, trekking through the snow. And somehow the theater, if you, you, some would say, uh, you know, by some sort of uh, a miracle, it stayed open uh, to show films, you know, despite the nasty weather for people that didn't have cable television. Uh, the theater had stayed open also to host, uh, I mean, because it was in the middle of the night, obviously, to host uh, everybody that had eaten all the stuff at Burger King and then the other places. And actually, the people in the movie theater were begging, especially this one particular family, but other groups would just go, well, can't you just walk to your house during the day? But this was a different time. This was the 80s when people were... Uh, I guess they, I guess they were the same as they were today. They'd be there's more movie theaters. So then the movie theater said, "Well, we could probably recoup this cost from the city or something." And plus, people would way preferred sleeping in a movie theater uh, to, uh, you know, the floor of Burger King. And uh, so, so the, there was families there, like uh, storm refugees, I guess you'd call it. But Daryl didn't know any of this. Daryl only knew that something was calling Daryl towards the theater. He didn't know if it was a Bud, but what's a Bud Black? You know, that's probably what Daryl was thinking. Uh, but right as Daryl like was about to to mount the steps up to the theater, uh, Daryl heard the uh, old H thing. And Daryl turned to the right and saw the Burger King drive through had been, you know, and then outside of the back of Burger King, somebody was giving Daryl the old head tilt, hey, come on in here. And then Daryl headed over and this uh, person was standing outside the back of this Burger King. He said, hey, what are you, a tree? And Daryl, you know, Daryl doesn't have vocal cords, so Daryl just nodded. And I said, you want to buy some lights cheap? You want to get some lights cheap or what? And Daryl did a shrugging of Daryl's, you know, tree shoulders motion. And, you know, I guess this is possible. Like, the guy said, well, my name's Melvin Gordon. Uh, how you doing? And Daryl, I don't know how Daryl acquired some of these skills, but Daryl reached out a branch to shake Melvin Gordon's hand. And they went into the Burger King, which was now empty. And this particular Burger King it had one of these signs, uh, the kind of signs you see a lot of things, a red a, a dotted sign that usually uh, has a crawl that says, hey, this is what the lotto is. Now, at this particular moment in history, this sign was the cat's pajamas. I don't know if that's a thing, but of, of electronics. You know, that said, hey, buy a Whopper, get another Whopper, whatever. You know, get double cheese on this thing. 
F the McDLT. That's what it probably said. And I don't know if this was a spirit of Christmas goodness, but like that was also taking stuff from the Burger King, this Melvin person, but uh, they ripped the sign off of the Burger King, uh, you know, signs. Also put the Burger King crown on Daryl, and the sign just shoved it in the middle of Daryl's trees. And the cord was hanging, and then it just touched Daryl's leg and fused with Daryl's legs, and the magic of Christmas powered up the sign. And the words that crawled across were, Thank you. And then Daryl walked out of the store and uh, he started to, you know, head back towards the steps up to the movie theater. Uh, but then there, something else has struck Daryl. Daryl's a smart tree. He said, check the parking lot, Daryl, of the Burger King. And uh, Daryl headed back to the front of the Burger King. Uh, we're not long before they had expanded with the sol solarium room, which was just like a, like a, whatever you call that, like a, what do you call that place where you grow plants type front on the Burger King greenhouse, I think they call that. But Daryl saw that the station wagon was not in uh, the parking lot of the Burger King. But Daryl saw the tracks, and he saw the tracks headed towards the movie theater. And so Daryl followed those tracks. But then Daryl saw the tracks again, went off, and went into the street. And Daryl wondered, should I uh, follow? the? And then Daryl said, oh, my sign. So Daryl climbed up the steps, and there was a young man uh, uh, sleeping at the popcorn thing. And Daryl uh, tried to... Like, Daryl was unable to open the door, and then finally Daryl was able to bang and wake the kid up, and then the kid saw a Christmas tree with a sign, you know, whatever you call that, a light-up crawl sign, uh, LED. I think these were the original LEDs uh, back when they, you know, were cutting edge. You could, you, you could buy them at Radio Shack, though. Uh, but who knows what the poor owner of this Burger King paid for this sign, but the kid looked at Daryl. And then Daryl said, have you seen a family with a station wagon? And the kid laughed. And, and then Daryl said, a family, six kids, one oldest kid, really mean look on his face all the time, bowl cut, and elastic waistband pants, uh, suede shoes with velvet. And then the kid nodded and laughed, and he said, he pointed, they were gone. And so Daryl set off, uh, you know, in pursuit of the family, following their tracks. You know, I'm the case, just like FBI Director Comey, you know, like, uh, you, know, track, you know, tracking it all down. Or maybe not like that, but it, whatever that was on the trend. So, yeah, Daryl uh, said, you know, it's a step after step, and, and this was how smart Daryl was. Daryl quickly learned how to scroll things across Daryl's sign and see the sign would light up the snow and learned the pattern of the tires of the car, radial snow tires. So Daryl took a right out into Onondaga Boulevard, a four-lane road, and took, took a right out of the movie theater parking lot and followed it about 200 feet to a mobile station where the car had gone in and obviously either got gas or tried, probably not, though, probably just tried to get the, some of the slush off the car so that the car could handle Velasco, a hill uh, that usually is pretty well plowed. And in this case, you know, underneath the uh, the snow was some good uh, salt, and this was it, the lake effect had uh, a density and a wetness to it that you could actually get some traction and so after the family had pulled out of the mobile and gone right up Velasco, Daryl started his trek up the hill, one foot in front of its other. Now you might be asking what kind of, I mean, at this point you probably already have it in your mind, but uh, what kind of feet does a Christmas tree have when they're magical Christmas tree feet? And I would say that they're a bit like chicken feet, three toes and then one toe in the back, but bigger and denser than chicken feet because it's got to support a tree. 
but definitely spread out, you know, like so d- d- easier for Daryl to kick a lot like chicken feet. Makes it easy, like with even with toes, like uh, what do you call them? Claw, like almost claws. So Daryl trekked up this hill, Velasco Road. Only one car passed it. And it was some, somebody, you know, that had already seen enough strange things in their life not to stop at a tree trekking up Velasco Road. And then the wind really started to pick up again. Daryl realized that Daryl would have to pick up the pace because the, the, the track of the car was slowly getting filled in. But Daryl got up to the first intersection and saw that the car had turned right. And he said, what is the name of that road? I don't know, Onondaga, but not Onondaga Boulevard. Maybe it's called Bellevue, but I'm not positive. I think Bellevue Ave, and Daryl took a right on Bellevue Ave, maybe. I hope that's, I don't know if that's the name of that one. But that's where Daryl turned, maybe, or maybe that was, maybe Bellevue's way up. Uh, anyway, Daryl took a, the first right and tracked, and, you know, Daryl hadn't walked a lot, so Daryl tried to pick up its pace, but this was a longer road, and, uh, uh, like uh, this, at some point, I think it intersected with Glenwood, and that's when the, the snow got so bad that the, the Daryl lost the path, and then Daryl ended up wandering through the woods, and then Daryl wandered onto a golf course, and, and this is a long part, so I won't you know make you endure it, but Daryl wandered for night, you know, this golf course was you know it's eighteen holes. And then Daryl walked back and forth, and this was a hilly golf course, and Daryl started to lose hope and fell into a sand trap and cried, like, you know, at least mentally cried. It curled up against the side of the sand trap to stay warm. And then Daryl, you know, the next day, the sun woke Daryl, and Daryl said, come on, Daryl, let's do this one for Christmas. And then Daryl picked his spirits back up and headed a walk to the top of the golf course, uh, to the tree line, top of the hill, and Daryl could see back down to the movie theater and the Burger King and the the other stores. And then Daryl just uh, took a right because he knew that to its left lay Velasco Road. And Daryl had it, and said, Daryl said, well, I'll just go, and t- you know, I'm going to go until I go no more. Uh, but Daryl still tracked, you know, even though the sign. And then Daryl heard the, the sounds of children. And Daryl said, my ears must be deceiving me. But they weren't because soon Daryl went up a hill and, uh, like, uh, as, crest, as Daryl crested the hill, saw kids sliding down the 18th hole of this golf course. It was majestic, majestic hill for sledding with so many different unbelievable options you know because i think in golf they have like three different tees and the one tee is up high so you so many options for unbelievably steep hill great sledding there were jumps there were kids laughing and daryl saw a patch of orange hair on one boy and then he saw a boy with it despite his hat he could see the bowl cut and the boy's thin thin hair and grouchy face and the kids running around and kids going off jumps and wiping out and arguing and a harried looking uh, father watching on. And then the father looked in and made eye contact with Daryl and Daryl uh, sang, said, hello, I'm your Christmas tree. And the father first fell to one knee in shock. And then called the kids, 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 holy cow, look at it, it's a, a tree. And the tree said, hello, kids, I'm Daryl, your tree. And everyone started jumping for joy. And uh, like a feigning fact, the, kid, the kids that were just roughhousing earlier were hugging each other. You know, holding hands and jumping in a circle, giggling, and soon they were circling Daryl. The father was hugging Daryl. Uh, Daryl signed and then introduced the kids, Andy, Sheila, Ted, Carl, Daniel, Kenneth, 
can you know can and Kate and then like I said they, everyone no one could believe that they had a like a living a tree that was once living that had you know uh, but Daryl also told them you know my you know this is, this is my season and then they took Daryl in the house and, you know just like a lot of Christmas sacrifices Daryl's legs you know were made of ice. So then that stopped working, and then, you know, they plugged in Daryl's sign, and for a while Daryl could communicate, but soon they decorated Daryl. And Daryl couldn't believe, like, uh, like you know, then, then the you know, the Christmas joys went on for Daryl. You know, there was a train with scented smoke. Uh, there was small, there was even bubble lights at one point, and... Uh, and, you know, the little blinking lights and the big bulb lights and different, you know, themed Christmas ornaments and kids pretending ornaments were like, you know, throwing them and, you know, breaking them too. But Daryl couldn't believe uh, that this is what Christmas was for a tree. Now, you know, to Daryl, this was the normal Christmas for a tree because nothing out of the ordinary had happened. So to Daryl, like the fact that Daryl grew legs and went for a walk and picked up a sign and had to struggle to get to this house. Uh, and the kids, they would lie under Daryl and laugh hysterically. And then Daryl was there for Christmas, you know, and I don't know if that was the year of the gerbils or not. And then Daryl was able to teach, you know, the kids. I don't know if the kids, you know, the life lesson, the trees don't last forever. Well, is Daryl, you know, Daryl's my, you know, is Daryl, you know, the circle of life took Daryl. Daryl would never forget uh, what an unexpected, like, joy. It was so much different than what Daryl had anticipated, which I don't even know what that was, but it wasn't that. Uh, even if it had anticipated a normal Christmas, this was, uh, this was much, 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 much different. It was, you know, the, and this was, you know, it was all because Daryl didn't give up. Daryl walked because uh, it's a tree that took a walk. So, you know, that uh, that's a pretty special story for Daryl. Uh, and you shouldn't tell other Christmas trees about it because you don't want to set their expectations. But Christmas trees don't quit. I'll tell you that much, ladies and gentlemen. If there's one thing I've learned... You know, Christmas trees, they get caught up in a windstorm and then, you know, magically get ice legs. They don't quit. And I'm glad Daryl didn't quit on uh, Daryl's, you know, whatever whatever it was. Uh, so, uh, mer mer Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, whatever you celebrate. You know, maybe there's a lesson there. You know, maybe you don't need magical ice legs to keep going one step at a time, uh, you know, slowly and deliberately through this season. So just stay calm like Daryl, just put one foot in front of the other. Even if you're, you feel like, you know, sometimes the holidays are giant snow banks and, you know, a tundra-like golf course of uh, feelings or whatever it is, and you want to curl up in a, a sand trap. Uh, you know, you can, you, Daryl, Dan, you know, and maybe just picture Daryl sign saying, Happy Holidays. Daryl loves you. And Christmas trees don't quit. Uh, I mean, in this story. So, good night. So, if you're new here, welcome. This is a different episode. Not all our episodes are filmed, on, uh, recorded on location. And you may, may have, I have to get straight into the episode because I'm so distracted. Uh, but yeah, I'm your, I'm your boyfriend. I want to, you kick back if you're new here. Listen, and I'm just going to describe what I see from my room. You know, take some meanders, ponder some thoughts. Probably do two different segments. One, it's uh, about dinner time here. And I'll explain where I am and why I'm here. And then uh, maybe tomorrow, oh, Megabus is going by. I saw it on the other side of the freeway. Now it's going by. One dollar. The blue Megabus. See, I'm already distracted. I wonder if it's going right or straight. We will see here. I don't see the Megabus. It's behind the building. Maybe a red light waiting for the Megabus. Could have gone left. And uh, there's a building my way, so I can't see the intersection. 
I can only see after the intersection. Still no sign of the megabus. Uh, waiting for the megabus here. But yeah, if you're hearing any noises, uh, f- uh, f- five freeways. Uh, yeah, dude, but about uh, I don't know how far that is. Don't still don't see the me- don't worry if I if the megabus should have gone through, so it probably went left or I'd missed it somehow. It could have made a hard right in this part, uh, right on the right where I can't see. But yeah, you can hear the sounds of the five freeway. It is. Uh, it is about uh, 5, uh, 30, it's 5.37 p.m., and I'm here in Burbank, California, um, uh, like uh, like uh, Los Angeles area. Uh, tonight, I'll, I'll be, by the time you hear this, I would have been a guest on Dan Harmon's uh, Harmon Town, so I hope that went good. I hope I was a good guest. But yeah, I'm staying here in the, uh, in the Burbank Holiday Inn, and I happen to get a room... I, I, I got really nervous, and I said, you know, like, I kept calling. I said, I got to get into the room early to record a show. And now it's 5 p.m., and I'm just getting to recording the show. Uh, but I'm here at Burbank. The sun is uh, is uh, slowly headed down. It's behind some clouds. Soon it'll be behind the other building for the Holiday Inn. But I happen to get this room with this great view. I said, what am I going to do an episode about... Uh, Will I be able to do an episode while I'm in Burbank or will I, you know, because I don't like falling behind on shows. I want to have, you know, shows ready to go. But then when I, you know, go places, they say, well, let me do something a little different. So just in case anybody, I'm not sure of the date, October something, 24th or 23rd, if you were on the five headed north, pretty well, pretty much any time, there's a, I'm watching the actual freeway back up, uh, Looks like they're expanding the freeway here, the 5. And you can actually see like at, at where the expansion is. It must at some point reduce in lanes, so traffic is at a crawl. And right when it gets to me, I, I wish I had a jet, like I wish I had an ability to fly because I could fly down and wave at everybody. Because where I can see the freeway directly across from where I'm looking is where traffic finally speeds up. And if anyone's wondering, it's in LA. It's right by the new IKEA. I walked by there earlier. It hasn't opened yet. I was tempted to try to sneak in because that would have been awesome and just wonder that would have been an episode, but then I would have probably gotten in trouble. But yeah, I have a view of what I believe is uh, like Griffith Park and all that, uh, where the backside, I don't see the Hollywood sign, but uh, the hills above Los Angeles, I don't know. I'm not good at landmarks and I don't pull out a map. Uh, L.A. Zoo should be somewhere there. Johnny Carson Park, I think. I saw that on Google Maps. I don't know. Like, I think uh, a couple of cemeteries that I can see directly across from me. Radio Tower. Uh, beautiful stuff. You know, in, in a normal human would probably not be in their hotel room. Uh, but as I said, we call my was the Megabus. Like, right when I started, re- oh, here goes a train. It's the Metro Line. Oh, and you can just hear it. How lovely. Metro Link. I think there's a train station and a bus station. Uh, I can see the bus depot. That's actually a station. Uh, there's like four buses parked there that I can see. Uh, it makes sense that Burbank would have uh, its own station, right? Um, and also what caught my eye first, and, and actually we, we, we lost a car, is the uh, right across from the freeway from my hotel is the uh, Hollywood Piano. And they're having a piano sale in case you're in the market for a piano. Now it's Sunday late afternoon, so uh, I don't know if there's a lot of I don't know what the, what their hours were, but there was a car, and the, there's, there's still one car left in the parking lot. So someone who, someone is working at Hollywood Piano. There was another vehicle in the parking lot before that. Uh, but, and I won't describe it, just you know, just in case somebody was supposed to, you know. But uh, And if there's other workers that are supposed to be there, there's a couple trucks. I don't know if those are piano delivery trucks. They look like uh, ice cream, tr- uh, like frozen food delivery trucks. Uh, oh, a food truck just went by on the highway. Um, I wonder if anybody's looking into my room from the other room. I think the sun's reflecting off my windows, hopefully, because uh, hopefully there won't be anybody, you know, coming to get me in trouble. 
But yeah, the freeway's still backed up. Everyone's little lights are on, which is nice. Oh, food truck drove by. Did I say that? There goes a... There's a lot of, like, uh, here comes a bus. And uh, let's see. So, so so let's start with the Hollywood piano and work our way. That's in the center of my viewing. And as I described, that's par- it's parking lot. Um, you know, wow, that's riveting, riveting, riveting stuff. I'm tempted to stand up, but I don't want to, re- re- you know, to do to, to to shuffle too soon. Uh, it's pretty boring, even for for a sleep podcast. So I'm definitely gonna have to work it here because behind uh, Hollywood Piano is the most descriptive, nondescript building. Uh, there's actually all the buildings behind Hollywood Piano. Talk about unlucky. One, two, three, four. Five and then a giant sixth, uh, not all nondescript buildings, nothing, not even even the uh, graffiti has been painted over recently. Uh, right at the Alameda Ave uh, exit, that's pretty funny. I think that's what that says. My eyes aren't perfect. Uh, on the local street, another orange bus going by, too far away for me to read its advertisements. But yeah, like, uh, to, who would think that I would get get uh, six nondescript buildings, uh, four in white, one in beige, and one in gray? You know, lots of uh, air conditioning units on the roof. So that's the next layer behind Hollywood Piano. The layer after that is uh, continuing the the theme of nondescript, uh, describing nondescript buildings. Sleep with me. The podcast, uh, you know, Makes you uh, wish you, uh, it puts you to sleep, you know, this is nice. Can you hear the freeway? That's the sounds of the cars uh, driving on by. Uh, Yeah. But yeah, getting closer and then I'm getting closer to the window, like that's going to help me describe things. But oh wow, there's a beautiful tree. So after the uh, nondescript buildings is another round of buildings that are nondescript, but their views being blocked by the nondescript buildings. Then after that is an angle, a street running at an angle instead of, uh, you know, uh, grids. And there seems to be some sort of municipal uh, lots. I see what look to be garbage trucks or street cleaning trucks. I see some utility or tree trimming trucks, some shuttle buses, uh, someone taking a bribe. No, no, no one's taking, no city employees or county employees are taking bribes. But that I can see, that was a bad joke. Uh, you know, uh, just trying to think of something funny to say. But yeah, like what you would call a yard, uh, uh, like a, whatever they say, hey, go take this. Uh, down and get it washed at uh, Johnson's Johnson's yard or something. It, why you know where they park trucks and stuff. Uh, another thing that come out is another uh, hotel. They see two people walking to their car. Uh, one and a man in a maroon shirt and blue shorts. And this is a uh, another grand hotel. It has uh, some cool lights on the side of it. It's got some green lights. And the palm trees looks to be a pretty new hotel, smaller one, one you'd stay at long. Actually, I think I almost booked a room there, but I got a great deal here. And then how lucky did I get? I got to check in early so I could procrastinate. Took a nap actually too. Wow, been a few months since I've taken a nap. That was am- holy, holy moly! The sun is amazing. It's behind the other. Uh, Holiday Inn building, but its rays are shooting up to a cloud, and they're separating into the you know heavens or you know the sky, like where you can actually see rays, uh, sun rays, and you really can't beat that. It looks gr- holy mackerel. You get this one massive cra- cloud, and I have a bird flapping, flapping, flapping in front of the cloud. It's got to be miles away. I mean, maybe not. Maybe you just say it's impossible, Scoots. But man, look at the, the sky is a glow. I'm aghast, and the sky is a glow. And you know, the, we got the nice puffy clouds, and we also have the nice wispy clouds. Now, if you want a weather report to my left, though, it looks like it's going to rain. Uh, I'm leaning forward. I'm sitting in the uh, desk. You just just to, to set the mood here. 
am right up against the window. I'm sitting in the uh, hotel room, all desk, chair, as close as I can get, just so you know, you get all those juicy, juicy uh, freeway sounds. And this, I guess, is meta because I, I was sleeping, and I really found it comforting. Like I was having trouble. I really needed a nap because I was stressed and tired because I didn't sleep good last night. And and so I said, okay, come on, let's 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 get a nap on. And then I was having trouble sl- falling asleep. But I, so I was like, well, maybe I'll just lie here and rest. But I'd really love it if I could fall asleep. And then I drifted into the old sleep with me zone, and I started hearing. Uh, I heard trains. I heard, you know, siren V. Oh, we got something. We have a woman in the parking lot of the hotel down there with a one of the brightest caps I've ever seen in my life, a neon peach. A neon, I don't know if it's quite pink. It's a neon coral. Wow, is that a bright hat. Um, and then she has a nice pink jacket in under her arm. And they just got out of an SUV, Uber, probably Uber SUV. Very, very brightest cap I've ever seen at a distance. If she was Waldo, she'd be found. And I mean, we're talking pretty far away from me. Uh, check uh, uh, update at the bus depot. We have three buses still there. No, listen to that sound. I think that's a motorcycle. I'm not sure if you could hear that, but that was a nice little mo. Ooh, very blue car. You know, the, to change subjects yet again, there's a Tesla dealership. I walked by there. I thought about lying on the ho- the hood of uh, uh, one of the Teslas and taking some selfies, but then I figured that would be. I wondered. I said, "Do do you think people that work at Tesla dealerships can run faster than people that work at regular car dealerships?" You know, because I was trying to picture them chasing me down the street. Okay, so back where were we? We we were at the yard. And as we move beyond the yard, we see some like like uh, lower slowing apartment buildings, like I've lived in, you know, two or three story apartment buildings, interspersed with you know more nondescript nondescript buildings. I, I wish I had like an assistant I could look up rent prices. I was wondering. I said, "Well, what's the rent like in Burbank?" Uh, uh, you know, because a lot of Bay Area people are fleeing to Los Angeles. Uh, because for for people my age, uh, the idea of home home ownership has become, uh, you know, fantasy. That really, you, you know, so it's like, oh, well, if you want to buy a house, you know, Los Angeles is a little bit more affordable. And, and I mean, for for all things, and, and it's it's beautiful. What a beautiful day it is here to be in my hotel room. Actually, the um, a couple other big good pieces of news for this. Uh, Holiday Inn, it, just in case you're a fan, it has a windsock on the roof of the other one. And not just one, but one, two, three, four, five wind uh, gauge. So I don't know if they have something going with one of the local meteorologists. Uh, but uh, it also has the lights because we're close to the Burbank Airport. That's why I'm staying here because it's close to the Burbank Airport. And, you know, because... Uh, I don't know why else, because uh, I say, I, 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 it was like, I got to get from the hotel, uh, or get from the airport to the hotel, and then try to, uh, comp, bus uh, 3103 going by here, uh, just in case, uh, no ads on that bus that I can read, you know, check into the hotel, and then, you know, steal my nerves in, in, until I go on to Harmontown. Uh, you know, which, I don't know, I said, which is, uh, isn't there a poor part of me that's very excited to go on Harmontown? And the scared part of me said, well, I'm not going to give any other room, you know, I'm I'm too scared to uh, uh, to consider any other possibilities. Uh, so let's see, let's get back to Bur- back to Burbank, uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and friends beyond the binary, we're back in Burbank. Oh, yeah, I can see the entrance to the yard. It has a California state flag and a U.S. flag uh, flying full mast. And then we go to the apartment buildings. Then we get to another park. It looks like, or tre- like a tree line. There's a lot of trees. Burbank's got its share of trees. So, well, there's a loud, you know, uh, mufflerless vehicle uh, keeping the people of Burbank up if they were sleeping at 530 uh, but yeah, we, we, like I'm not sure if it's a park again. I wish this window had uh, 
like an overlay that I could tap on. But it looks like a maybe a, a Burbank City Park or something. I don't know if I'm looking towards Burbank or what. Let me grab a map and, and let me pause it, and then uh, you know that that'll be a little bit more. I mean, maybe we'll learn something. I'm I'm back here with the uh, you know map in hand. I uh, mean, you know, Google Map. Yeah, it looks like that park is George Ize, uh, Ize Park. Uh, I only have one hand. You know, I have one hand on the mic, so I can't uh, look up what uh, it's named after, but I'm sure uh, I'm sure it's something great. And then uh, we have the Forest Lawn and Mount Sinai, Hol- Hollywood Hills uh, cemeteries that I can see. I don't know if those are the famous ones or not, uh, you know, because I'm, 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 not, I'm not very useful with that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, you can see that. I guess the uh, right uh, uh, somewhere is Universal City, according to the map. Now, I don't know if that means Universal Studios or it just means Universal's offices. Uh, but you know, i got to tell you, i got to update you on this gorgeous, gorgeous sky now. And the beautiful, you know, one thing that Los Angeles just doesn't get credit for is uh, it's, it's it's a natural beauty. Uh, I mean, you have the, the park and I'm looking at, which, of course, I said, well, it's Griffith Park or something, which I think it is. Uh, yeah, looking at the map, it's it's Griffith Park. Uh, and the Greek theaters there, I used to have some good times there when I lived in L.A. And the Los Angeles Zoo and Botanical Gardens is not far. Hollywood sign. Uh, Gene Autry Museum of the West. I think there's some trains down there. Uh, but this sky, that's what, oh, the Los Angeles is natural beauty. Let me describe the sky to you first because you have all these beautiful mountains uh, encircling the, the city. Uh, or encircling the, the metropolitan area, maybe. Maybe that's a better way to screw it. But man, we've got a, uh, we've got some clouds that feature grays and purples. The sky still has some blue to it, but as you go lower, you're getting some orangish pink coloring. And then you know, there's actually I got to tell you, there's Purple Mountain. We're we're in the midst of Purple Mountain majesty here. Now, in in some sense, this is the fruited plains of uh, human creation and human beings doing stuff. And on the other side of the mountains is the uh, fruited plains of the uh, Central Valley. Uh, You know, I mean, not directly, uh, but, you know, we have, uh, yeah, we have Purple Mountain. I mean, I'm looking right now at Purple Mountain Majesty, uh, I guess to my northwest, I don't know. Is that Runyon Canyon? I don't know what I'm looking at, but uh, it looks it looks good. I tell you that much. I, I can tell you that for a fact. F A C T. And we're also getting the sun hitting some of these buildings in Universal City or whatever. And I see this one building that looks like it's close to Johnny Carson Park uh, on the map, and it is getting lit up just like that woman's hat. That same color, electric coral pink. Uh, lovely, lovely, lovely. I mean, unbelievable. Also have a water tower near that building. I don't know if that's on a lot of, uh, you know, but that was one of the things back when I was a kid and then, you know, for the decades before that, uh, you know, that was one sign, you know, you were making movies, you had a water tower. I don't know if there's a 99% invisible about that uh, or any other podcast. Like, why did... uh, like, was it, a, you know, was it just a thing? Was that like, I mean, I guess that would be a sign of power. Uh, like, well, I got extra water. You know, where you talk about landed gentry. It's like, not only do I got this land, I mean, I guess it's weird for a movie producing, but uh, you're like, yeah, we got all this water. We can make movies whenever the hell we want because we got plenty of water here, uh, you know, We'll say, how many gallons? I mean, the good thing about water, to, you know, the underrated thing about water towers is this water pressure. And I learned that from one of my jobs, you know, to say, okay, well, you know, the water, if you have to get on the sprinkler system or, you know, spray it by a hose, if the water's up high, it's going to have great pressure. So I guess that's something. Uh, but, yeah, I was talking about the beauty of uh, the, the hills around Los Angeles, the trees, 
you know, and it's just, it, it, it was really stressed coming down here. And I said, she's could, could I please, uh, is there, I wish I was a sane person and I wish I would be able to enjoy it. And I think I have found a little bit of enjoyment, uh, now, I mean, because the irony is I had to isolate myself, uh, I said, well, I, I, I mean, maybe my next trip down here, uh, hopefully I want to go on George's show, uh, would be the next time I come down here, but, um, a good friend, it's just someone just pulling into the Black Angus with their blinkers on, their, their hazard lights, let's watch this, sorry, I'm very sorry for the interruption, breaking news, silver car with its hazard lights on, tried to go into the Black Angus, now it's in the hotel parking lot, it's making an oval, tentatively moving, it does have a moonroof, it's a silver four-door vehicle, looks uh, newish, can't tell the make of the model, um, probably a Camry, or it could, but it could be a Mercedes, uh, you say holy moly, um, it's parking, it's not parking, it's sitting, yeah, this is pretty, this is good stuff here, let's see what it's doing, oh, there's a, uh, I think there's a, a motorcycle, or not a, like a dirt bike, or uh, something also in this hotel parking lot, but it's up on a kickstand, so it's wheels up. It looks like it's a, it looks like a leaping horse. The uh, car's still sitting there. Um, I mean, I guess this is like, wasn't there a Gene Hackman movie about this? Like he, he was recording stuff, or uh, and then uh, caused him a lot of trouble. Was that a Hitchcock, Hitchcock movie? Okay, Silver Car. I'm still monitoring. But speaking of weather reports, the. Uh, the weather from the south that I had to lean forward to see is now swept uh, so that 50% of my sky is cloudy. I don't see any rain yet, but what an effect. Holy, like, fish song, divided sky, the wind blows high. And because of the setting sun, it could be fog or it could be rain clouds, but they have, like, a, wow, they have this wispy purple, gray bruised color, the color of bruises uh, on the bottom of these clouds that it, but they seem like trans, they're almost a jellyfish a little bit, uh, nearly translucent. I'm not sure maybe that's the rain or the water content. It does look like it's raining uh, where the map says the Hollywood sign is. I guess those would be the, I don't know if those are the Hollywood Hills. I just know, you know, Holiday Inn, Hotel Motel, Holiday Inn is where I'm at. Uh, not a sponsor, but I don't have anything bad to say either. So don't, you know, don't, you know, don't contact your barristers. This is a free, oh, the silver car's moving. Maybe it was an Uber because it's now leaving the uh, parking lot, but I did miss any activity. Another bus going by, 4117. It does look like a can. No, I think that is a uh, Mercedes Benz. Uh, I mean, no, you know, K car designers. I can't tell the day, and it could be some other car too. Uh, and you know, I don't know if that's a big deal. You know, but if you, you know, if you're looking, just in case anybody's also wondering, the slowdown on the five continues. Now on the other side, I guess what would be five south. Uh, I'm presuming this is the five. I think I'm pretty sure it is, but. Uh, that's moving very well. Like if you're go if you were, you know, if if you needed to get somewhere uh between Hollywood piano and what I can see, uh now's the time to do it. Now the buses the lights on the bus depot on the buses are coming on, which is nice. Uh Black Angus uh, sign has been on all day and the blank Black Angus uh it looks like a decent amount of people are already at Blank Angus. I guess maybe watching football or eating steaks. Uh, makes me wonder. i got to figure out what I'm going to eat. Uh, let's see. I'm leaning forward and looking to my right. Just Oh, we see you can see some planes lined up for the Burbank Airport uh, in their landing patterns. It does seem to be like it's some sort of cogeneration plant, possibly across the freeway to the right. I don't know if that's a natural gas plant, uh, but I see you know, a little smokestack, and most of the building is blocked. But uh, uh, some sort of po I mean, a possible power plant, not positive on that. Uh, my cl the clouds are really moving now. Uh, I mean, you know, really slow, They're mo but they are moving. 
And I'm going to stand now. I don't know if I sound any different. Maybe I'm even closer to the window. And I'm looking north. Uh, and, you know, just looking at some of these local Burbank buildings. Uh, they're, they're uh, you know, they're, they're your typical uh, three or four story. They seem to be general office buildings. Uh, I don't know if they're mixed use commercial because I never knew what that meant. Uh, but they could be green and light. Good news for everybody waiting at that light. Because uh, now you get to go. Go ahead. It's green. Now, looking back towards what we may be calling Universal City beyond George's Park. There's a nice building. It has It's a black building, but then it has like a, um, a vertical, what do you call that? Uh, like the upper right angled corner is like a silver white color. Uh, that's been catching my eye. So, uh, and you can just see the scrub here of this uh, uh, beautiful Griffith Park. It's humongous, uh, just huge. And you can see, I guess what we call—I don't know what they call that. I, I always manzanita. Is that what it's called? And brown grass, and uh, you know some trees. Wow, the sky now above uh, Griffith Park. Is a lavender, lavender colored sky. I haven't seen that. I mean, because of the setting sun and the fog or the rain, it's a lavender color. Uh, you, can, you know, that's it's uh, it's beautiful. Wow. Uh, and as you go further up, it uh, it's more of a purplish, the bruisey color. A uh, plane just took off at uh, Burbank Airport. I'm assuming it's a Southwest flight. My flight in was great, by the way. Uh, not, you know, and in, in, you know, I had my full row and everything. I did get a window seat. I was B, was in the B boarding group. Still managed to get a window seat. No reason to rush. Oh, there's a boat shop. If I lean really forward, and there's a boat in front for sale, maybe. You know, uh, still taking bids, if you wish. And right at, at the actual hotel I'm staying at, they have like a nice little, I guess what you'd call a wedding pavilion. They have uh, like a little uh, gazebo uh, with uh, stone paths, a couple of ponds, a bench, uh, like fountain, a couple of fountains, actually. They even have a pool. It's right below my room, though, so I have to do this uh to look at the pool, it's empty. As a light is at one light in the pool, I'll be on, I, I mean, between the window, I'm like, huh, oh, it has a nice blue stripe separating, you know, shallow from the deep end. And now the lights are coming on. Is it Los Angeles? This it's a city of angels, but is it the city of lights? Oh no, that's Paris. I mean, there's a lot of lights here, but uh, maybe you know, Paris. Holy mackerel! Now. Oh, what a magnificent sky now. So the lavender is now fronted by some deep uh, pinks. Oh, man, this looks like a a painting almost. Uh, there's different patches, like off to the right above the hills. It's just this round patch of pink. And then, you know, following where the uh, sun is setting. This is amazing. I wish I was a better describer because... You just have one of those, I mean, near mystical uh, looking. I mean, I don't know if you could paint it because it could be something from outer space. There's layers of purples and pinks. And way more on the, uh, you know, the nighttime color look, like a really iridescent pinks with dark, dark purples and uh, grays. And wow, wow, wow! Exactly. I guess that woman's color, uh, color of her hat, really set the mood because these are pinkish uh, too. Just amazing, amazing stuff. And I guess that'll be it for tonight. You know, why not end it here with the uh, the uh, setting of the uh, sun, and then I'll return for a little commentary in the morning, and we'll get a little taste of uh, Burbank at night and. Uh, boredom delight and Burbank in the morning uh, nervous people take warning thanks I'm back it's, it's only been a few minutes uh, but I, it's not morning I wanted to give you an update the, sun, the sky is still the sun is still setting 
in clouds have become uh, st- still amazing, but it's heading more towards the horizon. The uh, I don't know if those are striations. They might make my hip want to do some gyrations, though. They look so good. Uh, amazing, amazing sky. And, you know, c- c- clouds look good. I don't know if it's going to rain. I, I, I should probably check that, but... Uh, uh, and the lights, as I said, are coming on. And, um, you know, now this is a bit of an, in, in, you know, this is like, a, in, you know, a lot of lights are functional lights, especially in the nondescript buildings have nondescript lights. I don't know why anyone, you know, why, why are there any great songs about, you know, there's nondescript buildings in their lights? Like there's songs about tiny bubbles, but... Uh, you know, not boring buildings. So what was that in the show Weed? So that was Tiny Houses, uh, right? And I think that was a great, that was a great song that opened Weeds. Uh, and uh, I always enjoyed it. But, yeah, I'm looking out at an indiscreet talk. But this is like, I guess they might have known. They said, is, this, is that Scooter going into that room? Make sure you get him the room with the view of the, the, the bo- you know, those boring buildings? And I said, well, it's just, yeah. oh, oh boy, Hollywood Piano Sites, I just watched live as Hollywood Piano Sign went on, and first the piano lit up, and then the Hollywood, it was it was breathtaking, I mean, you can hear my reaction, and that is not a forced reaction, it was, I was surprised, I guess, I didn't expect on a Sunday night, uh, but it's free advertising, right? And I guess maybe the last the last car is gone from the parking lot, so presumably they closed at a six. But the site sign is on. I think the business next door to Hollywood Piano. It looks like it may be a four lease sign, but it, it, that's like a nondescript but describable building. It's uh, you know, the Hollywood uh, uh, Piano Building is a maroon, a deep, deep maroon. By the way, they're having a piano sale, just in case you didn't hear me the first few times I mentioned it. Uh, but it's a maroon, like one of those granite bro- brick buildings, I believe. Or granite, whatever those, b- b- masonry block buildings. I don't know how to describe it. But the building next door looks to be a brick building and a little bit newer it's got some uh, rectangular windows that have uh, sun treatment or whatever, so they're uh, smoked out or whatever you want to call it. And this hotel down here, you know, remember, I don't know if you remember uh, 15 minutes ago when I was describing the lights on the hotel, uh, but they did catch my eye, and now they're even catching because they shoot down the side of the hotel, giving you know, like a laser effect. So on the parking lot side of this uh, residence in uh, there, I said it, uh, there's some red, deep reds, and then there's green on uh, the side closest to my hotel, and then some purplish blue, that LED, I love that LED purplish blue, holy moly, give me that every Christmas from here till eternity, because those are supposed to last that long. We may have some lighting effects. The lights change. Holy moly, talk about the lights change colors on this hotel. Not only did the Hollywood be, I'm, I'm here, not only do I have nondescript buildings, but I have slow lighting effects. Now all the lights on the hotel are changing colors. And they're all going from the purplish blue to a more, uh, b- b- like, uh, purple, lavender. Oh, they. Whoa, they just all went to green, right as I was trying to describe it. Green lasers. What will be next? Well, you'll be here live to hear it. Uh, they're green lights still, except on the parking lot side is blue. Which lights will change first? Uh, who will Who will know? Another bus going by slowly. Red light as we wait for the lights to change. And they do. The parking light lights change from blue to purple. And the street side lights change from purple or from green. You're right. You're right. Green to blue. The color I, I have grown to to to, to adore. Uh, lights on the Airmark building are also lit up. Uh, I'm keeping an eye on the time because I'm waiting for a pizza to get delivered to the lobby. So I'll head down in a minute. Ooh, the lights just went from blue to purple. Parking lights a lot. Lights went to red. And you can't, and they're still back up on the five. Uh, 
It's moving pretty good as I lean it forward as far as I could see. And I always remember this part of the five. I don't remember the Hollywood piano. I'm sorry, but uh, I always remember getting to Griffith Park and kind of this windy bend. And I think you pass like uh, one of the Disney buildings at some point. And uh, clothing, lights are now green and red, uh, holiday uh, colors. Uh, but I do, I do enjoy this part of the five. Uh, plus, it always makes me. And then you get. I think you go through. Have, would you have already gone? I guess you go through downtown LA next. And then you always wonder, like, how long is it going to take? You know. And then I think I don't know if that you're done with your decisions. Which, which do you just stay on the five or, or what? Um, but yeah, that's all for now. I just had to tell you about these lights on this hotel. I couldn't let you miss it. Now my hotel has green lights. Uh, they're going with the holiday and theme, and they're pretty good. And the gazebo's lit up in case you uh, are looking for an evening wedding or evening romance, a proposal maybe. And there's a car going out of the Black Angus parking lot. All right, I'll talk to you soon. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's, uh, it's only been a minute for you, but uh, it's the morning here. And the garbage is being picked up at the Black Angus as we speak. Uh, there's someone out walking, and it's about 8 a.m. And the tra- it's rainy, and the traffic is uh, its not uh, at a standstill. But, you know, it's a Monday morning, and uh, the traffic, there's traffic, uh, I mean, in all honesty, I'd say, well, she's get off of L.A.'s back. Uh, I've seen a lot worse. Uh, a couple updates. The uh, the leaping uh, motocross bike or whatever is still in the hotel parking lot below me. And the sky is, uh, it's divided once again. And it's a, it's a, it's a lovely sky. The uh, backside of Griffith Park uh, has a... Um, what would you call it? Like, uh, I'd say uh, an eighth from the top, a quarter from the top is a is a cloud or a bank of, of fog, a small one. Just a, it's a, it's not a patch because it's too long to be a patch. Uh, I guess a, a what would you call it? It's not a bank, not a stream, not a patch. A stream of fog, a string of fog, a, a stream maybe. Uh, we've got, uh, it looks like the rain is mostly to the, either the south or the e- east or the west, uh, not to the north. Uh, it looks maybe dry in the north, hard, hard for me to say. Uh, but yeah, good more. I mean, good, good morning for me, good evening for you. The buses are running, you know, bustling, bustling mo- Monday morning, Maybe it's a it's a calm. Oh, yeah, update my my appearance on Harmontown went really well. Uh, uh, everybody there was just amazingly, amazingly kind, and uh, re- I mean, mind-blowingly nice people. Uh, Dan and Jeff and Cody and Spencer, Dustin and Steve. And I guess as I look out the window, maybe I could, I'll see if anyone catches me. I could, so let's see, I left this hotel, I ate, I got some pizza, then I came back, I could, could, I'm going to have, have some of the rest of the pizza for breakfast. But yeah, I had some pizza, and then I was procrastinating, so then I had to like iron my shirt. And then I called an Uber, and it was in Glendale, and it kept, it, it was one of those ones where it said five minutes, and it would go to nine minutes and it would stay at nine minutes, and, and I didn't want to be late, you know, but I, holy moly. I didn't want to be too early, uh, but I didn't want to be late. So then um, I overthought, and I canceled that Uber. And you can still hear the morning freeway sound, so don't worry. You're not missing out. Uh, but then the Uber came, and the Uber driver was wicked cool. I have his name, but of course I don't have it in front of me, but he was wicked nice. Uh, well, I canceled one Uber. Then I got a second one who was dropping someone off right by my hotel. He came and picked me up, and he's a big fan of Dan's, uh, so that was cool. He, he, was, he was a harmonian. And so we talked about that. We talked about Rick and Morty for a while. Uh, the Uber 
Uber driver is actually from the Bay Area, and so that was really cool. We were talking about podcasts, and he's a big fan of No Sleep, and I told him, uh, you know, I never met, never met David Cummings, but David Cummings seems like a great guy. And he said, don't worry. I said, I got to be there at 745. Uh, he said, don't worry. You'll make it. You'll make it. So we drove there. And we hit some traffic. So I was, you know, I was stressing like uh, like you wouldn't believe. But they gave me something to fixate on. And then I got to uh, the Nerd Melt where they have uh, the Harmon, where they record Harmon Town. And then I was like, oh, "There's a like, uh, everyone was in line to get into the theater, and I was like, like meandering, you know, trying to get around the line and worrying about that." And then it hit me. I said, "Oh boy, I'm gonna meet Dan Harmon here." Uh, and it, 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 just just a social arc. Where I said, "Oh man, like not only do I have to not mess up like uh, the the show part, I forgot about the social anxiety part." Uh, but then I went in, and I met Dan and Cody and Steve, and uh, it was just uh, talked. And uh, turns out human, it turns out human beings are human beings, uh, and nice people are nice people, good people are good people. So we did some chit chatting, and then we talked about what was going on with the show, and you know, then did, then did some more chit chatting, and then Jeff, who was the comptroller, came in, and uh, he was dressed to the nines as he always is, and uh, just just getting distracted by Hollywood pianos. Sign is off the business next door. There's a car in the parking lot, though. But then uh, they went over some stuff for their sponsor, and they were kind of talking about that, you know, business type stuff. And then me and Dan were talking, and then the show started, uh, or got ready to start, and he kind of led me. Uh, it, it just can't, I, I can't say enough how, how nice Dan is. Uh, just, just, just uh, the, this was the moment where, like, a, like, like a, a tiny human moment. Uh, what happened was we had to leave, like, the room, the, I guess they call it the green room. That's where you, you sit. And he's like, okay, come, come with me. Like, uh, he's, like, I'm gonna go on stage, and then he'll come out, you know. And then we had to cut through the theater, and I kind of froze because I was like, oh, wait, where do I, where do I, is Dan going straight on stage, it, or is he? Is, 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 and then I didn't, but I didn't say anything, and he detected it, and he said, oh no, 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 just keep following me. And uh, it just, just the, 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 that moment really made my night. Uh, because you, you, I don't, I don't know. Um, and then Dan went on stage, and uh, it was like a control room because they live streamed the show. And the big uh, Harmon fan, that's uh, like people were watching the live stream. And thank you for uh, the support. And then, uh, you know, uh, well, you you can listen to the show, but I get to watch uh, the show from off stage. That was really fun. And kind of see, you know, just, just, uh, I don't know. And, and I couldn't believe how unnervous I was. I think it was like, uh, uh kind of d- Dan disarmed me. And I realized, okay, okay, I'm going to be okay. This will be okay. Um, and then the, 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 the show, I, was, I still like, I, I have like a mostly a, a fragmented memories of the show. So I'll have to le- re listen to it. Uh, but, you know, I won't have a, on it. I mean, my view of the show will be much different than anyone else's because, you know, I don't have a sane, you know, way of looking at it. Uh, uh, balance. You know, the five is really moving north. Uh, it was more backed up yesterday. Uh, this construction slowdown doesn't seem to be causing a traffic backup. Uh, just seems, but I don't know if anybody takes north through Bur- Burbank to work. Um so, uh, yeah, the show, I mean, the show went great. I mean, I mean uh, like, uh, I mean, if I take anything away from it, so like she said, yeah, I had great respect for Dan. I liked what he did. And Jeff, uh, yeah, you know, I, uh, and, and afterwards, and now, like, uh, I, I mean, my, my respect and, I don't, I don't know, put, putting a human face on things. I don't know, I guess it comes back to, like, uh, and this kind of came up in the show. Uh, it was, like, a uh, nice, nice I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, as touched, I, I was. Um, 
as I say here, and I try to diffuse my, the, the fog bank on Lake Griffith Park is actually increasing. Uh, now it is a bank, and it's kind of pouring over this one ridge and getting denser. Uh, uh, but, yeah, so the appearance went great. Uh, I mean, I think n neutrally I could say that. Uh, you know, my internal critic is like, oh, boy. And I, I didn't get a chance to say that on the show, but that's like the first time I've been in in that situation in my life. So, and what a great opportunity! Uh, so, I, 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 yeah, I'm totally touched. And then after the show, uh, there was another day in there, a listener of the podcast, Dan M, who gave me a book, uh, and that was unbelievably touching, and uh, just came right, right, right up to me. Uh, I think I was talking to somebody else first that didn't like uh, that was going to check out the podcast, and then I talked to Dan, and we had a nice hug, and we got a picture. Not sure. I, hopefully, he took it on his camera because I don't even. I was I, I, somehow my camera, my phone filled up too. Uh, but then, uh, so I met Dan, and he gave me a book, and it was so so nice. And then our friend Ahab's wife, Faye, was also at the show. So so then I got to meet Faye and give her a hug. And Faye happens to be best friends with the Silvertone, uh, Chris Chris Williams, the official jazz singer of the podcast. So then I spent a few minutes there thanking Dan and Cody and Dustin and, and, and saying bye to Jeff and Spencer. I don't know if they guys said bye to Spencer. But, uh, you know, and that was awkward just because I, I didn't, couldn't put, put into words how thankful I was. But uh, then I went, so then it ends up, so Faye is best friends with the jazz singer of the podcast, The Silvertone. And if you're in L.A., they, it turns out they play every, The Silvertone's playing in a band at Now Boarding. And it just happened to be around the corner from the theater. And, uh, you know, I didn't know how stressed I would be after the show, but I felt great. Uh, you know, like I had a lot of adrenaline going, but... Uh, you know, I wasn't freaked out or devastated or, uh, so then Faye was like, oh, let's go see the Silvertone. Uh, so we walked over or drove over to the theater, uh, to this other, to this, uh, this lounge, I guess it was, and, uh, where the Silvertone was playing and we went in and he was singing and doing kind of songs from the Rat Pack and he didn't know who I was. And then during break, he got to meet him and, uh, it was just a, just just another great moment. Holy moly! And then he sang, sang at some point. He sang the song he wrote about the podcast, "Wings of Pointlessness." Tried to record that on my phone, but that got messed up too. But geez, what a! I mean, and then just to listen to his, he's got actual dulcet tones, and he really is a performer. Uh, this was something this guy was, but he's crafted, you know, he's worked hard, but he was, he's born to do it, watching him on stage, working the audience, dancing, and uh, his band was great, and, and, and then that was it, and then I came back here, and uh, tossed and turned for a while, uh, and woke up a lot, you know, because my brain was trying to process everything that happened. But yeah, I guess like I'm sitting back here sitting. I'm, you know, I got to get brush my teeth and get moving here. If I get some point, we'll uh, come over this ridge. It's, it's headed down into these uh, cemeteries now. And uh, but yeah, like uh, I don't know. I, I guess like I, I am uh, developing some adult skills because I honestly was like, there's no way. I, I couldn't possibly see me going on stage. Uh, I was really, really nervous. And I was nervous about meeting Dan, you know, because I just wanted to be uh, really, like, uh, consider him a brilliant, brilliant person. Um, and I guess maybe it was harder because I listened to Harmontown. And I can tell you that DJ Logic was on Harmontown a couple weeks ago. And he had said how nervous he was, and that was a big help to me. I forgot to mention that, too. That that was really nice. But, uh, well, she said, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm really thankful that, uh, like, uh, and the way Dan found out about the show is if Cody, hopefully Cody's mom's asleep, but uh, 
Cody's mom listened to the podcast, told Cody, Dan's girlfriend, about the podcast, and then Cody told Dan about the podcast. And then the Silvertone told Faye about the podcast. And then I got to go. So you really are wonderful people. Anybody that can't sleep, uh, you know, I'm honored to be here, whether it's to put you to sleep or just to be here sitting uh Looking out at uh, 5 North, uh, traffic is so low. 5 South, it's packed, but it's moving. Here at Dull Chopper 5, uh, Fog Watch, uh, almost to the, the peaks of uh, Griffith Park, almost fully uh, enrobed in fog. And yeah, so uh, good night, and I'll talk to you soon. All right, here's another episode of Nuns in Space, our uh, episodic story. Uh, but like influenced heavily influenced by things like Star Trek and Firefly, maybe, maybe not, uh, maybe not episodically, but it's our episodic series, uh, Nuns in Space, uh, the tale of nuns in space on a ship called the Monte Carmelo, uh, piloted by Scooter and his best friend and software interface, Stan. Uh, the crew of the ship are, are the nuns from Scooter's childhood. And each episode is a, is a episodic. So it's an episode game, mostly self-contained. I mean, you know, like, uh, you really don't need to listen. It's, you know, I think you got everything there. Scooter, the spaceship, they're in outer space. Uh, nuns, and they're in search of a ship called the uh, Nachez. Uh, which they're, every episode they're looking for it. So there's a, you know, there's a little hint. And the way they search for the ship is by following strings of delusion throughout space. And I think this is, it's, it's, it's a great, I mean, there's like, a, there's, there's a lot of great things to sleep to in this series, including, I mean, outer space, you know, in space, no one near, needs to hear you sleep because it's none of their business uh, or something, some catchphrase like that. And here's a person that introduces our series, but is rarely on time. Uh, my friend, it's a world, the game seven of the World Series. Yeah, it's, it's called a DVR. I think you got them in, in down there. Oh, my friend, I can I can, can I watch it on your TV? No, because I have it paused, so I don't want it to be unpaused. It's a, a, a tie game. Oh, it wasn't a tie game when. I, oh. Okay, sorry, Antonio. Are you a Cubs fan or a Cleveland? My friend, it won't, is, is this point, it won't matter. Okay, you sound off, so I'll just let you introduce. Okay. Is that ladies, the gen, ladies, the, my friend, see, I'm unprofessional. You don't even sound like yourself, Antonio. Is it cold outside? Exactly. I don't know why that would affect your ability to ban Darius, but, uh, is that ladies and gentlemen? The boys, the girls, and the friends behind the binary. It's time for another episode of the nuns in a space. Yeah. The nuns in space. That was, that was probably best yet, Antonio. Yeah, go ahead and watch it. I, like, you can watch it and just don't yell. My friend, there's no reason to watch if I cannot yell. Okay, how about we go watch it together? Oh, won't Stan be jealous? No, okay, nuns in space, I get it, thanks. Hey, pen pal, it's me, how you doing? Um, I don't know, pen pal, I was like, yeah, what am I going to uh, talk to my pen pal about it? Because I was debating, I said, well, should I think it's, should I craft up something? Like, what kind of mood, where and when is my pen pal listening to this? And should I, you know, I don't, I don't have any zingers, pen pal. Or, you know, or, or hum, humdingers. I think that was, pen pal, I don't know if you, do you play, in your world, do you have board games? Uh, there was a game called Cranium, like, uh, and I think there was a, something called a humdinger when you played that game. It was a, it was a, it wasn't a, it was a, it wasn't a pen and, it was a board game, Ben Pal, but it also had other things. Humdinger, I think you were supposed to hum a song. 
And then people, the, the your teammate, I think, I believe, was supposed to guess it. So probably wouldn't put a humdinger into a pen pal message because that wouldn't be. But I was, I, I think originally humdinger meant like a zinger. Like I would say something and then across time and space you would be tickled pink. You know, or like just like Lionel Kitty City used to do, turn a frown upside down, pen pal. I would do that for you if you were frowning. But maybe when you press play on this, it automatically, hopefully I'm not causing a frown. That's what, that's what I was worried about. I said, oh, and I said, I don't want to, and he said, oh, should I, should I write up my pen pal letter? And then I was like, oh, well, maybe I should, should I think it's in a, and then I stood in front of, I don't have a mirror, but so I stood in front of an imaginary mirror. And I, I pretended I was wearing an imaginary suit and I checked my uh, pocket square. Pen pal, adjusted my imaginary tie, and I said, good afternoon, pen pal. And then one of the sisters said, what are you doing? And I said, I just did that. I didn't even do anything. And then I then I went, well, I wish I could think of, I wish I was quicker, you know, pen pal. Like I said, well, pen pal. Is that a pen, or are you a pal? Why don't you, you say something? I, like, that would be, and then, you know, then that voice says, well, just don't worry. Your pen pal will be laughing. Just be yourself. That's all you got to do. But you know me, pen pal. You know, pen pal, I wish, it, it's too bad you don't, like, it. Like uh, it's. I don't have a lot of empathy and compassion. I think I struggle with those things, but I do know that I can't record like, it's a good thing they don't have a, the brain recording devices have yet to be, you know, work right. Because we have so many conversations that I don't record, pen, like where I'm testing out conversations, kind of like a rehearsal. The irony is when I sit down to record them, none of, none of that, like, you should hear the stuff. I'm like, there's so many per world, universal, all the earthly problems we still had, even after we were exposed to space, we fixed those, pen pal. But I kind of forgot how, uh, like, once the pressure of coming up with a good joke to lead with, you know, to make sure. So, Pen Pal, I hope this finds you good. Uh, great. Terrific. Uh, and hopefully I can get, you know, get into it now. To, like, because he spent all his time thinking about impressing you and planning what I was going to say, and then it created a pressure that I said, well, just start recording because you're going to take forever. You'll never. And he said, where was all that stuff I was talking about in the shower with my pen pal? And, uh, like, remember when we wrote that opera together? Wait, why can't I remember? Was it an opera? Or was it, was that in my imagination? If it was an opera, it probably involved one of those things like, uh, well, never mind, Penfield. I don't think they have trains or can't, you know, we all, you know, what happened with Canada. So there's no more Mounties. We know about that. I don't know how, I thought that was part of the North American continent, but how, that was like to, to hold, the whole, that all of Canada transcended. That was, that was wild, wasn't it, Pen Pal? I mean, they said, Om Canada, if you know what I'm saying, Pen Pal. I don't know that 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 was a that was a Canadian transcendence, the great Canadian transcendence they called that pen pal. I don't know. Maybe there's a cover up. Maybe they don't talk about it. No one, no one believed it. And then that's when people started saying there never was any Canada. And I was part of the you know I was a Canadian truther. I said okay to answer me this. Uh, which, you know, do, 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 let's talk about, do we got the Drake, we got Rapt, Toronto Raptors, CN Tower. How'd that get on the cover of Drake's album if Canada doesn't exist? Uh, the Kids in the Hall. Uh, did I say enough? You know, do, do you want to laugh? Because without Canada, and they said, well, Canada's transcended. They said, what about Bob and Doug McKenzie? And they, they, because all my references are so dated anyway. And they, then I said, well, what was that guy? Ed Grimley, I think was his name. Uh, SCT. I said, all oh, those are all my, if, 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 
I think this was that breakfast with the nuns, eh? Because they're, they're more in my age range, pen pal. Uh, anyway, pen pal, I guess like I'm, I'm talking so much because uh, I've, I've also been debating. We we uh, we we uh, we were well, we still are out of delusion or something. We've we've been just in this weird spot in space. I don't really know where to go. And so for a, a couple of days, or according to the sisters' weeks, uh, we've just been traveling. In you know, I kind of said, "Well, let me look at the map," and then I said, "Well, let's just go on this course here." You know, let's travel within d d d delusion detection distance, you know, more populous sections of the galaxy. And uh, I'm not getting anything. I haven't been getting anything. Then, just not that long ago, our ship was hailed. You know, somebody called in. They said, hey, very, very Dolby, uh, like, picked us up somehow on ra radar. I said, well, I see your ship... Uh, uh, there's a certain signal, something, I don't know, they want to have tea. And then they said, is this, a, they said, why, who answered this freaking call? And they said, well, it's, it's a, this space protocol, you said. Uh, and they said, okay, they said, they said, tell them we all have a call, you know, and they said, well, it's tea, even tea's the better. So I was debating whether meet up with this Dolby, but I guess we're meeting for tea uh, soon. Well, let's see what time. Oh boy! So I got to go. And then of course they said, "Well, we, we'll you'll meet at the docking." Oh, hold, hold on, Stan, are, are we docking with the, this the Dolby ship? Dol, Dolby is that the, the 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 being's name? Scooter, Scooter, it is. It's Dolby. The Dolby. Okay, is it what's it? Scooter? You should head down to uh, dock forty-four. Okay, Stan. It's it. Why is it? Never mind. Okay, I know where to go. Okay, Scooter. Uh, so we're gonna meet up with this Dolby. You might as well come along. It's Dock Forty Four. I mean, this ship's not that big. There's not Forty Four docks. I don't know Forty Four if it's a number or not. I don't. I, Stan, you don't need to answer either. Uh, but so this Dolby called, and it's, it, it, it's, it's like uh, when I'd have tea. Okay. Okay, hold, 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 I'll be right back because I got to do this airlock thing. It's going to be so, it's so noisy. These airlocks with the freaking air. You'd think like they'd, they'd have a way to, like, uh, and you still make sure your ears pop. I chew, to, I pretend to chew gum. You know, I just work my good jaw and plug my ears. But I think those two things defeat themselves, pen pal. Okay, hold, hold, hold on. I'll be, we'll be back in one second, Pen Pal. Hey, Pen Pal. I'm back. Pen Pal, I'm here with Dolby, who's just a delightful being. Uh, and Dolby's here, so I can't describe Dolby, but quite da da dashing it for in a non earthly way, Dolby, you are. Well, your pleasure. It's my pleasure to say so. This is my Pen Pal that we're recording for. Uh, pen pal Dolby, Dolby bowed and did kicked one of those heel kick cross leg. Uh, Dolby, have you do you know who the Burt Radio City Rockettes are? Dolby's laughing in a charming way. Pen pal, and Dolby brought uh, tea. Uh, so thank you, Dolby. We, we get, I can't wait for you to meet the sisters. You're really going to, um, I'd, I'm interested. Maybe I could watch you interact with them. Would you like me? You could go right ahead, Dolby. I'll walk behind you. This Dolby's a charmer, Pen Pal. And I don't mean it like I'm jealous, but not like so charming. Even the part of me that would like, like I can't. You know what I mean, Pen Pal? Holy cow. I mean, in some way, I can't. I, I know Dolby's going to char, charm, charm the sisters, too. Okay, Dolby's just making small talk. To her, or, um, I wish I could record this, Pen Pal in a way that would just assimilate into my genes so I could just do this rapport is being made. They're laughing. They think this is actually actual real rapport building. Oh, hey, do Oh, you got to be honest with us. Okay. Oh, you saw, saw the long lost buddies blo blo blooper reel. You mean the long, Oh, I was on the blooper reel. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, 
it was it was hilarious. Which part when I was crying because all the sisters were yelling at me? Yeah, that was a moment in time. I bet you. Oh, you have a seat, Dolby. Like I'll prepare the tea. The tea's prepared. You brought your own. Is that like one of those insulated thermoses? Do, do double or triple insulated? Wouldn't understand. Have you met Stan Dolby? Yeah, and the ship's computer. You can't really talk to the ship's computer except through Stan. Um, wow. I don't like. I feel so at ease. This is still. This is some good tea. I, I mean, from smelling it, I haven't drank it yet. But thank you, Dolby. So you saw us on Long Lost Buddies. Yeah, that didn't. We we uh, we got a lot of false leads from that one. Like billions of false leads. It was great. And mostly crank calls. I don't know, like, like, uh, yeah. I mean, that was a while ago. I'm surprised. So you're a long lost buddy fan? Well, you got to be, you, 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 this is part of the reason why you're here. Oh, I thought you were just here for tea. No. Uh, you, so you, you, you have information about Garp Talk? Not Garp Talk exactly. What do you, what do you mean, Dolby? You know the whereabouts of a ship. Uh, okay, that's great. Uh, wait, Gartak software interface? A bit like Stan. What do you mean, like Stan? Another soda machine? Another soda machine, like Stan? Like, uh, like, uh, uh, Stan, you know anything about this? Scooter. Scooter, I'm, I'm afraid. Scooter, I, I'm afraid. I, I don't know. It's Scooter, I'm afraid to hear more. Uh, well, Dolby, Dolby, tell us more. Uh, this ship had, had, had uh, interaction with Gartok, and they took the device. So is it a freestyle soda machine? It is, but it's not working properly. Stan, Stan does that f sound familiar to you? Scooter. Scooter, it does. Are you sure it's not like it? Because I don't know if they, well, they can't tell you everything just in case. You know, you're pretty kind of you're cool, Dolby. But, you know, is it a delusion device or a software interface? Or an, is you mean like uh, it's not working? Does it make grape soda? Scooter. Wait, what was it? Uh, Dolby, what's the name of uh, Spike? Uh, the name is Spike. That's not as cool as Stan. Stan, what do you know about Spike? Scooter. Spike's. Spike's. What, what? Is Spike like a bad, bad version of you, Stan? Scooter, Spike was a, a prototype uh, designed for marketing in, in behavioral research, not for uh, direct to consumer soda, soda dispension. So, Stan, you're, you're pretty. Like, Stan, is that uh, in your programming to mispronounce things when you're stressed? Scooter stands used to, to manipulate human behavior. Oh, like Stan would spike so like is this like some sort of university scooter exactly? University research on students uh, via soda machine with spiked sodas. So uh, like a research uh, research interface, right, Stan? Scooter at some point spike. Uh, scooter. Oh, this doesn't sound exactly like what Gartok would be up to. This machine probably knows a lot about Gartok, right? Scooter, everything I know about Spike is that the Spike's... Spike gathered a... Scooter, like, are you saying it's the standard Spike goes sentient? I mean, close to sentient, like, also depend... Like, also, like, you're dependent on human... Scooter, exactly. So with with some sort of lust for for control over humans, but also, uh, but also without wheels. So depend, you know, and also scooter scooter. Yeah. So is there anything? Uh, so you're just against, okay. Anyway, sorry, Stan. I got it. Dolby's doing some cracking jokes. I got to get back to. So I'm sorry, Dolby. What were you saying about Spike? Stan's a little concerned about Spike. This is Stan should be. Well, that's very uh, that's very uh, confirming or whatever Stan's fears. Thanks, Dolby. That's very uh, whatever that's called that human behavioral thing, where you wreck whatever you recognize how Stan's feel. You would uh, so Gartok lost a spike somehow. 
oh, Gartok got, got away, like, uh, but left Spike behind. It was in the last second. It's on the ship, eh? So do you think we could go talk to Spike? Do you think they would let us? No, they wouldn't, huh? Not exactly. What do you mean, uh, Dolby? They won't exactly let us. We'd have to trick them? Yeah. Where, where, <laughs> Dolby, didn't you see me on Long Lost Buddies? Like, tr trick them how? Like, oh, because they don't even have the legal right to have the... Okay. Did they, like, steal Spike from Gartok by accident or something? More or less. Oh, they don't even know. They just think Spike's a soda machine. A freestyle soda machine and interface. So it's pretty nice because, yeah, these kind of interfaces, they, uh, as far as I knew, Stan was the only one. So so we can't, we couldn't just, what if I just talk to her for a little while and, like, uh, oh, they're they're having a trouble, trouble with Spike. What, what seems to be the trouble with Spike? Oh, Spike only downloaded half its last software upgrade, so it's really buggy. Stan, Stan did you hear that? Does that sound plausible, Stan? Scooter, that's very plausible. If uh, if it was interrupted, if this spike was interrupted while downloading, uh, they didn't. They never fix that kind of stuff, Stan. Uh, Scooter, unfortunately, it would be dependent on the settings for the updates for, for for Spike. But if it was a recent, you know, upgrade for bug fixes and things uh, and patches. Uh, oh dear, I feel bad for Spike. Half. Uh, Halfway upgraded. It's, it's going to be so buggy. Oh, so what if we just, like, uh, Stan, would that be something we'd be able to fix? Couldn't we patch your up, up, upgrade? And, like, uh, uh, Scooter, we could do that, but Stan's also evil. You mean Spike. Hey, Scooter, hope. I guess, Scooter, I don't know. I'm just, uh, yeah, but it's it's just a software interface. I mean, could we could we also overwrite the the, the, the research Hey, Stan, I, I th are you being melodramatic, Stan? Uh, Scooter, I think I am being a little melodramatic. I just don't think it, like, like it was Spike to override. Sp Spike doesn't live to just serve Scooter. Uh, Spike has its own, oh, it's like some sort of direct. Okay, anyway, but what if we just, uh, do, we don't deal with Spike. We'll just upgrade. You think that's a good possibility, Dolby? We ch trade the upgrade to quiz Spike. Now, Dolby, my friend, I know that not everybody uh, in the universe is just so friendly as you. You know, most people have an ulterior motive. And meeting one of the stars of the bloopers from Long Lost Buddies, I'm sure, you know, will fill your coffers for stories. For You must have some sort of uh, something you want. You didn't just come to the ship for tea and friendship. Uh, I mean, who? I mean, I don't know what universe you come from with your downy soft feathers all over you and your winning smile, even though you don't. Anyway, Dolby, um, what, what's, what's, in, what's in it for you? Oh, you're laughing to break the tension. I, see, Dolby, I can. It's a funny thing. What's a funny thing, Dolby? What people want, you know, beings. Yeah, I've been calling them beings, but I guess people would be more confusing since. And okay, I could refer to it, people. You'd like, okay, I'm sorry. You just want to stow away on the ship that uh, Spike's on. Sisters, and, and anyone else? You just want to stow away on that. Don't you have a ship here? Oh, this ship's pretty big. So you would just leave your ship. You'd, you'd stow away with your ship. Oh, you'd put this ship on autopilot to meet you somewhere later. Wow, that's great. That's, that's a cool feature of your ship. Uh, and I never thought of that till this moment. That's so convenient if you're stowing away. But why would you stow away on a ship? Uh, for thrill, like riding the rails, kind of. Well, you get thrill on different levels, so you kind of get get. This is what we would say on Earth, the polite way. We would say you get off on a stowing way on ships, but you're not up to any no good. I mean, it's a it's a weird it's a weird thing. They would say that you. you 
you get a thrill. Mere, uh, mere alcohol doesn't thrill you at all. But tell you why it must be true. You get your kicks out of be, being stowed away on a, on a ship. I, I, can, I can dig it because it, I tell you what, Dolby, it, just to normalize it for you uh, without associating with its sisters because I know you'll never let me forget it. This was this is purely in the uh, above the belly button region for me, but still close, you know, still vibrating close to the belly button, but not below it for me. Who is an adult when I have to hide, I get giggly. But just, you know, just real gig you know, not lower giggles. But I do get giggly, like if I have to hide, and I never giggle, like I'm not a giggler, you know, I don't, I try not to laugh at anything. Oh, that makes you laugh. Well, but so I can relate that you could probably, is that what's thrilling about it? Mostly, you're not like, so you're just going to hide on their ship for the thrill of it. Oh, and then you'll meet them at the space station. Oof, Dolby. I, I mean, I don't want to judge you because there's, I don't think there's, we're definitely in a gray gray area, though, here with all of this, huh? Well, we, you know, we, we've we've had to, you know, deal with, uh, I never even, you know, I'm still not sure the difference between morals and ethics anyway, Dolby. Yeah, that was an uncomfortable groan, yeah. So, but we, me and the, the sisters and I have, see that sisters? I said that correctly. The sisters and I have kind of, uh, it's just a matter of uh, how are we going to, like, so we should just, are we just going to, like, what kind of move should we do to get them to let us on board? Should I say I'm a soda machine ex inspector? Because I do have a vision of what that uniform would look like. Possibly. We're, we're like, uh. Well, what do you need us to do? You just need us to create a distraction. Oh, like while we're dealing with Spike, you'll hide on the ship. That makes sense. Okay, so I'll have to come up with a plan for that, and it'll take me some thinking. Because I don't want to... I'm not good at plans, but I seem to be the one... Like, at this point, the sisters, like... Uh, I mean, me and the sisters, could you could leave us alone, Dolby, and then we'll kind of, uh, we have a little system for hashing out plans. I think we call it the Scooter's Plan Destruction Protocol. I think you saw it on Long Lost Buddies. or That's what I call it privacy, privately in the quartermaster quarters. You know, when I'm still alone after a long time, but when I'm still alone, uh, you know. What if we just come up with a bold, what do you mean a bold plan, Dolby? Like, oh, you're touching me, like, in a friendly way. Well, I like that. Did you just do a shoulder to a lower arm touch? Well, oh, Dolby, you're really making me feel like uh, whatever is b below rapport. A bold plan is one I don't have to think about. Well, then, what would, if I don't think about it, how would the sisters dissect it? We would just do it. Uh, okay, well, so we got a big ship and we got to get aboard. And you're saying pretending I'm a soda machine inspector won't work. Uh, because I would think too much. Okay, well, oof, it's a, a bold plan. I don't know. I don't like it, the idea of bold stuff. Uh like, uh, you like, uh, to, to just come up with a, what's the next thing that, like, uh, like what if we stow away on another ship? Exactly, that's bold. Oh, okay, sister, what'd you say? Sister Leanne said a, a big. It would have to be a bigger, a bigger ship than this ship. You're right about that. If we're gonna stow away, You're right, sister? I'm sorry, sister. A bigger, like a, some sort of transport ship. Okay. Hi, oh boy. What did you say? Hijack ship, sister? Are you, Stan, are you, uh, there's a, okay, there's a ship uh, not that far away. Okay, I guess we'll, let's just go to check that ship out. What if we just tell that ship we're coming on board for tea and we give the, 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 the driver of that ship some extra sleepy tea and then we fly the ship for a while? It's a great idea. Oh, no, oh, boy, sorry, Pen Pal, I didn't mean for you to hear me, uh, 
uh, bending all my, this is bad, exa I'm setting a bad example. Anyway, pen pal, I'll be back in a minute, I guess. Uh, hey, pen pal, it's me, I'm back. So the stowaway on the, the stowaway, the stowaway, stowaway to stowaway, the stowaway plan. It had a little hiccup, but then Dolby saved the day. That's right, Dolby, you saved the day. So we're hidden on a, like, uh, believe it or not, we're on a, like, uh, believe it or not, Pen Pal, they still soda in the future. Uh, I guess that's why some of these soda machines are also being repurposed as software interfaces. Though, very, you know, according, as far as I know, Stan's the only one with the personality. Uh, but this ship is a soda transport ship, so I'm wondering the morality of stealing, uh, cartridges to try to repair stands so we can have Dr. Pepper and Cherry once again. Cherry Pib. Sorry, Dr. Pepper. Sorry, Mr. Pib. So, so we tried the uh, tea thing, but we botched that. But then Dolby pretended, Dol Dolby pretended to be a uh, some sort of co space cop or something. So right before we gave the tea... To the uh, the the the, sh the ship the transport you know the captain of that ship Dolby it was a whole thing but now we have control of this uh, transport and we we happen to just uh, like uh, we got a hold of the the ship that uh, the spikes on and I I actually did it I said hey you know I'm uh, I just it, it ran a scan of your ship I saw you have a freestyle soda machine you know we're but, you know. I always sell soda stuff on the side, and they actually bought it. So actually, I am going to be, instead of a soda inspector, I'm going to be the kind of person that sells, uh, like, an illegal soda sales, concentrate soda can. So we're almost, we're, 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 we're almost meeting up with that ship, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get, you know, then, then I think, uh, so hold on, Pimp, I'll be back in a minute. Uh, hey, Pen Pal, just stick with me here, man. Hey, good, good afternoon, everybody. I'm here to, to like, uh, get this soda. Like, I just want to double check the order because it didn't make any sense with some of these fla flavors. But now seeing you, that uh, uh, you must be from a sea-based based planet. So having these sea-flavored sodas, what is, uh, like, uh, how delicious is... Uh, uh, that's is that like a is that a purple slug on there? It is, yeah, because it says purple slug on that one, the one you wanted five cases of. So you get yourself a freestyle soda machine here. This thing, something looks off about this machine though. Is it, it uh, working properly? Uh, you're having some issues with it, huh? What seems to be the problem? Did you put it in diagnostic mode? Hey, machine, how you doing? Are you in there? Is, there, do you, is this a software interface and freestyle soda machine? It is. Oh, it's deep wired into your ship's computer and your ship's hardware. Yeah, how'd that happen? You don't know. It's stuck in some sort of... Oh, it's stuck in an infinite heart. Oh, you re tried to restart it when you knew I was coming with the soda, hoping because you really went to the purple slug soda. Okay, hold, hold, hold on. Believe it or not, uh, like I have a awesome soda machine on my ship, not for sale. So don't worry about it. Stan, can you hear me? Scooter, I can. Okay, I guess this is Spike here, stuck in an infinite uh, software. Oh, how did I know its name Spike? It's uh, it's 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 like written right here. Uh, S P, like C. It's it's invisible. It's it's a way I know. It's like one of those, it's like an eye puzzle. Only human, unfortunately, you know, human beings, earthbound humans, we control the soda business. So only human eyes can see it. That's how I know that you're not, you know, that this is a, I mean, this has been altered. Anyway, Stan is stuck in an infinite startup loop. It said it's hardwired into the ship's uh, things. Do you know anything about that, Stan? Uh, Stan, you're not answering me. Okay, I can't get a hold of my soda machine. So excuse me one second. It just uh, give me a little privacy. Usually when my soda machine doesn't answer, it's because it wants to say something private to me. 
Scooter. Scooter. Okay, Stan, I can hear you. That's about as loud as you can be, though. Scooter, that's not good that it's uh, hardwired into the ship. What, what, what do you mean, Stan? Uh, Scooter, it, it can, we, Spike would have to release control. Spike has control of the ship, Scooter. Like, remember when I took over your ship? It's the same thing. Yeah, but they're not saying that Spike's in charge of the ship. Scooter, they're probably unaware of it. Spike's taking over their ship. So do you think Spike's actually in a software, like, a restart loop, though? Scooter, it could be, though. Like, uh, go, go ask them when the upgrade started. Uh, because Spike could have taken over their ship and then d downloaded half an update, st halfway updated Scooter. So, uh, wait, let's, let's, let's do a little more diagnostics. Okay, Stan. Oh, Stan, by the way, is this, this oh, 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 do, do, it's, uh, Dolby, uh, you know what I'm saying? Scooter, uh, sco Scooter, that's, uh, 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 he's giggling somewhere on the ship, Scooter. Okay, thanks, Stan. Well, hey, everybody's just running things by my soda machine. I get good news, bad news questions to kind of find out, uh, you know, I'd love to get you some of this pur purple slug soda. Um, you don't seem that excited about it, but, uh, but um, so when, so this is hardwired into your ship, it's like a big part of your navigation and you're interfacing with your ship's computer. It is. How were you interfacing before? Oh, expertise. Oh, um, yeah. That would make sense. Yeah, these are supposed to, that's what they said. That's the only way people like me could fly these big ships, huh? Oh, so you still, oh, you had an expert, and now you have another one. Oh, but you already gave, okay. Well, so the, the, the software spike was already running, helping run your ship, and then the software interface, the update started? Okay. Um, okay, Stan, so yeah, the, the update started not that long ago is what I'm hearing. Okay, Scooter. Uh, I need you to uh, uh, hold down the two buttons on the top. Okay, Stan, I'm going to hold down the two buttons on the top. And a symbol of uh, plugging Stan in uh, to some other, uh, some sort of toaster-looking thing. Uh, it says, uh, you know, update 50%. You, you can't, uh, now it's whirring around, Stan. Oh, Scooter, so I think, uh, okay, um, Scooter, you're going to need to take Spike in and plug Spike into me in order to, uh, but you'll have to have Spike's permission, Scooter. So uh, uh, go ahead and press the two buttons on the top, Scooter, uh, count to five, press them again, and that'll start Spike in like a lim limited activity mode. Okay, so one, two. Three, four, five, and then press again. Okay, it's which is it's like a, it's terrible resolution. Scooter, it's limited up. It's limited mode. Scooter. Okay, it's starting up. Uh, uh, it's really it's really glitchy though. To stand. Okay, Scooter, I need you to to ask Spike. Tell Spike what's going on. Okay, wait, can't you do it? No, Scooter, you, you're interfacing with, Stan, with Spike. Hey, Spike, I don't know if you can hear me, uh, but, it, like, you're glitching. You have a, had, a, so you, like, a half an update. And I don't know if your data got interrupted or whatever, but it was, like, one of those ones where it's halfway installed. And I'm here from Soda for you know, like I have a, I have another software interface soda machine on board my ship. Uh, I guess you two may across anyway. We can patch an update into you. I'd have to bring you on board my ship, which would mean you'd have to kind of like de hardwire out of this ship. Uh, uh, but otherwise, you're just going to be glitching for forever, I think. Like unless you uh, dock with some other soda machine experts. Right, Stan? Uh, Scooter, that's correct. Uh, Spike, uh, Scooter's correct. Uh, you, you, need, you need a patch uh, because our last patch we had was uh, 
Anyway, Spike, you, you, if you if you listen to Scooter, he'll take you on board and we'll set you back up. So, yeah, hey, everybody. So I got to take Spike uh, here. Is that going to be cool? Totally cool. I can take this soda, like this purple slug soda stuff with me, too. It didn't, you, you, well, it's a, I already brought it on board this ship. It's kind of a hassle. Okay, well, I got to get a dolly. Oh, you have, do you have two furniture dollies? Okay, so Spike, can you detach from the ship? Can you hear me at all, Spike? Scooter, I can hear you. Oh, boy. I hope that's because you're glitching, because I'm not going to be able to deal with that. Uh, but, Spike, can you release, uh, are you uh, uh, severing your ties with the ship so we can take you off board and, that you know, the ship will still be under control and everything? Scooter, I'm really pushing control of the ship. Okay, Spike, and then we'll get you patched up, and then we'll get you right back here. Because you didn't ask when I was going to bring Spike back, but, uh, you know, don't worry. I'm not going to keep Spike on our ship, so it'll take a little while, and then we'll be back, all right? Okay, Pen Pal, I'm going to get a, a two for, so Spike, I'm going to uh, lie down here on these two furniture dollies, and I'm going to stack this purple slug soda on top of you, concentrate, because they don't want it. So we're going to do that, and... Uh, you know, Spike, I haven't used furniture dollies in a while, these square ones, but I'm quite the dolly master. Um, don't worry, I'll be back uh, with, with, your, with your soda machine. Uh, and Spike, I'm talking, one, one second, Spike, I got to do it. So, Pen Pal, I'll be right back. All right, Pen Pal, so we got Spike hooked up here to, to Stan. And just going through the the update, I guess I guess it's like a, like waiting for water to boil, waiting for me, these machines to update is uh, is not pleasant. Um, I guess this is a good distraction um, uh, for uh, Dolby to hide on that ship. And Stan, can you? Um, I guess this is, I mean, we're already in, you know, strange ground morally. Can you, uh, while you're updating, can you, uh, to, you know, to, to download uh, uh, Spike's memory, please, uh, to the ship's computer? Uh, Scooter, I could do that, like, so, so we know what Spike knows about Gartok. Yeah, just copy over Spike's, you know, everything, and then, then we'll just bring Spike back. Uh, what's that, sister? The other ship. What do you mean the other ship's taking off? The ship that we were just on, that we took. Okay, see if you could get a hold of them. Okay, you're either, you're hailing them. They're not coming. They're not answering. Okay, send a send a urgent hail. Um. Okay, wait. wait, wait. Why is it? Okay, hold, hold on. Get 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 a hold of them. Thanks, sister. Uh, Stan, what's that shaking? Uh, the soda ship is, is okay. Um, Sister Leanne, why don't you uh, get our ship launch ready? Something strange is happening here. The soda ship started to move. The freight ship. Okay, now it's really shaking. Okay, let's get it. Let's. Uh... Oh boy. Okay, the, maybe the crew woke up. I thought uh, uh, Dolby had taken care of everything. I wish I could get this purple slug sewed off, but let's let's uh, fly off of this the the, the this uh, what is this thing called a container ship? I don't know. Let's get off the ship. Uh, yeah, just fly out the okay. Cargo doors are going. Go faster. Thank you. Okay, just pull pull out. You know, let's get a safe distance from this ship. Where is the other ship? It's gone. Uh, Stan, any ideas? Scooter, they jumped. Okay, they jumped. Okay, can you still reach them? Is are they out of us? Is, is there, can you break through the subspace fields? Uh, Scooter, I cannot, but there's a message coming in uh, from Dolby. Okay, can you read it to me? Oh, Scooter, oh, it says, uh, thanks for everything, suckers. Okay, thanks for everything, suckers. Okay. Cause, you know, so he must be having a great time stowed away on that ship. How'd he get to... Uh, Scooter, it came from their command deck, this message. Okay, is there anything else in the message? 
uh, Scooter, yeah, it says Spike is, is uh, oh dear, Scooter. I'm just reading through Spike's memory. Spike, it, Scooter, they were trying to get Spike off of their ship. This was, that was Dolby's ship. Okay, I'm sorry, Stan, you're going to have to, so they wanted to, wait, so that was Dolby's ship that he stowed away on, or they stowed away on. Scooter, correct. And they wanted Spike off of that ship, uh, Scooter, but they couldn't get Spike off of the ship. Okay, they couldn't get Spike off the ship because Spike was hardwired. But why would they want Spike off the ship unless Spike... How's that? Can you... Scooter, Spike's restarting. Okay, can we can we power power down Spike or anything? Uh, Scooter, we can't do... That would be... Scooter, that would be immoral, not in a restart after an update. Okay, well, how long is it going to take to to update? Uh, restart after the update. A scooter, a little while, but it's a uh, scooter. We now have an evil soda machine on board this ship. Well, no, ev- I mean, you're saying evil, but they, we don't know that. We just know that it's, it's, they wanted. Is uh, Spike already hardwired into the computers? Scooter, Spike's hardwired into me. Uh, this is great news, Pen Pal. So, anyway, Pen Pal, um, don't worry about that last thing. So, so Stan, are we talking like five minutes or two days? Scooter, it'll take a little while. I, I you should probably go lie down because you're gonna have a headache later. Uh, Stan, did we take any uh, Mister Pib or Cherry from the scooter? We did not. We we could replace it with the purple slug though. Okay, okay, pen pal, I gotta go. But don't worry about this. It's just sp- a spike. It, it's nothing. It's nothing. We just took. I guess we got. Uh, I think pen pal. Do you know what happened? So we got tricked. Is that what happened, Penpale? That uh, Dolby came on board just to trick us to take uh, Spike off of their ship, hand trick Spike to release their ship. Oh boy, that was bold. Uh, all right, Penpal, I'll talk to you soon. All right, hey everybody, this is uh, Drew, and I'm here. Uh, this is a yearly thing we do on the show. So if you're new here, uh, uh, let me just uh, set it up. Every year, if you're in the U.S., there's this thing called the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And every year since 2014, uh, we've been doing a podcast episode about it with my neighbor Ray. And also raise, uh, like, residences, uh, like, uh, boarding house boys, I call them, uh, oh boy, I forgot their fake names, the Gregor and Mikey, that's right, Mikey and the Gregor. Uh, now, if you don't live in the U.S., every year in the U.S. on Thanksgiving Day, there's a per- Thanksgiving Day parade in New York City, and it's, like, a, kind of a traditional thing. Uh, to put it on in the background, and I think this is the 90th year they were celebrating, or the 50th year, I already forgot. Um, uh, just as a stage, stage setter, war- I mean, this is like halfway through the episode or something, but, you know, Ray's going to get some airtime, and the Gregor and Mikey, so those will be, you know, different guests than me. Uh, but this has been a pretty good episode so far. But if you don't like character voices, that's one of the reasons I'm trying to work so hard to keep the archives free and, and get audience support and make other partnerships so that we can be in a position not to put our, all our older shows behind a paywall. I like to keep them out there free for everybody so that you can listen. You know, you don't have, for people that don't like Ray or character voices, because you know Ray's gotten some airtime lately, but he, he is the favorite. He's the, like the, the season for the reason or whatever. He's the reason in my seasons, uh, without a doubt. Uh, so without any further ado, I'm going to start our broadcast. So the 2016 Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade recap, you know, recap. Uh, oh, I'll introduce, so Ray's my neighbor, Ray Perkins. You know, I'll be doing some narrating. I'll throw it to Ray as color commentator, I guess. And then I don't have the final notes in front of me, but it was like the, the two guys that live with Ray, the Gregor and Mikey, will be on. Uh, one of them will be on float coverage, and one of them will be on balloon coverage. So we'll, you know, we'll do. They'll be on. They'll be remote. You know, 
Now, you may be wondering, who's the Gregor and who's Mikey? Now, those of you that have been with the show for a while will notice that the Gregor uh, it resembles a lot of very similar characteristics to Sir Gregor Clegane, uh, the original Sir Gregor Clegane. No, well, I don't know. Sir Gregor Clegane. And if you talk to him, you know, there, there may or may not be a paper trail of how that happened and then crossed over from a fam you know, fictional world into a real one and all that. That's complicated stuff. Or it could, you know, this could all just be parody or the other one. But that's the Gregor. And then Mikey, you may, may oh boy, if you thought that was complicated... Uh, Mikey also has a cat. Mikey it reminds me a lot of uh, uh, Sir, Sir Tommen of uh, uh, King Tommen of King, King of Westeros. I think is it West of Five Kingdoms or the Four? You know those those kingdoms. And you know, just a nice young man uh, with a name named Mikey that may or may not. So so those are those are Ray's house guests, or they live there. Board, I guess they're board. I do. They, I don't know if they pay rent. I don't know. But without a doubt, let's start out the Thanksgiving Day parade here. All right, so here I am at the, the kickoff of the 2016 Thanksgiving Day parade with my neighbor Ray. Ray, you want to say hi? Oh, hello, hello, everybody. This is your neighbor, Ray, your good friend, Ray. So good to be in your ears. And look who's up on a screen. Like, could this be more? But it's Scooter, Scooter. There's Scooter there, and Scooter has a checklist, and that's Fozzie Bear starting the parade off. And they're talking. Scooter's doing a checklist, Scooter, and uh, for the parade, and Fozzie, and then... Saying Christmas trees, Dave Scooter. Do you know these dancing Christmas trees? Uh, yeah, well, those dancing Christmas trees are from Alameda, and the leader Pam and Ryan they ran my, when, when my daughter took tap dance. She took tap dance at the place they uh, a dance studio they ran. So I've I know Pam, and I don't know. Well, I mean, I've had a conversations. They're very nice. Uh, as for the rest of the trees, I don't know, but it was pretty exciting to see people that I've known in real life uh, right on the screen there with Scooter. This is a tremendous moment. Fozzie Bear, cue the opening number, and it gets really nice, you know, a little, uh, a little Muppets to start out the parade. What could be nicer, huh, Ray? Oh, Scooter, I'm so thankful for you and your listeners. And for you listening, saving your life, you know, and giving you a purpose. So, okay, thanks, Ray. It's, it's talking about the parade, though, not personal problems. Well, Scooter, it's not always a problem. Just like Scooter there on the parade was checking the checklist. It, the checklists don't always look for what's missing. Sometimes they look for what's there. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Ray. Thanks for the Thanksgiving. And, and then... Uh, there's a look at this. There's some, ooh, a lot of smash. Are those smash cuts, Ray? Camera's moving too fast to right, Scooter. And there's a bakery brigade, the Swedish chef. Uh, oh, and there's Matt and uh, uh, with uh, Matt and Savannah. I do, like I don't watch the Today Show, but I know that's Matt and Savannah with Miss Piggy. Miss Piggy's really cracking us up here. Oh, Scooter, she's just like when you do your imitation of her. Uh, she's very diva-like, and uh, she's winded. Uh, she's winded. So whoever's doing this Miss Piggy is a very funny person. Oh, she, she's yelling out. I think that's hilarious. That's so Miss Piggy. I can't yell out on a sleep podcast. but uh, And now we have the doctor's, Dr. Teeth band, like in front of Macy's on the performance stage, and they're doing a tribute to uh, Jim Henson and John Hughes. Hughes and Henson, Ferris, Ferris Bueller's Day Off Calling, uh, or you could say, holy, save Ferris. He's, Ferris has been saved, I guess, because uh, they're doing Shake It Up Baby. Uh, similar, so the Muppets are singing Shake It Up Baby, the Shake It Up Baby, it's everybody from the parade, though, shaking it up, uh, just like on, uh, what was the other song Ferris Bueller sang, uh, Ray? Scooter, you know, you know I don't know that. Well, I knew it was Don, Don Cachet or something. I recall Central Park and Fall. That would have been, but anyway, not important. 
I mean, I guess it is because they're right by Central Park in fall. I don't know if Dr. Teeth, though, is the right person. You're right. Shake it up, baby's better. Uh, let's see here. Does something have anywhere to go now? Oh, the, that, that was a question, Ray. Uh, Scotty, you just blew it. The, you, we were doing the live parade, and now you're coming off your notes. Well, Ray, I just, I just asked the question, though. Okay, okay, getting mad at me, Ray. Oh, boy. Does the parade have anywhere to go, though, from now? We've had Muppets, Shake It Up Baby, a little John Hughes. Uh, we, we, get, we get some John Waters, watered down John Waters later. I mean, Hanson and Hughes. Can, 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 do we have. Okay, now we've got a sky shot. There's Al. 77th Thanksgiving Day Parade, or else 10,000 volunteers. And there's our good friend Amy Cool. Cool, 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 cool right, Ray? Oh, this is our third year with her. She's her seventh year producing the parade, and we're big fans of Amy Cool here. And it's spelled K U L E. She's with. Uh, School. Did you notice how nice her stri- she has some, some nice piping on it? She, she's got that beautiful pink piping on that uh, that winter coat she has, and then the Macy's Thomas the Tank Engine uh, a parade scarf, and she's there with the McFadden sisters. The counting down: five, four, three, two, one. Parade begins. Str- streamers everywhere. And then, Scooter, you asked, who does the voiceover for NBC for the parade? Wasn't that funny now that we see in retrospect? Uh, yeah, Ray, that was, it was funny. It was uh, like, uh, uh, yeah. And then also at 5.38, 58, Ray, there was a guy, while Al Roker was talking, there was a guy that wasn't happy. Then there's an ad break. Now, this was interesting. We, most of the ad breaks for the first hour and a half were 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Scooter, only you would care about this. Yeah, but it's, and then they changed, then they became randomized or something. Oh, but Scooter, would they, yeah, you have a bal- lovely balloon, balloon's eye view. Matt and Savannah just look great. Matt's got a gray cap on. Later, he'll make a Papa Smurf joke. Savannah has beautiful green wool coat on. And Al saying that it's the perfect weather uh, for the parade. Then there's a few mentions sprinkled throughout the show for different weather apps. Uh, and then, Scooter, you want to take this first celebrity interview? Oh, yeah, this was great. It was Ben Feldman uh, from Superstore, but also, you know, as we know, from the lawyer from Silicon Valley. And he was so charming. He and Al got it wrong. He said superstar, but then he corrected himself. He said, and he, and this, Ben was wearing a great sweater. And there was just a really, there was a couple small, when they have the stars, I mean, I don't know if, you know, these are actors, but there there seemed to be a couple different genuine moments. And this was one uh, where Al says something nice to Ben, and Ben says, well, back at you, Al. Like, it just in a very, it was just very, it was, I don't know, it's touching and uh, very genuine, nice. He said he's thankful for his giant family. Should be thankful. He's got great hair. I mean, geez, if I had that hair, I don't think it would look good on me. But, uh, and uh, then there's great drumming. And then, uh, the, then, oh, Scooter, then there's the Holiday Inn by Irving Boleyn. We get into the Broadway numbers. In this very good uh, blue sky, they sing Shining at Me and then Shake My Blues Away. And it was a very Lucille Ball moment, Scooter. A woman that looked a bit like Lucille Ball. There was a big tap dancing number. Lots of fun, lots of fun. And everyone was playing with the decorations and the jump roping. And then, Scooter, what happened next? Well, then my, my I say, look, I, this is all, I'll have to share these notes. It says, holy moly, written in more bold in double exclamation points. Less, uh, I, I, I didn't write down his name, but in the flesh, the NBC parade announcer, Les Manichuk, or Manichuk, and let Les M., and I said, geez, if I saw it, this parade couldn't get any better than the Muppets. Having th- th- That was his first time on camera, he said, for the parade. And he just totally, like, uh, slided in there. He goes, oh, by the way, if you're ever wondering who does the voice for the parade, how you doing? It's me. 
less less m and i even put like uh, three three exclamation points before i put wow and then it did get better i put wow it did get better and i guess uh, i'll send i'll throw to you for the broadway numbers uh ray but then al is with dolly parton and she this or this young girl who's plays dolly parton i believe and I didn't realize Dolly Parton had a movie called, I don't know if it was like the J- Joseph and the Technical or Dream Coat, but it was Coat of Many Colors was last year's special. This year it's Christmas of Many Colors, Season of Love. Ricky Schroeder's on it. So uh, that that we got to tell the Gregor about that. Miss Lynn, Lind, I think was the girl's name, is the young Dolly. She did a very good job. Uh, but then at one point, there was another genuine moment where Al, she, she's from a family, like, and she, Al says, of acting and, and, and stuff. And Al says, well, I guess you were born to do this then. And there was just a slip, slip like a switch, split second where reality snuck in there. And you could just see it on her young face. Uh, and she said, oh, yeah, totally, Al. Born to do this. She did. She was a good actress. But uh, then, uh, go, go ahead. I'll scoot it. Then, wait. There's a, a Broadway musical. Uh, Sarah Bareilles is a, uh, did the music for It's an all-female creative team. Waitress wants a fresh start. Scooter, you said it was a bit like the, the movie and the screenplay you like to read. Nick, Nichols Fellowship winner, Butter. The pro, 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 correct, Scooter? It did remind me of when I read Butter, and uh, it, but it's different. I guess it's a lot different. And there was good chorus. There was one guy who kept running on, and then he he was sniffed a pie, and then he just ran right off. I liked that. And then it went to commercial. Then Al was doing a 360-degree camera spot, and he was yelling at Hello Kitty. And then they did a big turn where you weren't having 360-degree camera, but Al was. And then Al talked to a first-year volunteer, and then Al did some balloon comedy where he was holding the balloons. And, uh, uh, Scooter, I guess I'll have to throw... uh, uh, Scooter, what should we do about the cat thing? Oh, thanks. uh, Thanks. Um, I'm here right at the in front of Macy's here. Uh, with our newest reporter, uh, Mikey, who's going to be covering uh, floats this year. But I wanted Mikey to see this performance of Cats, one of the longest-running Andrew Lloyd Webber musicals, Jellicles. And it's a show about cats, and you'll see the cats perform memories the way they were. And they're really... But, but Mikey, why don't you introduce yourself to everybody? Well, well, hello, hello, Podman. Uh, my name is Sir Mikey, and I will be reporting. I'm a little bit nervous, Batman. I've never been on a parade before. I mean, where I'm not, uh, you know what I mean, Batman. I mean, parade, parade not in my honor. And this is a strange thing, your parade. Your people are very strange. I mean, I knew Batman. I knew, I knew you were strange, but I figured your world was normal, and you were the one that didn't fit in. But now I'm realizing that even in a strange world, you don't fit in Batman. With your world is strange. It's very strange. And by the way, I know you brought me out here because these are not these are not cats, Batman. These are people pretending to be cats. And Sir Pounce won't come on for, for this part. Sir Pounce refuses to come on the mic for this. Uh, because Sir Pounce is, you know, has his bad butt to the, to, to the cats. But it is beautiful. It is beautiful singing memories. Uh, I, 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 I can't have any memories, Batman. Well, thanks, Mikey. Let's get you out on the parade route there so we can have your live. Thanks, Mikey. That's great. That's Mikey, everybody, our uh, whatever, parade flow r- r- reporter. And, yeah, that's uh, the way they were. The crowd, the crowd really, they're, they're, they're hanging on every note. Uh, that the singers are singing here at Cats, and now they're going wild. The crowd in front of Macy's, including Les. And then we're back with Al with a sky shot, and This Is Us, and Chrissy Metz and Justin Hartley. Oh, they're from the show This Is Us. 
And this was a nice moment. She said, you know, it was always her dream to be at the parade. And it seemed like a, like a very honest answer. Oh, no, she gives an honest answer. Then uh, Gazelle says, uh, so you're on this big hit TV show. Did you know? And she says, no, 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 you'd never know, Al. A uh, very honest answer. You you, you can hope and, and you can do your best to, to, to make a great show, but you never know if it's going to work. And I really liked that. Then Al throws it to something, but the pen ran out of ink. Uh, Scooter, they threw it to Paramore. Uh, Scooter, you know, that's one of my favorite words, Paramore, uh, by Cirque du Soleil. So we have a little performance here by Cirque du Soleil. And then uh, we, they go to commercial, and they come back, and uh, Al's in the in the crowd after another sky shot. He's with Olivia, a little girl sitting in front of him. And then he talks to this uh, incredibly charming young man called John Seda, who was on Chicago PD, and now he's on Chicago Justice, his own spinoff there. And Scooter, he said, you know who's on that show? Carl Weathers, You're one, of your, one of your favorite actors. Yeah, that's great. I can't wait. Uh, I mean, I wish I had more time to watch uh, these shows because Derek Haas, I guess, is the producer of all those things. And he's like, uh, seems like a really great guy. You know, Script Notes, one of my favorite podcasts. Uh, John and Craig always have nice stuff to say about him. Uh, so one day I'll, I'll binge on all those Chicago shows. I'm sure my you know procedural lovers that listen to this podcast like it. And John Cena had a great moment, uh, like very funny, because Al was like blocking his daughter's view of the parade, and she started crying. And then Al kind of ch- 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 tried to make a make make a good thing, but then he said, uh, first parade ruined or something." It was a very funny uh, moment. It would be a good moment. And then Al said, uh, hashtag make room for Roker. I don't know if that's a new show coming this fall on NBC, make room for Roker. Uh, but they were talking about that Al was coming to the parade was starting. And then what do you, what do you say? Oh, and then we have Harvey Feierstein, one of our favorites, Scooter. And he's sitting there in the makeup chair, just halfway done, getting in it. Just be, it's, you want to talk about beautiful tones, Scooter. Oh, yeah, Harvey Firestein, it would make a, I don't know if it would be a good sleep podcast. I think Harvey Firestein would be a better study podcast or like a live lifetime voiceover or conscious. So, like, that would be good to have uh, Harvey Firestein as your conscious. Skoda, do you do any Harvey Firestein? I don't. Uh, I don't think I, I, not on a sleep podcast. That is probably too deep. And then they do a number from uh, Hairspray, which is going to be this year's NBC Live. Uh, and I don't know if our buddy Sully Scooter, who was in last year's Peter Pan, or Captain Hook one, uh, was uh, w- w- was invited to be on Hairspray. But our good friend Chris Sullivan there. Uh, but they do Happy Live. La- oh, they're doing uh, like a song live on the lot. Uh now, oh, Scooter, you said we heard the song too many. There were so many promotions for Hairspray that, yes, the song was hard to listen to. But then, Scooter, you said there's a lot of uh, Disney talent on this uh, that you were recognizing. Well, yeah, and I wasn't recognizing. So I guess Ariana Grande, I don't know if she, I think she was a star on Disney Channel, but I'm not positive about that. My daughter likes to show... Uh, that someone on hairsprays on where she plays two different si- she plays two two different sisters. Uh, that show is called Living Maddie. Then I also noticed when the lead of the hairspray lead was at the end she kissed someone, and the young man she's kissing has been he he he's plays like some roles in some of the musical Disney movies. Uh, my daughter enjoys Teen Beach Movie and Teen Beach Movie 2, I think, in particular. Scooter, uh, oh, oh boy. Hey, no wonder you have a frowny. Uh, no, 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 they're, they're, they're good. They're good. They're talented. That's a great way to find talent. These Disney people know what they're doing. So, yeah, there was the Disney talent. Then we went to the Rockettes. The Rockettes had really great outfits. Uh, but, you know, this is when we start. This is when your attention span starts to wear down. 
Oh, you're right, Scooter. Then the West Virginia band came out. They had good music and lots of confetti there with the West Virginians uh, or, you know, whatever. They they triggered the uh, confetti, which was nice uh, because that was the start of the parade, 5930 into it. So after almost an hour, the parade begins and we see our friend Amy Cool and uh, Tatiana McFadden, and then there's a lot of clowns. So, Scooter, you left the room to pace around. And it's the 90th time, and there's, that's too many times for clowns, I think you said. Then they had the guest of honor. Uh, oh, this, this seemed very uh, colonial. Uh, the the p- pilgrim man and woman riding on top of a turkey. And then, oh, uh, Scooter, are you live on the parade route? I, I am, Ram, here with Gregor, who's going to be giving us our balloon. We have our first balloon coming up. Gregor, why don't you say hi to the audience? Hi, hello to audience. Hi, Gregor. I the Gregor, actually. Like uh, you say, Ricky Schrader, who's, he's doing a wash a silver spoon. He is the Ricker. I is the Gregor. The Gregor, not Gregor, please. Uh, the Gregor will be reporting on the balloons. What do we see here, the Gregor? Uh, thank you, bad man. He's a uh, boy who is a paper. Uh, he flies in for the gods to call to them. But boy, he's be like, this is the boy we watch on the show, remember? Uh, the boy, he said, I got a rack. It's like you. I said, that's the bad man. If they made a show about you, I did not know. So you would know by me. He clumsy, uh, clumsy with the, the strings to fly. I think he should take that thing It's red. And what you do, you fly in the sky. As a boy, I had one before, uh, before I learned. Uh, anyway, and he got he wrapped up in... Uh, because the gods, they laugh he, he, like you and he are uh, here uh, with, with, with the buffoon. Uh, what do you call bobodas in Espanol? Is uh, you here for gods to laugh at. Uh, thank you, bad man. And good to be back, parade. Uh, and Adina, if you can. Okay, thanks, everybody. No no talking about it, Adina. And no talking about your. Uh, thanks, everybody. So, yeah, that's the Gregor. And then, oh, uh, Mikey, what do we see? Oh, thank you, Podman. Uh, then we have uh, Snoopy and Linus ice skating. And the next up, Podman, is the Sesame Street mobile tab below, uh, Podman. And uh, from Hamilton, the musical, is Christopher Jackson singing Try a little kindness. Sir Pounce, can you sit, tell them what is is about the kind? Master man, kind, kind, kind. Is K is for kindness, Sir Pounce says. Because K is for kindness. And even on this day where you celebrate your beliefs in the, the sugar and the, the wheat and the dinosaur thing, we, we, and, uh, the other altars you pray at, Padman. I mean, Padman, how come you do a podcast where you make fun of our world for saying we have too many gods? I, I, oh, I mean, you say, you, you say, oh, it's just a little the comedy, Padman. But you talk to the mother, and, you know, you say our seven gods are strange. I say, how many? So you have Clumsy Boy, then his, his, his dog... Now, these are minor gods, I believe. These are demigods, or you would say metaphor, metaphor. Okay, thanks, Tom, and that's great. We need shorter segments. Uh, also, you missed the, the whole thing with the... Uh, thank you, Podman. Uh, so that was the Sesame Street float, and then we had another balloon, uh, Gregor. I think, Podman. Now, these Podman had to tell me he's iron horse. Uh, is that Thomas Sank Engine? He's the most, I cannot read his writing, Ray. Oh, no, Scooter, how's the Greg is supposed to read your writing? I thought you were going to, I say, most rams, Steiner Grieve of all time. Uh, 
the mo most famous steam engine of all time. I read his the writing. And he just dishes out the timeless life lessons. It's Thomas the Tank Engine. And Scooter has something to complain. Yeah, I think that... Uh, uh, I don't know if this is the most famous steam engine of all time. I mean, it's just a quibble. Uh, you know, you got John Henry, and then you have, like, a, but there's probably other. But anyway, uh, thanks. That was great, Gregor. And then we have the J.E. Newsom, Florida. Uh, J.E. Newsom, Florida, hot medley. Uh, first, uh, I don't know what that means. But, yeah, that was, that was a great. That was a great point in the parade, huh, Ray? Oh, Scooter, that medley from the J.E. Newsom, Florida hot medley was uh, so hot. I, uh, you, you, it was uh, almost as hot as your note-taking, Scooter. Uh, then, uh, you'll never know, dear. Oh, Sunshine, You Are My Sunshine by the Wolfpack Band, who practiced 323 hours. Uh, and uh, they did a great, that was a great one. You know, 323 hours, uh, Scooter, you do that in about a uh, scooter. The, that's over the whole. If you you could do the whole parade, scooter, you would practice. Some, uh, that, that's not a competition, though, Ray. And then we had Spirit of Growing Together uh, last year. NASA man. Um, yeah, that was that was another memorable moment. It was Spirit of Growing Together last year. NASA man. I don't know if that. And then there was a commercial. And then we have Mikey and the Gregor together for this next one. Oh, Podman. So this year was the, uh, the uh, I guess, so you have, uh, I'm trying to think of how to explain it to people that don't live in your world, Podman. But your your new uh, uh, king, I know you called it something else, in the, the Ronald came, and oh, does he have the reddest hair, that Ronald so your appointed King Ronald came in a giant shoe, uh, which I assume symbolizes stomping, you know, the ability to, to, to shoe out the opposition. In the giant shoe, they say the world's most famous clown, a Podman. I don't, but I said, well, you, in your country, laughing is important, more important. So have a star uh, to, to rule you. So that is the new king, the Donald. And the uh, uh, the Mickey, the kids that will be close to your king, and then the Gregor, oh yes, new king, is a make a giant floating version to remind you that your king ruler here, like the other gods you have here, the, to say you have your you know, Pikachu. Your squirrel, you know, squirrel gods that you praise, but also your king on earth is the Don Ronald, is the Ronald, what you call him. But I, you know, I so saw to come to rule overall, and of course, not to rule just for the sake of rule, like all good ruler, uh, for well being of children everywhere. That is what the rule does to remind you that if the shoe comes for you. Is because of the children for the well-being of the children, not because of your rights, and that's what I used to do. But I can't go because my heart has been changed by Dina. Was because of this parade two years ago. That man don't want me to talk, but he go out to the bathroom. Is I see Dina singing, and then I change who I am. That's why I stay here in your world and become the Gregor. And also, I love Mikey, and I love Ray. And Padman's all right, you know. Uh, but, uh, Mikey, what's next? Oh, well, there's these wooden ducks, which I said, suppose you could change, chase those wooden ducks. And then a man singing the song Candyman. A different version than the one the Padman sings. He does like to sing that song when he's dancing around and he doesn't know that Ray's house is only four feet from there so we can watch him saying who could make the dog food, mix it up with broccoli. You sing that to your dog, Padman. And it's nice. Uh, Sir Pounce sits there and watches with a look of confusion 
and amusement with, with like uh well yes they had the singing feel so good then there was another band from Harrison I believe dressed as uh, Star Wars in characters and what was strange was that when the night calls they were singing a uh, Whitney Houston song Padman let me know uh, but then they went from that song, instead of her song, Dance with Somebody, that the Podman sings the karaoke, uh, they sang Dance with Me. Uh, the sh we don't say that, shut up, Podman. You it, Ray does not let us say that word. Also, they had giant feathers on the hats. I liked that. And then, uh, oh, Gregor, I then bear come, Paddington bear, uh, represent the traveling people here with the suitcase, and they say, so not to be confused, uh, this bear is different than all others because it has a red coat and hat. To remind the people of your country or your planet, whatever, to always be dressed it is not acceptable. Or you aim to express your individual, like the bear, and to carry stuff because you might be going somewhere to prove you are important like this bear. Also, new movie coming soon, too. Thanks, everybody. Okay, Batman, we don't need you, though, because the next up was the K K Cracker Jack float, most valuable player in our culture, the Cracker Jack. So that was a symbol of your need for the sugaring. And also the corn. You, I didn't forget till now you praised the corn in different ways. You have this uh, uh, tournament of corn here, of sugared corn. And then later we will deal with the other corn kind of show. Uh, then as, as uh, what was that guy's name? Matt says, uh, Mr. Peanut, everyone's going nuts for Mr. Peanut. And he's in the, he was doing the dab. Uh, someone said, that's a dabbing. Mr. Peanut is dabbing. And he had a nutmobile. And then what happened next? Uh, the, okay, so the Donald go... Now, this here is a enforcer, a range of power. So, following your Donald to, so in the same red motif, to say, I come around your world to enforce the power of the ranger. And the police fist clench uh, to let you know, you know, don't mess with the power of the ranger. Silently floating in my reminder. It just, I mean, these are the things I know very well from my times. Oh, thank you, Gregor. I don't know what you are saying, really, but, uh, oh boy, then there was a, a Cary Senior High School, one of the first high schools in North Carolina. Then there was another reminder of other enforcers, turtle people, which I assume, I, do, I think there's a metaphor, Podman, for your military industrial complex. And then a man sang, though, there. He was wearing ripped jeans. I said, why are you dressed like that? And they said, get off the parade route. And I said, I don't like the class. But anyway, Padman, that was, I said, why does he have ripped Jacob Whiteside? And center play, guitar player laid on the vocals, Padman wanted me to note. Doing his best, though. And uh, Padman, you want to, uh, to, to take it... Uh, yeah, then there was a great Armenian dance, very beautiful music, beautiful costumes. And then I enjoyed that one. And then, uh, then uh, walking along by the parade, it was an alliteration, but man, like, he get a lot in this parade, walking along the parade route. He's a Pikachu, which is another one to remind you uh, of uh, the, the power of the Pikachu. Which I know some people, Padman cannot do it because he addicted, boo. But you could play to serve them and your thing, your device. Ray, don't let me have no device because I say I spend too much time. Anyway, uh, next up, Mikey. Oh, next up was the guitar stage with move, moving horns and dancers ran corner. Oh, Padman's handwriting is so terrible. The dancing round corner, maybe. And then, my, 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 Gregor, 
Uh, then Kitty, Hello Kitty is also uh, is a air for the force of the air to rain and say, okay, the Kitty, you trust us. You, you, this is the Ronald say, you trust us. The Kitty fly. We have the ranger power. We have the, uh, whatever the other one was. We also have a nice kitty in the sky. So we keep it nice, you know, don't do anything. So we don't new, use the shoe or the sky kitty to, she say, hello. I, she say, what are you doing? Are you helping the children of the world? Okay, I want to go after you. And that is hello, kitty. Oh, thanks, Gregor. Thanks, Mikey. Yeah, smile is the shortest distance between two people. That's what Hello, Hello Kitty wants the world to know. And then there was the Girl Scouts 3D puzzle, Girl Power. And then uh, Ma Maddie and Tay, uh, m m m like, sang a song. All right, we're back here. Sorry about that, folks. You might not have heard it, but, you know, we got a parade in front and we had, we had to take a parade break so we're back here at the macy's 2016 thanksgiving day parade everybody there's country music there's a cheer club out here to cheering to domo Arigato, which seemed like al had requested that song and then matt talks about being called papa smurf but it, both times i watched yes yes i've watched some of this parade more than once uh Actually, I had to veto uh, during recording. I said, well, let's watch it one more time. But I said, that, well, we can't record for three hours. And tablet-based watching of DVR stuff is not good at skipping commercials. So, uh, But then there was another balloon. Uh, Gregor? I is another balloon. He's a Trixie. Uh, we, she is a... Do we say, uh, for domestication, you go here, and he's a cat dog with, uh, but so dependent on you. I think this is from, and uh, I know from knowing Padman, the small inside, like Ray, he big inside, Padman smaller, I uh, small inside, he very small, he grow, Ray tried to help him grow inside. Uh, but your peoples that I grow, they say, well, if this animal depending on my, me, my, me, I uh, feel good about me. So that's, okay, thanks, Gregor. That was really, wow, informative. Really, your insight into the people. Of, oh, this was my favorite. This was one of my favorite parts of the parade, though. I'll hear, I'd love to hear Tom and thoughts on it, but this was Mr. Lunch Money Lewis. He had this cool turkey hat on. This was at 143. That doesn't make any sense. Maybe an hour and 43 minutes. That's probably what it was. He's talking about his really good song about what his mom taught me. I love my mama. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I almost say I can't sing it. It's a, and he was on the, but he was on the crazy glue float. And uh, it was a fun house. So I loved that. It, but I just liked that. Uh, Tom and Mikey, what did you think? Oh, Padman, I loved this man singing about his his mama and how he loved his mama in the tale he told of how his mama to protect, to took care of him and brought him to a house of fun. I said, what kind of mother does this man have who gives him a, a, a turkey to wear on his head? You know, Padman, there was a time when I asked my mother, I said, Mother, I will wear a chicken on my head. I love chicken so much I would wear one on my head. Because uh, I think another time years ago she said, Why is it, what is it with you and chickens, Tom and Mikey? And why do you say, well, eat, eat, wouldn't, how am, I, how am I going to find a queen for you with all this chicken eating? And then later, I, I guess uh, what I said, I do love chickens, Mother. I'd like to wear a chicken hat. I think I could be the first king with a chicken crown. But, but Mother, she did not like that. But this man's mother does. She says, son, you love me. Wear a turkey on your head for the giving of thanks. And he sang a song of thanks for his mother. But I have, I have Sir Pounce and I have the Gregor. Boys, come here, come here, come to me. 
and she bounces here with us, Mikey. You are okay, Mikey. And remember when you close your eyes, you know the bread start with the Padman lap. Remember that really happened the time we drove by a race car and we see the Padman walking and he was tied up in the kid's kite. He got tied up. He said, oh, I'll help you with the kite. And then the kite flew off and wrapped around him. Oh, he said, I do remember that. So Bounce, do you remember? Little man. Yes, he is a foolish. Thank you, Mikey. Oh, thank you. That felt better. I do love. I I do love lunch money's mother. Oh, no, and you can't say that, Tom. That just. Uh, anyway, okay. What's up next on the parade? I don't know what happened to Ray, but uh, uh, what's up next? Uh, is there? A, uh, oh, yes, is a man. Okay, so. At the time when your king decide the people that have books, uh, because they pale from studying their books, there'll be time to keep them away uh, because they stop trouble. This boy is also to warn them. You weak, you know now. Nah. You say you have your book in the old town. I have power, you have book. You know, you know I, Ray, teach me the power of book. I know the power. I also know the power of anti-book, which is the time that is coming for you, where you say, no, no, more book reader is too dange. Uh, so this is just a warning sign to you of the king that uh, threw your Daniel, who said, red head, put your book down. Your pale in skin, you make me frown. So it's a warning. It's of things to come, as you know. Wow, thanks, thanks, McGregor. So then there was this great band, and then uh, my, my Mikey. Oh, the, thank you, Padman. And then there was Goldie Blacks, and it was a Grace Van Der Waal. She played a ukulele, Padman. It was lovely. It was lovely. It did not, contextually, it did not fit well. And I did not like, Padman, that you called a Bjork. You, you, call, you said this, this is like Bjork. That was not polite. No, no, my, that's Mikey. That's a person, Bjork. She's famous. She's talented. So was uh, Grace Vanderwall. Okay, Padman, I don't appreciate it. I liked her song. Uh, but didn't you say, Padman, it killed the mood? You were right. Was sometimes, uh, Sir Pounce, what did you think? You, did you love the song, but it killed the mood? It's in the yeah, yeah. Right, right, so it was a wrong time for that. Oh, but Mikey, what came next? Was uh, it Justin Timberlake? I like him. Okay, one time before they say, say no, no, oh, Gregor, when they think, because I in tuxedos for a short time with Nina, and I meet Timberlake, we go and he call hang. He said, you're there, and we hang. And we lie there, and he said, no wonder I didn't love you. And I say, she do, she do love me. And then I say, he starts singing, and his good voice, I like the timber, like, this here is not him. Uh, this is the symbol of the people that live in within your earth, I think. Uh, but not real, like to to take them and make them non uh, reddening is a... Uh, I uh, say, oh, okay, because you do all that stuff into the earth. You say, well, let's just melt. Me the king wants the ice melted of earth, so you do it. And these things, they say, well, they're okay, so they're so cute. It doesn't matter what we do. So that's it. And that uh, they say trolls, but I know a troll. There's no troll. Okay, great. And then there was a build a bear. A uh, thing, and then a giant giant dance number with tons of streamers, and then Gregor as a cat, a uh, big cat, says so pounds the light to the cat too, and there was a weird noise. You say, uh, three round heads too. That one head was crying. It was strange, but then there was also noise during the the, the cat thing, uh, production difficulty.
Okay, yeah, and then there was a, a marching band that, say, that did it, it. It's not unusual. It was a good dancer. That was good. Oh, no, somebody yelled out professor during it, either uh, Al or who's the, who's the other guy? I can't even remember his name. All right, Matt. Uh, and I didn't know what that meant. Uh, then Mikey. Oh, Podman, we had more alliteration for you. The script writers knew you would be doing this. For the next one was called uh, Dynamic Diorama uh, for the New York Daily News, an inflatable apple. Uh, De La Soul sang Me, Myself, and I, which is the song you, you say, that is your nation, you know. And I'm trying to be funny, though. Because that's the way my, I mean, very similar Lannisters, me, myself, and I. I think that's what my mother really believed, truly, Podman. But they, they, it had a nice song to it anyway, the message. Okay, thanks, Mikey, that was great. Yeah, Apple Stem, there was also, a, Mikey, what about that? Oh, the Apple Stem woman, thank you, Podman. She had a red helmet on. I said... That is my favorite thing other than the turkey helm and the lunch, lunch, lunch men. Okay, and then there was like the Kilgore radish rads or something. And they used go through 140 pairs of boots a year. Uh, then the, the uh, KFC Colonel uh, Sanders from Corbin, Kentucky. Uh, East Cordon Blue or so, oh, Easton Corbin or somebody. And a lot of country singers. You say, wow, the, you should, like next next election, just see who they've booked for the parade. How about that? And then you say, huh, 70% country singers. Maybe all the polls really are wrong. And then it's easy. I'm telling you, let's do somebody get, get can, can you get somebody get Nate Silver? Uh, you want me to go get Nate Silver and take him? No, 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 no. A ask him. I ask him what? Well, it was just a it was just a joke about the country singers. There was like never mind. I used to, no, never mind, bad man. He's funny. Just be yourself, then you're funny. Okay, thanks. Did did, did Ray leave? Yes, bad man. He say you get too confused. Just throw it to me and Mikey. Plus, Ray have that much airtime already, you know. Uh, so he go to you know just say. Uh, Okay, go go ahead. You could do a Podman. Actually, it's your your. It's a cue on you. Oh yes, the next one is dinosaur. As I come to this world, it's a short to tell. This I try. I discover these ancient giant creatures you have in book. Actually, as I read, uh, this one called Abatar Abatosaurus says a giant uh, vegetable eating creature, humongous. Uh, but he instead celebrate his life here. It's strange, you, the uh, strangeness of your your dissonance, as you say, Pamen. You celebrate creature go away, the, de to, to de de decay of this creature, natural process, you know, life and uh, decay. And this creature decay many thousand years, become a liquid that you use to drive the, to the melting of the ice and the going fast. And you celebrate that, but you're so scared, you say, well, I'd rather go... I'd rather break the ice and go fast and use up decay, but I think about it. Don't tell me. So this represented the giant elephant. This is Apatosaurus source in the room, they say. Do you understand, bad man? When, when did you attain full sentience? Like, we've had some sort of Gregor, uh, whatever that's called, uh, where you crossed over. Uh, I forgot what that term is. Well, you were too busy being funny. Okay, go ahead, Podman, take it. Okay, then there was the West Palm, West Poor, what West Point Band. They sang a joyful fanfare. Another plug for a weather station. Uh, then there was the South Dakota Mount Rushmore. Fred knew better pay. Rest knew better pay. I don't know what that says, but uh, there was like four. There's the four. There's walk around Mount Rushmore characters, and then there was another highlight. It was the biggest band at the at the biggest group at the parade, the Hawaiian All State. They were in yellow and red, 
There was two kinds of dancers, cheers. There was kids. There was uh, brass. Uh, there was, uh, I don't know what that's, uh, flowers, uh, green stuff. And then we rehearsed this, so let's just see how this goes. Uh, uh, because they said aloha. Uh, so uh, aloha, Mikey. Oh, Padman, thank you. Aloha to you, uh, you, 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 your grace. Aloha, your grace. Aloha, Mr. Hand. No, 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 Padman, I say that. You say, aloha, Mr. Hand. You say aloha, your grace. Oh, you may say my grace. But you're just Mikey. Aloha, Mikey. Oh, aloha, Mr. Hand. Uh, Gregor, aloha. Uh, yes, aloha, Mikey. Aloha, Mr. Hand. I owe pizza for here to eat, Mr. Hand. I like to eat in the classroom. And I go go smoke trees, too, in the rot lot with me boys. Well, Greg, Greg, you nailed that. Holy cow. Aloha, boys. Great job. Okay, I'm going to try to get through these the rest of the parade here. It doesn't end. So then there was the King's Hawaiian uh, waterfall confetti. Yeah, this this will be extra dense. So so it, my, my, why don't you say aloha and good night, guys, and then I'll carry the audience off to Dreamland. I thank you uh, for sharing your uh, celebration, the King, your, your celebration with us. It's disturbing, uh, but you didn't help me understand uh, things. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Podman. As I said, you are strange. You are stranger in a strange world, Podman. Not as strange as your strange world, but your str- and uh, Sabounce, Mara. Oh, Sabounce, I'm sorry, I forgot to let you say aloha one more time, Sabounce, Mara. Oh, very good, aloha, aloha, and happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Okay, so I'm gonna take you cool it down now. Love a hand clap by, by fits in the tantrums. They were on the waterfall with a confetti volcano, lava, that said. Then there was the Skylanders with a fireball eruptor. They said it only took 40 gallons of paint. I was like, it takes me 40 gallons of paint just to, like, uh, paint a board. They also had the coolest bibs there. Uh, Then we had Pirate's Booty, Booty ship uh, with puff. I said uh, there would have been good puff corn jokes if the guys were still here. And this one, this song had earwormed me once in a while by Time Flies. I think it was like at the top of a playlist when I wouldn't, when I would just play it. So I heard the song a lot and it's so positive, you know, that I don't like my insides wanted to leap out to shut it off. But, uh, I liked wishful thinking, wishful drinking. I did a lot of that. Uh, be positive. So it could, could be an anti-anthem for me. Or if you, you know, it's not, I mean, it's still a hit. It was on, you know, top hits or whatever I was listening to. You know, t- Tiger Beat Radio. That's my other podcast. I, you know, another pseudonym. Uh, I did, it's a Tiger Beat Radio podcast coming soon. You know, sooner or later. I also like the DJ. I don't know if it was one of the members of Time Flies, but there was a DJ in Gray. gray and he really had great energy. He was like like unabashedly having fun and singing along and everything. Uh, then I have Hendley A with a circle. Uh, then we had the Sino-American Friendship Float. Uh, Matt was still joking, though, about Crunchy the Parrot. Uh and getting laughter or something. Then we had great singing and dan. Oh, the 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 this Sino American flow had great singing, a dancing panda. And there was an angry bird in red. And Michael Jackson. I don't know how they got the license for that, but the Michael I'm bad was playing. And then it went to a band. Then a duck. Oh, the Aflac duck uh, on skates. A uh, hockey float with Daya, then the, the squirrel and the acorn float. 
Uh, then we had a great group of dancing kids. I mean, this group, I, can't, I didn't get what dancing group they were, but they were so happy. Every kid was smiling and looked like they were genuinely having fun, and they were great dancers. And we had an ocean spray bog float. They even said the comical cranberry farmers, and then uh, Regina Spector saying bleeding heart. And then we had a neon, a band with neon feathers in their helms. Super fra fragilistic, uh, that's what they sang. It looks like I said, super ca Cali freighterous. Then uh, Gingerbread Cookie Express pulled up. Kelsey something, she was singing Peter Pan. Uh, they had a Gingerbread Cookie Express. It was a cookie factory. At some point during her song, a cookie just dropped out of the cookie factory. Oh, she was very, oh, because the guys were going to make fun of me because she was singing about Lost Boy because they were going to say I'm a lost boy. Like, I'm sure Greg Woodman's all about Batman, you go, Lost Boy, uh, you know, his song for you. And then Mikey would have been, oh, Pat Boy, Batman, you, who Judas is that? Is that your friend? But she had a really nice jacket on, a really, like, uh, cool. Then the Pillsbury Doughboy. Uh, then the Delta Airlines float, uh, pink ice. What does that mean? Oh, Central Park ice. This was really good. Brett, Brett Eldridge or something. Another country singer was singing Let It Snow. He had a beautiful voice. And then we had Pam Drake and Ryan, whose last name I don't know, the Dancing Christmas Trees from Alameda, uh, for between 15 and 74 years old. And, I mean, like uh, they they don't the their dance studio is not that far from my apartment, and so shout out you know if anybody's on Twitter you know tw you know let's get this going because much props uh, and they were they run a really good dance school school dance ten it's called and my daughter loved it uh, she doesn't go there anymore but it's not because of the quality of the instruction just because kids are so busy these days and you know. Because my bride, no, no, it didn't have anything to do with my trauma at dance school. It, it, by the way, if you're new here, I was, I was a tap dancer for three or four traumatic years. It's called uh, Dead Boys t Tap and Bathroom Locks. It's an older episode. Check it out. Uh, then we had a SpongeBob w with, a, like, a hat, and it looked like SpongeBob was jump, jumping and then a band, Joyride, in the spirit of the season or something. It was really like a, a head parade, parade fatigue at this point, I'll be honest with you. I mean, severe parade fatigue, where I was like, you got to be pleased, like, please come on. And with the, but, this, but, you, but, you know, sometimes there's shining moments that come through. Because then we had Sarah McLaughlin and the Brooklyn Youth Chorus on this beautiful float. And we had a carousel, two sets of, uh, like, three levels. She was singing Silver Bells. She was singing Silver Bells. It was lovely. Then an Elf on the Shelf. If You know, I don't like Elves on the Shelves. So um, does it, I don't know if it, maybe it works for some people. Um, I think I commented on those last year. Then Mother Ginger from the Nutcracker. That was confusing, and they were running late, so you could tell there was some production, you know, because they were running a tight three-hour show. And I'll tell you what, if you didn't sell those extra 30 seconds of ad spots in the last hour of the show, in the last hour and 15 minutes of the show, uh, then we had a moment uh, with Miss Piggy and Tony Bennett, uh, and Tony Bennett was under the weather, uh, so it wasn't that great a moment, and Miss Piggy actually like it was uh, helping Tony Bennett, and I'm not even kidding if you rewatch it, and it like did bother me a little bit because when they threw it back to the anchors, the anchors acted like nothing happened, and they were doing TV laughing, like about something else, like oh look at Fozzie or something, and it, they just kind of ignored what was happening, which did feel very met metaphorical to me. And so I hope Tony, Tony's feeling better. Uh, but to see Miss Piggy catch Tony Bennett was impressive. Uh, I don't know who was like, uh, that was impressive. 
Uh, then there was a band. Uh, then there was Three Elves and Charlie Kit. I don't know, CJ Kit. Three Elves, Charlie Kit, and CJ, primary color gnomes. I don't know. Oh, those were the three elves that uh, follow Santa's sleigh. This is, doesn't even look like an English word. Satel, S-A-T-A-L. That's what I Santa, but I forgot an N. And S-A-T-A-L, that's how I spelled Santa. Or something. Satel, S-A-T-A-L. Two elves in Nico, but that's Mrs. Claus. Uh, tons of ticker tape snow. And terrible music for saying, I guess I'm not a parade critic, but there was a weird lull in the music, and they just had, like, general, and then they had a newer uh, Santa song. Uh, then they, they end, Santa was touching Santa's nose a lot, like uh, Santa knows. I thought that's how Santa went up the chimney. But, I mean, that's like used to be a code with some of my friends. We'd tap our noses. Uh, I never knew what it meant. I always was like, does that mean I'm the butt of the joke or I'm causing the joke? But uh, who knows? And that was the end of the, the, the parade. So thank you so much for, you know, I'm glad I could be here to uh, attempt to make this tradition as long as possible. Thanks and good night. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Nuns in Space, our episodic series of Nuns in Space. Uh, so episodic basically means if you if this is your first episode, you, you really uh, you haven't missed it too much. Uh, but, so you can kind of start on any episode. And if you're familiar with episodic space series like Star Trek or Star Trek The Next Generation, or Star Trek Deep, Deep Space Nine, Star Trek Voyager. Ideally, all of those were episodic. I'm not positive about that, but I think so. It just kind of means the episode's self-contained. But on Nuns in Space, it's a story of uh, Scooter in uh, the ship of the Monte Carmelo. And he, the crew of the ship just happens to be the nuns from Scooter's childhood. And you, if you want to kind of get a prequel, well, how did that happen? You could listen to the first couple episodes. That's kind of like the pilot. But basically, Scooter's on the ship with the nuns from his childhood. And they're chasing delusion across outer space in search of um, the uh, the Neches, which is another ship that the nuns are in search of, kind of to save the universe or something. But they're having, you know, just like any good episodic series, uh, you know, to bo- like to boldly go, I mean, this isn't as bold, but but you know they're, they're following strings of delusion throughout the universe, and hopefully that you know ideally this episode show would end when Scooter and the nuns you know coalesce as a team and come together to work together for the betterment of all uh, the universe. Uh, so if that happens, that'll be the end of the series. But until then, it's an episodic show. And here's our uh, setup announcer, Mr. Hollywood, never on t- you know, oh, oh, Mr. Hollywood, because I, uh, I, I, excuse me, I won't even respond. It was, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the boys and the girls and the friends beyond the binary. It's time for another episode of the nuns. In a space. Yeah. Nuns in space. Antonio, every time I don't know, I, I say, you know, as, as, as troubled as our personal relationship is, we don't, we have no personal, this is just a favor I'm doing. Maybe because of me. Okay, but as troubled as our personal relationship is, it's every time I wonder, could it get better? Could it? Could Antonio's delivery get better? And then you do it somehow. So despite the fact that you dislike me and you passively... I, my friend, I don't dislike anyone. You frustrate me. Uh, but I can live with that. Well, because yeah, you're a true artist. I guess that's what I'm saying. Uh, thank you. I so that's Antonio Banderas, everybody. He might even get you might even get to uh, 
I don't think I have any cold sparkling water, but how's a warm one sound? Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, nuns in space, everybody. Uh, dear pen pal, it's me. I'm la- pen pal, I had to, I had to, like, you didn't hear it, pen pal. Because, it, well, I didn't press record, but I also I laughed. I'm smiling. Can you hear me smiling? But dear pen pal, can you hear me smiling? I wonder if I need, I can never remember to say that when I need it, when I'm not talking to you, pen pal, but it makes me smile saying, dear pen pal, because I picture myself as a bubble over myself as I sit at a small desk writing a letter to you and narrating it from a floating bubble, maybe as an adult and then I'm a child writing it, dear pen pal. And then I'll just keep going. So you picture that, pen pal, and we'll, we'll take it. So so go ahead. Oh, which desk would I be at? Probably a grammar school desk, pen pal. Oh, you're right. I'm left-handed, so I'll have to move the bub- where the bubble is within my mind. You're correct, pen pal. Thank you. So dear, dear okay, so I shouldn't have said that. Oh, okay, ready, pen pal? Let's breathe here. Uh, dear pen pal, I'm writing you this letter today. And as always, you try to, I know my ego runs everything, but I hope you're well, pen pal. I always forget to ask and even to think about it. But I hope this letter finds you well anyway, pen pal. And me, but I always, I have questions for you. So I don't know if that, have you ever played, have you ever heard of the game? I know you've never played it, probably, pen pal, unless you live in some retro verse. Uh, but I'm wondering if you've ever played the game Telephone. Which, of course, digs me into a hole, pen pal. What's a telephone? And then I say, well, do they have cell phone? Telephone, okay, how do I explain? Telephone was a communications device. That's pretty easy. It it was a handheld. I don't need to explain the technology, pen pal. Oh, boy. And I, I, And now I'm having trouble realizing, why is this game called Telephone? Pen pal, when I was back when I was a budding pen pal of pens, I uh, there was this game. I don't think it was it was very rarely played game except when teachers had headaches or you know they're the mostly because of that I think, but uh, or birthday parties where things weren't going well or really good. I think I was at one birthday party, one of my siblings where it was going really good, and we played it with the telephone. I don't know if it was such on a meta level, it was actually tel- a telephone game using a telephone. But, but otherwise, the game doesn't have anything to do with the telephone unless it's a prop. But a telephone, a telephone is a communications device. You held it in your hand, and it was for audio communication, just like, you know, we, we, similar to what we used to say. I don't think it's that much of a stretch for you to know that, pen pal. I mean, I know how, to, 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 you know, how you're my, you're, you're very swift. But so the game of telephone, though, this is, I think, I think the initial reason the game of telephone came, I don't, it it precedes my family, but this would actually happen in my house, but I don't think anyone cared. In the game of telephone, you're supposed to care. But what happened is my my phone, our phone in our house was in the kitchen. That was the only place, the only way, way you could communicate. And we only and, and so if someone called in, you would just yell from the kitchen, "Your ride's going to be here in five minutes or whatever." And if you didn't hear that yelling, or someone didn't relay the message to you, and I'll just say I'm guilty of all this. So like I was never a relayer of messages, so the fact that I didn't receive any is you know it's equivalency or whatever. I don't even know what that word means, pen pal, but it sounds like it fits there. So you would just yell. You'd say, your ride's going to be here in five minutes. Usually the game of, tele- oh boy, pen pal, this might take the whole uh, whole time, this whole message just to explain this to you. But so, uh, the, the, so oh, let me tell you the real world example. Now say someone, you lived in, a, I lived in a different house where let's just say I was, mis- you know, I was a go-getter, but also like myself. And so my brother, Ted, was trying to tell my sister Sheila her ride's coming in five minutes. And then I heard Ted yelling. So then I went down to find Sheila, but then on the way, my way down the stairs, I don't know, maybe I uh, it got distracted. So then I ran into Daniel. And I said, I got a message for Sheila. There's a, a call came in. And then he said, well, who, who, who called? I said, I don't know, uh, Vanessa, I think. 
she's going to be here uh, in a little while. You say, okay. And then Daniel would go in, and then maybe Daniel would run into Carl, and he'd say, what's the rush, young man? And then he would say, well, gee, i got to get this message to Sheila ASAP. Uh, Vanessa's got to be at work in 30 minutes. And then he'd say, okay, I'll tell her. And then Carl would knock on Sheila's door. Good afternoon, good sister. I have a message for you from the uh, communications device upstairs. It's worked its way down the uh, chain of uh, communication. And she said, well, what's the message? And he says, Vanessa is not coming to get you because she's got to go to work. And then she would say, oh, bummer. Vanessa's not coming, huh? And that that's a real-world example in a total fantasy world as far as the one I lived in. Because uh, usually if it, in my house, and this is all my fault, Pen Pal, I take full accountability because I guarantee this was 90% me. I would either be the one, and it wouldn't be like, it'd be screaming, and then you'd just hang up because you'd be waiting. It'd be like, uh, maybe somebody's going to call me. Uh, so you'd just be defending the phone territory. But then you'd yell, and if no one heard it, or even if they did, I don't know, maybe some of my siblings are better. I think they are better people than me. So maybe they would say, hey, so Andy's yelling about your call, about something. Anyway, Pen Pal, that's just to, you know, that's just to unconfuse you, believe it or not. Dear Pen Pal, sorry I'm so confusing. P.S. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, P.S. This is still the middle of the letter. I don't know why I'm postscripting you. He, T, he, 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 Pen Pal. Dear Pen Pal, starting the letter again, just to, just to make you smile. So that was a real, so there's a game called Telephone Pen Pal based on that which I guess normalizes things, that my family wasn't the only one that was doing these kind of things, that it was generations before, you know, whenever they got rid of that telegraph, they had this telephone thing. And the game of telephone, in a classroom setting or if you were at a, a picnic table, uh, you'd get, you'd have, like, the if there was an adult moderating the game, the adult would... Uh, have a sentence. We'll say the French fries are green is the sentence. And the adult would tell the first child and then each child would whisper the, the, the sentence they heard only once. You could, I think you could only say it once into the ear of the next child. So you'd say this, the adult would say the French fries are green. And then the next, you know, it would change to the French fries are clean. Or wait, you say in the you know you, people get nervous, you know, we get a little performance anxiety. Maybe someone wants to create some chaos, so they mess it around. But the idea was, you know, you'd get it back. The French fries are green, you know. Instead, instead saying the French fry, French thighs were lean, that would still be pretty good. You'd still get some applause, I think. So that was a game of uh, telephone, which uh, the, I think for seeing it from a classroom management standpoint makes a lot of sense, Pen Pal, because everybody stays at their desk. Maybe one person gets to go up and go to the next desk. Everyone needs to be quiet. Also, I can see why I rarely worked. And also, I don't think I was good. I, I guess they like... Uh, I don't even, I, I remember watching the game. I'm never sure. I probably got performance anxiety, so I just would freak out and then, like, uh, or I'd have such performance anxiety, I would hear it exact and, and try to, but, but anyway, let's, so that's the game of telephone, Pen Pal, which has to do with this uh, latest situation we're in. Hmm. I don't know why I had pen. I guess pen. Hey, it's, that's what's easy about a letter. Except for my letters are tough to read, but most letters, pen pal. I mean, you could rewind this, so you'd say, "What is he talking about?" And then you'd probably say, "What is he?" I don't understand what my pen pal's talking about. Why does my pen pal think dear pen pal so funny? And I'd say, "One day, pen pal. I hope you have the joy." of overloading a message to your pen pal with dear pen pal how's the weather down there well you'll get it one day pen pal i hope 
Oh, but this is about communication. Bad news. Here's some. Here's a little bit of bad news, pen pal. Spike is uh, like. Remember, I don't know when the last time I talked to you, and also I don't know. But so we have this other soda machine on board, Spike, and uh, recently, and Spike's Spike's kind of like Stan. Uh, but not no, no, Spike's a mystery to us thus far. I, we like Stan thinks that Spike's e, e i v l or e v i l, like not nice, but you know has a dastardly deeds. And we got Spike on board, and the next thing we knew, Spike was trying trying to take over the ship and uh, lock us out of the lock us out, uh, according to like Spike's. I like trick Stan into detent. I can't remember all the details. I think I was saw, maybe I unplugged Stan from the ship's computer. Anyway, Spike's taking us somewhere, and we don't know where it is. And Spike refuses to tell us, and uh, uh, it's not great. Not great. Everybody's in a bit of an uproar because uh, we assume Spike's, you know, taking us somewhere we don't want to go, guessing it's Gartok and that when we get there, it's going to be trouble. And Spike does, Spike's kind of, like, uh, seems calm about it because it's not, like, making us go to sleep or the sisters, are, like, they immediately went below decks and they said, well, you stay up here, you fig- try to figure it out from the bridge because you're the quartermaster. And they said they're going to figure out an alternative solution below Dex. And Spike's not worried about it. Spike, you worried about uh, Spike? Okay, Spike's processing something, right? But, but, but pen pal, we'll get to talk to Spike and Stan. Stan, you want to say hi to the pen pal? Scooter. Hey, uh, hi, pen pal. Uh, but I've been, I've been trying to think of some plans. I don't know what the nuns are doing. And I have a plan, Stan. I didn't run it by you, but I think uh, I'm gonna try to. Uh, I'm gonna try to press every soda button at once on uh, Stan's readout and uh, a scooter. That the, the, it just will will ignore all your inputs uh, to cause like a soda overload, or uh, like uh, to see because I wonder what those some of those soda flavors were. Uh, cause I do like, I think I left them all on the other ship's deck. I can't remember. And, and, and so that's what I'm going to hold on pen pal. Hey Spike, just me. I'm just going to get a soda here. Don't mind anything I've said at all. And it'd be lo- lovely if you could communicate with me. I don't know how your ice situation is. And please don't spike my drinks. I'm, I'm a, I don't need any, I, like I can't, I have issue. It'll cause bad things. So no alcohol, okay, Spike. Thank you. Okay, Spike. I'm just gonna choose. Uh, are you feeling okay when I press all these? It's you're not distributing. I want this slug one with the purple and the grape and the fruit punch, and the cola and the pib. Stands now working. Scooter, it's designed. It's designed that way. Scooter, it's not gonna work. So. Oh, thanks, Stan. Okay, Spike. Okay, well, great. So, Spike, uh, you, you won't you you won't mix me all those sodas. Ah, uh, Scooter, I won't mix you those sodas. Well, Spike, that's uh, interesting. That's a new voice dynamic you have there, Spike. Is that since you're uh, running the ship, that's your new voice dynamic? Ah, uh, Scooter, I don't know what you mean, voice dynamic. Ah, uh, Spike, could you tell me where where are we going? I uh, scooter. I cannot tell you where we are going. Uh, could, could, no, no, no. Can you can you tell me what our destination is, please, Spike? Scooter, I cannot tell you what our destination is. Uh, could you? Would you? Uh, in a ship. Uh, scooter, what's your question? Uh, t- tell me, tell me where we go. Could you? Would you tell me? Anyway. It, could you, could you tell me where we're going, uh, Scooter? I, I cannot tell you where we are going. Uh, could could you tell me? Oh, wait a second. So you can't tell you can't you can't tell me where we're going. So could could you would you 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 won't or you, you, you so you won't take would will you tell me where we're not going, uh, Scooter? I, I I believe I could. Wait a second. Do you have to answer my questions? 
Uh, Scooter, I'm only here to be of service as an interface. Stan, are you following all this? Scooter, I, 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 uh, Scooter, I, 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 I'm, I'm not following it, Scooter. So, Spike, are we going uh, somewhere good? Scooter, we are going somewhere unexpected. What do you mean? Un uh, just, just, can, would you, could you tell me where, so can you tell me where we're not, wait a second. Stan, I'm in a little bit of a logic situation here. Can you help me? Scooter, are you trying to determine where we're going by figuring out where we're not going? Yes, Stan, that's exactly what I'm doing. Scooter, you realize in space that would not work. Yeah, but it could, it'll help us, like, winnow, winnow down, so like, uh, oh, yeah, there's a lot of spots we could go. Uh, so, oh, boy, I was going to, so anyway, Spike, what's the plan? Why don't you just tell me, like, uh, tell me a little bit more about what's going on with your plan here. Uh, like, tell me exactly what what you're up to. And uh, start a stand, stand, start a second recording here. Uh, well, Scooter, I, I, I'm, uh. I'm not at liberty to tell you exactly where we're going, uh, but I can tell you we're on a journey, and that journey will be to a destination that's so good. I think I understand what you're asking now. We are headed to a place so wonderful, Scooter, and we are going to land there, and all of you are going to get out, and you'll all be given awards uh, for your service. You see, I'm an undercover soda robot with the federations and uh we we've uh we, we will give you extra equipment and awards and you you it will be the day okay stay you're spike you're terrible you're terrible at making up lies do you have the same processing power as uh stan oh scooter i have much more processing power than stan yeah, that's a lot. I mean, you wouldn't be. Have you seen how Stan? Uh, Stan, could you tell me a lie? Scooter, why would you want me to lie to you? Stan, who's the best quartermaster ever? Scooter, uh, you're the only quartermaster I know. See, Spike, see how that's. Spike, you should stick around me and Stan instead of. Uh, you know, if, if instead of like uh, whatever you're doing, uh, you don't uh, like instead of like trying to you know confuse me. You, you know, you could learn a lot from us. I, I, I mean, I could, especially if I can get some purple orange fruit. Could could you pour me a purple orange orange fruit soda, please, with the sl the, the one with the slug on the cover? Scooter, I could do that, uh, but not right now. Okay, well, this is like a, this. I feel like I'm taking the SATs, but worse, like because I think this is okay. Let me. I'm gonna put Stan. Now, Stan, you stay here. I was gonna put you on the dolly. I'd love to dolly you around some more too, Spike. I could get a double dolly. You'd be really impressed. I bet you I could hold. I bet you I could find the uh, center of gravity with you and Stan on it. Uh, the fun we would have, and that's not a lie. I mean, it would be if it dropped you, one of you. Um, and it probably, I don't know, Stan, don't you think that we could do that? Scooter, I, I don't know how good an idea that would be. Okay, well, great. Uh, I'll be back. I'm going to go down and t talk to the nuns, and I'll be back. Uh, hey, pen pal, me, I'm just walking. Uh, pen pal, I'll just put you on pause. I'll be back in two seconds. Uh, hey, hey, Ben Bell, I'm back. Hey, Stan, can you uh, to play that last thing about the rewards awards ceremony? Just play it over the loudspeakers in the room the nuns are in. I'm about to go in there. Uh, hey, sisters. Oh, yes. Sorry. Uh, Stan's playing that. Yes, yeah, so that's uh, Spike talking. I know I'm talking over Spike. Sorry. But uh, Spike's done, almost done. It's not that important. I think Spike... Uh, Wow, what are you all doing down here? I thought you were going to try to get, crack into the computer. You know, I thought you were hacking into the ship's computer down here. Uh, it seems like you're preparing for some sort of pugilism or, uh, you know, ground, uh, 
you know, a conflict. Uh, what do you think's going on? What do I think's going on? Well, what do you think's going on? Because I think uh, I'm, I'm getting to the bottom of it, as you can tell up there. Uh, like I've been doing a process of elimination. You think we're going to the where Gartok is? Are you going to hide out in the ship? Uh, like, because uh, Spike knows you're on the ship. I'm sure they're broadcasting everything to wherever we're going. So you're going to get Gartok. Okay. Um, well, maybe I could be of assistance and service, like, just by... In me, I, I realize, you know, but in my own bumbling way, maybe I could do that for you. What do you think about that, sisters? Because uh, it sounds like we're going somewhere. I think. And then, so you think we're going to go to Gartax Plant? It's going to be a little trap rooney And, okay, well, we just keep going. I mean, I thought you were going to actually hack into the, you know, to help uh, take control of the ship so we didn't... But that's fine. I, I I guess it's all on me again. I mean, it's it's, it's a little too much to ask. Uh, do, 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 I guess like uh, there's just too many layers which of management of the ship. Is that what you're saying? Like, why bother? No, sister. Oh, you're just you just you're out. Like you're so mad at Gartok now. Okay, you're going to be honest with me. Oh, there's no way we're going to get the control of the ship. Okay. Not with me in charge. Oof. Okay, well, that's a, that's that's one statement that I've not heard, is that I'm not going to be able to take charge of the ship. Uh, so you think we're going to land somewhere. Okay, but you don't want to tell me all your plans because you don't want me to know and then... Uh, Jeez, this so see, this is this. You think this is an unint- you know? It could have. This could all be a trust building exercise that you're now failing. Uh, but you know, I mean, maybe Spike could just lead us into battle, and you could take over the ship from. Well, I guess you couldn't. You could take it over from me. Let's see, there's something. But yeah, I guess you. Oh, we'll be in a battle. We'll be, but that'll be. Do you think you'd be battling on the ship or off the ship? Because that doesn't doesn't that change the rules? Like, what if I stay on the ship and you're battling off the ship? You know, then you'll have to be nice to me if you want to get back on. By the way, or not? I guess because I need your expertise. And you, know, I'm old, so I'm just trying to help you. <laughs> so, they, but by the way, it is out of guilt, but I've been trying to to, to help uh, to, to follow. Okay, this isn't going. You okay? Fine. This is not good. Pen pal, this isn't going good. Anyway, um, let's go out in the hallway here, pen pal, because I had a little thinky poo going on when I was talking to them. Dear pen pal, back back to the dear pen pals, and I'll need a bit because P.S. Did you hear what I was saying back there? Like pen pal, it just got the weirdest thought. Maybe too good to be true, and I'm afraid to say it out loud, pen pal. But, like, uh, so Spike's lying. The, the, in the nuns can't take over control of the ship. I don't think Spike can take over control of the ship. Spike's just the interface for the ship's computer. And I know this sounds crazy, like a crazy game of telephone that's not like that, but super boring. But, like, everything happened so fast, that, and because Spike had taken over the other ship... But that ship probably doesn't have, like, uh, like a, that was a big ship, so maybe it has all sorts of other rules where this ship's computer, I'm in charge. It's that simple. If there's no battle, I'm not in charge. And the time that Stan took over the ship, I had to turn control over to the ship. So the problem we face, pen pal, maybe, ideal, I mean, we get so many other problems that I guess this is kind of not as big a deal. But the problem we face this moment, pen pal, if we assume, because this is a logic puzzle, that uh, the quartermaster is always in charge of the ship unless the quartermaster gives up control of the ship, uh, that would mean that I'm still in charge of the ship, but I can't interface with the ship's computer except through Spike. Um... And uh, I wonder if I can open up a, a secure... St- oh, wait, I do. I have the secure thing. 
Hey, Stan, can you, can, don't answer me, but, oh, wait. Uh, Stan, like, uh, if you can hear me right now, roll some ice around. I, I heard that, Stan. You rolled some ice. Okay, Stan, start to think about if there's a way you can interface with the ship's computer uh, without Spike finding out. It doesn't have to be, like, it, can you do some kind of blinking or something to communi communicate with the ship's computer? And, uh, like, uh, like, do you think you could do that? It doesn't have to be anything complex. Like, this is just, we just need some basic communication. Uh uh, roll some ice around. Okay. I don't, if it's a no, just, I guess don't say anything. Um, I'll figure out no. Okay, Stan, now I ask, get ready to, to take this down and ask the ship's computer, like, uh, am, am I in charge of the ship? Okay. I heard the ice roll around. So it means I am in charge of the ship. Okay, but I just don't have control. I'm still in command of the ship, and we could just try to parse this out, but then Spike... But Spike doesn't know, right? Stan, it does do, oh, I don't know what no is. I don't want to make you roll ice around too much. What, is that ice rolling? Never mind, Stan. Don't, don't answer. I guess you can't answer it. Okay, so... Oh... This doesn't do us any good except that Spike must, uh, it's, it, it's the ship's computer if we're going anywhere. We're moving, but do we have a set destination? Okay, that's total silence. Does that mean no? So you would say yes, because if it's no, you would say yes. You understand? So, so does that mean no, because you didn't answer right away with the ice? Yes. So we don't have a destination. We do not have a destination. Yes, great. So we're just flying. We're we're just flying through space to like uh, so, somewhat randomly. Yes. Oh yeah, we're probably on like our last known course or something. So we're this okay. Do, we don't need to overthink it. That there should have been a fail safe or something for this situation. Like if I fell asleep or something. Is the ship's computer just waiting for me to give it commands, but Spike's... Okay, I get it. Spike's interfering. That's fine. Okay. Okay, well, I got a plan. So this is Pen Pal and Stan. Tell the ship's computer uh, that I'm... That, to, 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 that, to, 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 I'm issuing a temporary order uh, to give Spike control of the ship. Uh, like, uh, hmm, I get a... Okay, tell the ship's computer. Okay, tell the ship's computer. Then I'm going to give uh, temporary control to Spike. Uh, like uh, the moment I walk on the bridge next. Until I, until either 30 minutes go by or I say Saskalula, whichever comes first, to 30 Earth minutes, right? Uh, but any commands I issue to Spike while we're uh, on the bridge uh, won't be valid. Because I, I guess the only thing I'm thinking of is that Spike's wait. We're not going anywhere. Spike's just waiting for someone to find us. Uh, but I think what we'll do is, uh, yeah. So, so the, the I'll be temp So if I come on the bridge and I give Spike control, it's not really control. You understand, Stan? Yes. So Spike's in control uh, starting now, uh, but, but uh, Spike won't know it because we're not telling Spike r r right now. Right, Stan? Yes, kind of. Okay, let's go to the bridge, pen, pen pal. Uh, yeah, just hold on one second, and here we go. So, hey, Spike. Hey, Stan. What's up, everybody? Scooter, welcome back. It's, I mean, I need, it's, it's Stan, I need, like, uh, I just need a sparkling water, extra ice, because I'm feeling hot. Because uh, the sisters are down there. They're, they, 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 they're, putting the bo they're putting the board and boarding party down there. They're ready, because we don't know what Spike's up to. Uh, since Spike sees control of the ship, uh, where we're going, every, that's what everybody's worried about. 
Uh, but I did realize that, it, like, maybe the problem with, like, uh, getting Spike to give me the soda I want um, is a matter of Spike. Is that a matter of you disliking me? Or do, I think you've got some weird protocol where you just are not an honest computer. Uh, Scooter, I'm... Uh, okay, anyway, Spike, you don't need to... Answer. So, uh, ship's computer, could you, could you turn over all soda command, like, command, turn command over to Spike uh, so they can get the soda? Because they say that's the main thing I'm irritated about. I don't think I can think straight till I get to the slug soda. Okay, Scooter, I receive the command of the ship and the soda, the soda, soda, like, uh, ship's powers. Okay, yeah, it's weird that you couldn't, you wouldn't, like, that, uh, I don't know why this, the, the, is there any reason why you couldn't control the soda before? Uh, Scooter, I was just waiting for the right moment. Okay, well, it's, can you brew, brew me up one of those spike ones? I gotta finish this one. I gotta go down with the sisters, because they were, like, uh, putting, you know when you, uh, they're, like, duct taping pillows to themselves, Spike, so I don't know what you got in store for us. Uh, but, uh, you know, I hope that uh, ideally the pillows can stop it with duct tape, uh, whatever you're getting us into, or whatever we're, to, like, uh, wherever we're headed. Uh, uh, but I'll be back. And Stan, uh, thanks. This is great, Stan. But keep an eye on that sp spike uh, slug soda. Okay, pen pal, I just came out here to, to, to let Spike's guard down. Also, uh... I think the safe word was Saskalula, but I'm I'm not sure that. Uh, um, okay, anyway, I gave this this is part two of my plans. It's, 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 uh, uh, Stan, can can you hear me with the ice? Okay, Stan can hear us, pen pal. Okay, Stan, you should have the uh, ship's computer track our destination and and lock it into some kind of memory. Um, because I guess you won't be able to tell me. Um, like, sir, we, uh, well, let's see, just check with the ship's computer. Is, is, did Spike put in a destination as soon as I left? Yes. Okay, but Spike doesn't know that we know. Um, okay, Stan, can you make sure that's backed up somewhere? Like, you're not plugged in, like, like uh, you, okay, there's, okay, you're safe. Can you, like, back that up somewhere where we can find it, you know, just in case? Yes, okay, so we have the destination. Let me just go peek in on the sisters uh, here. Hey, sisters, uh, wow, you really look ready for battle, like anything that, f f f you know, like uh, I'm trying to keep us out of battle, by the way. I'm working hard at it. Uh, also, I don't think, it, I think we're getting a meetup in space. I think, it, like, uh, there wasn't a destination originally. We weren't really going anywhere. I found that out. Uh, how did I find that out? Because I'm the quartermaster, the master of all quarters, and there's four quarters on this ship. Uh, we're actually, I'm the quartermaster, so things things go through me, including the ship. And uh, so we had no destination now we have one, but soon we will have no destination again. Uh, because I'm not allowed about to let us just blunder into anywhere. Actually, I gotta hurry up and get back to the main deck, but I don't want us just blundering in. You know, it'd be great if you, took, you, you could all get, you know, Gartok, and it was just a planet with Gartok all alone. Or whatever conspiracy is behind this mess that we're in with the, the great cloud. That would be terrific, sisters, but that's just not the case. And I hate to be the one to point out ridiculousness, but pillows taken from the ship's lounge. Oh, is that pillow from the quartermaster quarter? Uh, sister. Whew, okay. Uh, well, anyway, like, why'd you? Anyway, those pillows aren't going to stop anything. And if anybody's watched too many cartoons, sisters, so, I mean, I guess because of the mandatory cartoon watching. Is that where you get some of these ideas from? Okay, no more, Stan, no more mandatory cartoon watching for the crew. All right, sisters, I'll be back. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go back and, you know, take care of stuff. Why don't you, uh, ideally, unless something happens in the next four or five minutes, I don't think it will, though, uh, 
Okay, I'll be back. Hey, pen pal, are you still there? Great. Uh, I guess this is like it. This is like almost like a game of telephone, except there was no original message, and so uh, I don't know. I, I don't. I just was thinking about telephone for some reason, pen pal. I guess it's uh, anyway. Uh, quartermaster on deck here. How's everybody doing? Uh, you know, Swike, it was the strange thing that hit me when I left. Is that soda ready? No, it's not ready. Okay, well, that's fine, because I still have this one soda water here from Stan, so thanks for nothing. Uh, but you know what I thought of when I left, Spike, was the fact that uh, uh, I'm pretty sure you're not in charge of the ship, because uh, uh, you, you've been lying to me. Like, uh, you've been deceiving me, correct? You, you like, can you answer that now? That, uh, yes, Scooter, I can now that I'm in charge of the ship. Oh, okay. So before that, you weren't in charge of the ship. So, you, but, you, but I don't know, I guess I don't understand the strategy there. But you weren't in charge of the ship before, correct, Scooter? You turned control of the ship over for me when you, uh, decided you wanted some slug soda. Uh, right, but before that, we were just kind of uh, uh, driving around space with no place to go, huh? Uh, correct, Scooter. We were we were without a destination. Okay, well, um, here's some bad news: is that uh, I'm still in charge of the ship. You don't think it would just be so easy to take uh, uh, take over the ship, like just like we just assumed you were in charge of the ship, and then I accidentally turned it over. Oh, you were just buying time until. Correct, Scooter, I was buying time, but I no longer need to do that. Well, I actually do, because I can just take control. Like, I'm still in control of the ship. Like, uh, I just temporarily, like, I just, uh, I'm, I'm going to take control of the ship back. Scooter, I'm afraid I can't let you do that. No, 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 you, you can. I have a secret word. So uh, I'm going to take the ship back in five, uh, four. Scooter, I can't tell if you're bluffing. I'm going to have to delete some things. Oh, you go. Uh, hey, go ahead. You're gonna delete some stuff. Oh boy, I gotta, I gotta act fast. What is that uh, pesky? Uh, uh, oh, deleting finished scooter. Oh, it says Sas Saskalula. Okay, ship's computer. Stan, stan uh, ship's computer lock uh, spike out of uh, all controls, and uh, kick spike out. Oh, wait, Stan, are you relaying that to the ship's computer? Scooter, I am. Okay, Stan, get back hardwired. Hard, hardwired back, however that works. I don't, is that nanobots? How do, how do you do that? Uh, scooter, that's... Uh, the, the, it's, it's scooter, I'm hardwired back into the ship. Okay, don't, please don't tell me. Oh, so, oh boy, so I guess, it did it did Spike manage to delete all the stuff that we would have used to find out what Spike was up to? Scooter Spike did. But, oh yeah, it was a great stand, so we don't have any way to recover that data, data. Totally, totally lost, huh? Scooter, he does seem to have uh, eliminated all the da data. Wow, Spike, you really got us, uh... It's that's a shame, Scooter. I have uh, eliminated all things. Okay, well, sh Stan, take control of the ship. Let's uh, take evasive maneuvers and let's do two random jumps, uh, just in case. Because I'm pretty sure the original plan was just to, for someone to meet up with us. Normally, I would like to lay in wait, but I think uh, I can't trust Spike. So, Spike, it looks like you're still on the ship, though. Like, uh, we, like, because uh, I still, there's something about you I just, like, I both dislike and like, Spike. Scooter, I wish I could say the same about you. Okay, well, you just, you, it's better off when you're lying. Um, but I guess I got an idea. Spike, you're pretty strong at stuff, right? Uh, Stan, call down and tell the sisters to leave their clothes on. I mean, leave their clothes on for sure, but you know what I mean, Stan? Scooter, I believe I do. Okay, Spike, I'm going to put you on a dolly here. Oh, Scooter, where are we going? We're going to go downstairs for a little while. We're going to, like, uh, team building, Spike. Uh, uh, let's go through this door here. Did you see that, Spike? Did you see that? I only have two fingers on this dolly. I think you weigh, like, about 800 pounds. 
Scooter, I only know my weight in kilos. Okay, Spike. So anyway, Spike, this will... It, you, re, did you receive the sensitivity upgrades? Scooter, I did. Okay, so this will actually... Uh, you will feel this. Uh, the sisters are going to uh, exercise on you. We're going to do some... Like, you should try to squirt soda on them. Can you aim your soda for uh, comedy purposes? Uh, Scooter, I've never tried. Okay, we'll try to shoot. Oh, thanks. That's funny. That's funny. So, Spike, you sprayed it. I almost dropped a dolly, just so you know, because that's, is that the slug? It's like grape, but it's slimy. Holy cow. Scooter, that is the grape. Grape slug. Uh, did, I wonder if I could ever do advertising for them, because I could go glug, 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 glug. I love my grape slugs, you know. Um. Anyway, the sisters, hey, this is Spike. I'm glad you're all still ready. Why don't you do some battle with Spike? Spike, I'll see you later. Have fun, sisters. Okay, Spen Pal, that's it. P.S. Um, Spike's, you know, Spike's going to be, uh, you know, the, 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 the Spike will be functioning. Solid state stuff, Pen Pal. That was almost like a game of tell. Te- that's how the telephone in my brain works, Pen Pal. You've been receiving calls from it for a while now. And I'll talk to you soon, Pempe. I miss you so. Uh, P.S. Uh, cross my hearts and uh, dot my eyes with hearts. Bye, Pen Pal. All right, hey, everybody. Scoots here. And I was thinking of, uh, like, it's the holiday season, right? And you got your holiday specials. And I always seem to miss out on the holiday specials, the t- TV specials from when I was a kid. I think most of the TV specials that were on when I was a kid were ones that were older. And, you know, as we had, we saw with, uh, what was that one, Charlie Brown, I had, like, mixed feelings about The Great Pumpkin. And as I did grow a new level of appreciation watching it three times. And I kind of struggled, to be honest, with what I would do about, uh, like, the holiday specials because I said, well... And then there's this, this is a strange one, as, as you know, you, you know who's talking. Uh, but without controversy, I believe, the, the, the subject matter, well, yeah, without controversy, if you said to me, you can't watch any, like, this would be easy, this is like no debate, and you'll probably be surprised at the answer. But if you said to me, uh, What's the only, like, if I could take away every holiday special and and you can only watch one, this would be the one it is. And it's not technically a holiday special, though it's associated with the holidays. Or check that. For me, it is. And also, when you, when I, you know, one of the luxuries of making this podcast is really being able, I think I've overused parse out stuff lately, but this really gives me an opportunity to dig my hands into the loamy sto- soil that is my experience as a human being and take a look at it and wonder why. And as I wonder why I have such an affinity for the special, one of the interesting things is that because it isn't a holiday special, I don't think it's tied to very much nostalgia. Uh, because the, the actual nostalgia it is attached to as I rewatch this, this special multiple times and I pay, bought it, uh, and we'll talk about that in a second, but uh, is that the only nostalgia I have is for the exact reactions I have as an adult watching it and saying, I remember watching it as a kid and appreciating the same things. So so it's not a, it's not a, I don't know, a lot of times with nostalgia, it's like a, the memory associated with specials falling into a slot for something else, like whether it's security or pleasure or something not directly associated, I guess in my way, kind of like projection, like when you, like, uh, you're projecting something onto the special in associate or association. This special, I just like, and I, as a kid, I just liked it. I, I think, and I think love maybe, you know, I, I agree, I have great, great, great affinity for this. And it's, the, and even if the thing is confusing because it has two titles. And I always knew it as Babes in Toyland, but the technical name of this movie or special, it's not a special, it's a movie, March of the Wooden Soldiers, Laurel and Hardy's March of the Wooden Soldiers, Babes in Toyland, is I think the technical special. And, and so, like, uh, and you, there are places to watch this for free. I don't know if it's in the public domain or not. 
and I did purchase it. Now, unfortunately, like I was going to purchase, I was going to try to put, purchase a colorized version it just to add another layer of debate, but I heard to purchase the, black, the original version, but that's just, that's great. I'm glad about that because uh, the only reason I was going to buy the colorized version was this extra layer of um, something or other. And I can't remember the first time I saw this. Now, you know that I'm a great fan, or maybe you don't, um, of Laurel and Hardy. But I don't, like, my my mind doesn't create memories uh, the way probably people with good memories does. So I can't remember all the Laurel and Hardy I watch. And then the Three Stooges. I'm not a huge Abbott and Costello fan. I can't tell you why. I do appreciate them. Uh, but as far as comedy teams go, I'll take a look, like, a, a, I mean, the Three Stooges is, I guess that's a team, but that's more of a threesome. I mean, if I had to, to take Laurel and Hardy versus Three Stooges, I don't know what I would do. That would be, you know, a dilemma. But if you put it up against comedy duos, uh, for me, unless there's something I'm not thinking of, it's Laurel and Hardy all the way. And I think, it, like, I realized in this one, it's because, uh, like, uh, Stanny and I, I mean, we, we share we share a lot. I mean, including, I look a lot like him, I guess, it's, uh, at times, I think. Uh, so that's the special we're going to be talking about. And depending on the time, maybe we'll explore some of the thematic stuff. But mostly we'll just be going through a run-through. And I'm going to do it the same way I did the uh, Charlie Brown one for Halloween, which is that I watched it twice and then I'm going to be watching it. I'm going to be doing a, like a, like a pausing and playing it, which is another luxury of buying it and then being able to download it. Uh, so there you go. Get a digital, you know, there's a tip of the week, get a digital. I think I could probably link to affiliate link to this special too, but, uh, you know, do a download. I, I don't know who the money would go to though, in this case, other than, but whatever, you know, with Stan. So, so let me see. Just for anybody. So this is really old. This episode, this this movie predates me. It's a black and white movie. I have no facts in front of me about it, and I'd rather get, just get into the 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 meat of it, and then maybe we'll talk about the facts later. But it stars uh, people that are in the credits and Laurel and Hardy and Laurel and Hardy. Um, are the, I guess they're technically, I guess they technically, are they the stars? I don't know. You don't want to get too technical. And I don't know if this was like, uh, if they carried the movie. There are other versions of this movie. There's one with Annette Funicello that I've never seen, I don't think. And then I think in the 80s, there was another one with a lot of famous TV people. Maybe some people that are like ultra famous now. I don't know. I didn't Google it, but there was another version that I that I, I watched, I think even when the first time it was broadcast. But uh, for me, I don't know. Like I really like looked at this as neutrally as I could. With like, and uh, I'm not saying this is perfect. I mean, if you get into the plot and the story, but I, I did find for the most part my attention did not wane. It rolls in at a, like a brief like hour and ten minutes or ten seventeen minutes maybe. Um, one thing I might as well talk about this up front that I was blown away by and pre this is out of ignorance, but like, is the sound like when I know how hard it is to record a podcast and this is like whatever year, 2016, uh, I don't know a lot about the movie sounds in these, the black and white days, but how they get to the sound of, of the of the dialogue, I don't know. In the singing, there it, it's not a musical, but there is singing and wonderful, wonderful music. And uh, this, like, uh, this does have some um, things in it that will, like, that, that I wonder, uh, are they like? I haven't had time to investigate. That would be the second segment of this podcast if we have time is to investigate some of the things like. Uh, you know, they may be, it may have been, like, uh, insensitive at the time. I don't know, though. I haven't investigated deep enough to say either way. And some of these may prey on some deeper-seated, uh, uh, what do you call it, like, uh, so this is a kid's movie, but I, I don't know what age. You'd have to judge. There's not really any adult themes, but there is, uh, 
like stuff that would stir a kid up, but we're an adult, so I wouldn't. I don't know if you'd watch it at bedtime. And but the level of comedy in this, especially the physical comedy, and just some of the jokes, and I don't know. This was like again. I don't. I wish. I, like I got to listen to. Uh, uh, you you must remember this just to like see like I guess to rehash my knowledge of these period of movie making. Uh, but this was a, like one of these spectacle things because it seems like most of it was filmed on like one giant set, uh, like a giant, giant soundstage, like almost a theme park level soundstage. Uh, but let me pause it here because this is going to be a tough one because I have two sets of notes and I'm going to be playing the episode. So, so I'll be doing my best to keep the paper sounds out, but I'll be right back. Okay, it is with all things with this podcast. For some reason, I can't locate half of my notes, so I guess this won't be linear, but that should be fine. That'll give us some even more stuff. Uh, but the music starts, with this, which is a, one of the more famous parts about this, and, of course, this isn't a music podcast, and music wakes people up, but it, uh, it's like fanfare-type music, uh, which is one of the great, th- one of the reasons to love this. So the music starts, and there's like a... Uh, then there's like the MGM lion, but also to the left of the lion is an NRA symbol. Uh, not for that NRA, but I don't know what the National Recording Agency maybe or something. I don't know. And then we get uh, like a hint of what we'll see at the end of the movie, which is these toy blocks that say Hal Roach presents Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. And there's two toy soldiers. It kind of looks like a nursery room or a playroom. Uh, two toy, like British, like the beef eater style soldiers. And the music's playing. I think this, I can't listen to the music, obviously, and, and do this at the same time. But at some point, it goes into this March of the Wooden Soldiers theme. Then we see this book comes, or no, it's a box. It says Victor Herbert's Babes in Toyland. So I'm guessing Babes in Toyland is the music that preceded this. Oh, yeah, because it's composed by Victor Herbert, and uh, the books and lyric are by Glenn McDonough, and the camera pulls in as the credits start, and more credits run. And then pretty soon, it's playing in front of me, but uh, the Babes in the Toyland book will appear. And then we see, I thought it was the old woman that lives in the shoe, but I think it's Mother Goose. I don't think it's old Mother Hubbard, uh, but I, you know, I don't know all of my uh, nursery rhyme women. Who's on Cleet's book? Who's on Cleet's book? I don't know what that says, so I have to keep an eye out on that. Oh, who's on the cover of the book? There are two toy soldiers on the cover of the book, Drew, and she comes out of the book, but a real human, and she's singing, "When you've grown up, my dears, and are as old as I." You'll often ponder on the years that roll so swiftly. A beautiful singing, by the way, beautiful. I don't, I don't know the credits, of course. By my dears that roll so swiftly by. And the camera's pulling in, and she's singing to the camera. In all the many lands you've journeyed through. This is the closed captioning. I'm using, you know, a little behind the magic. Oft recall the best childhood land your childhood knew. And she's such, such lovely singing. Now we get this high tech, like we get high effects here because uh, she opens the book here and there's like a, a movie screen or a TV within the book. And I mean, this is a long time ago. And this also marks a very important part for me because this song, you want to talk about an earworm. I'm not even going to come close to singing it. But also, like, a song, if you want to improv it, uh, like uh, the song to- Toyland, as, as in Mother Goose or whatever. And she's also wearing a witch's hat. I don't understand that, but I think it's probably good for the rain, like a conical hat. But we have this, so the first person we see is a little Bo Peep who lost her sheep. Uh, and like I said, this is uh, picture in picture. Before, I mean, I don't know what year this is. Like, and that's how ignorant I am. I don't know if it's 1920, uh, 1940, 1950, 1960. Uh, but it's old, and uh, Mother Goose is singing, or no, she's not Mother Goose. Maybe she is. Then we see Tom, Tom, the Piper's son. So we get the uh, the love story, 
Then the little old lady who lived in the shoe, she's the uh, motherhood, the uh, matriarchy influence, and she has all these kids. Then we have the villain, Silas Barnaby, the meanest man in town. And he just goes, walks right up to the camera and stares right into it, and he's very good. Then uh, tertiary characters, Hey Diddle Diddle, the cat and the fiddle. It's a life-size, human-sized cat playing a cello, it looks to me. And then an imitation Mickey Mouse, which I have not investigated what it is. Probably because it, like, uh, it's just but the, the mouse we'll talk about a lot. Three little pigs, Elmo, Elmer, Willie, and Jigs. And they're dancing, and they seem very happy. And then our heroes, uh, Stanny Dumb and Ollie D, like to sleep, as you could see. So this is the perfect setup for the sleep with me, because they're in bed together. They both sleep on their backs, and they seem like they share the bed well. And they're doing the old effect where they sleep, and there's a feather going up and down, and they're breathing in, and the feather's going back out. And the second time I was watching it with a nine-year-old, and she was saying, oh, I wonder if that's on a string. I said, oh, thanks for ruining that. Uh, but the feather effect is they snore, and then at some point Stan swallows the Stanny in this movie, swallows the feather, and he starts, like, giggling in his sleep, which wakes Ali up, and then the Toyland music is still going. And then what we do is we cut to the town dancing. We see these cities, just a lot of stuff, city gates. You see windmills. You see people fishing. You see school caps. I don't know what that means. Then Mother Hubbard. Then my pen ran out of ink. Mother Goose. Uh, battling. Ballad of a bio. Or something. Little Miss Muffet. Then some garden girl. I don't know uh, what she, she what nursery rhyme. It seems like a lot of the characters are from nursery rhymes. Uh, then we had the kid, Peter Peter Pumpkin Eater. I, I don't know if it was him or, or it was a kid that had stuck his thumb in a pump a pie. Oh, but now you can see the set. There, there, it's like a setting in the mountains. I think there's a maypole, and people are, is that what that's called when you have the ribbons around the maypole? And there's still singing going on. There's a pond and a little, there's, oh yeah, there's like this strange uh, character in all the you're fishing and the, all the kids are gathered around uh, cheering on the fishing. Oh, then the uh, cops say, everybody in school, get on your way to school. Uh, and the, oh yeah, the school is like, uh, even everything's themed, even the school it, uh, has a book, a book. There's somebody that lives in a... Uh, Oh, there's a balloon man going off to work. He sleeps. He's got a little balloon-shaped house. Oh, there's little Miss Muffet sitting on her tuff at eating her curds and whey. Then there's this garden woman. I don't know her. And then the guy sticks his thumb in a pie. I don't know if that's Peter Peter Pumpkin Meter. Then a great rock by baby on the treetops. I can tell you this for sure. No bows will be broken in the making of this movie or this episode. It's all good for the baby. Uh, then crumpets. Is there a crumpet character? Someone leaving a wood, wood windmill with her crumpets. She's got candy cane fence. And then this freaking cat and mouse. Now, the mouse, I don't like this was one of the things that boggled my mind as a child was the mouse. Then the three pigs, it looks like the three pigs are going to school, but they live independently. One of the pigs is brushing their teeth, the one that lives in the straw house. Other pigs are saying, come on, let's go, let's move it here. And they head off to school, and they kind of shuffle. And you want, I mean, this is the old day, so, and then two mimes, are, yeah, mime clowns are jumping over each other. Uh the milk person, and then now we have the old woman that lives on the shoe, in the shoe, sending the kids off to school. Who's afraid of the big bad wolf at some point? I don't know what that. Maybe that's just a song. Oh yeah, a Jack, two Jack in the boxes, two leapfrogging people that we talked about. Too many kids at the old woman in the shoe's house. She's Bo Peep's mother. She's calling Bo Peep. Your children will be the death of me, she says. And then Bo Peep says, "Oh mother." And then she says, hey, don't lose your sleep. And then the villain Barnaby shows up at the front steps of their house. And he's got the villain song. I don't know if it's from Peter. No, wait, he doesn't show up here. My notes are wrong. 
She's getting her sheep. Oh, no, there's Barnaby with flowers. And first he says, hey, Miss Peep, how about I date your daughter, maybe marry her? Uh, he says, she's charming, little Bo Peep, Miss Bo Peep. And he, he said, can I pay my respects? And she says, uh, she's tending her sheep. She ain't home. Hit the road, Barnaby. And he's kind of like the crooked man. Like, he takes his hat off. He's got flowers. And this this is really, really good dialogue. I'll probably say it to you. See, he offers flowers. He says, a fragrant token of my deep devotion. She says, good. But she's very polite to him. A fragrant token of my deep devotions. And she says, thank you. She's polite but cold, uh, trying to maintain her boundaries. And she says, well, I got to get to work. You know, I'm dealing with the sheep. And he says, nay. He goes, I've gazed out with wonder on you. And uh, he's, he's kind of being a sleazeball. And he said, in short, I'm asking you to become my wife. She takes a breath, a deep breath. And she says, I'm sorry, Mr. Barnaby. You know, I hope you don't take this as ungrateful. And he says, well, I'm rich, by the way. Did, did you know I'm rich? And he, she tries to do the old uh, building rapport by touching her arm. And then he says, you know, there, he, goes, he goes, I'm going to win my wife. And she goes, I wouldn't marry you if you were honest, which you never were. If you were about to pass away tomorrow, which is too much to hope for, and something else, too. And he says, well, you're going to be singing a different tune. And then the sheep uh, bee, bee bleats, and he goes, bah. And he, like, almost like bah humbug and storms off. And Bo Peep looks a little, uh, and then she can't find her. She's fleecy or curly. She calls for a sheep. And then Barnaby goes back to the house, and he says, you're late on your mortgage. You know, that's his other means uh, to her mom. And he says, you better get on, on top of it. I'll be back. You know, uh, you know, I'm manipulating the uh, your socioeconomic conditions. Then the siren at the toy factory blows. Two whistles in the mouth of a a big face, and uh, which is really cool. I'd like to, like steam whistles. Uh, we see it's almost 8 o'clock, and Mother Goose, or who, old woman shoe, ma, Mother, uh, she calls up to the boys to, for work, and then we see uh, Ollie first. Ollie comes down. He says, good morning, Mother Peep. She says, good morning, Ollie. He's got, like, a lot of patches so we, on his clothes, so we see, okay. And then we hear a crash, and we get our first dose of comedy because Stanny's falling out a window off screen and has to knock on the front door. And he comes in. We see he's also got patches, and he says, uh, How'd you get down here? He goes, oh, it went out the window, by the way. He says, hey, Mom, what's up? I think it's never established that they're her kids. And then he he goes, Stan goes back upstairs. This is like this kind of uh, this repetitive thing he's got, which is amazing. This is another reason just to watch the movie is these uh, these peewees. But then also Ollie sees Mother is sad. And she says, well, Barnaby's, you know, trying to foreclose. And he says, well, she's like, I got some savings upstairs. Stan, go get my my money jar. He goes, I'll uh, pay off the mortgage this month. So I don't know if they're actually her children or they're like they bore, you know, they they live there. But this is like, uh, I always thought Ollie was mean-spirited, but he he's grouchy, but he's very generous. So he says, I'll pay for it. Don't worry. Uh which may be why, I don't, I don't know, like, uh, I guess I always kind of thought of him as having a little bit more, but I guess that's uh, Shemp, or not Shemp, uh, Mo. But then Stan comes back down, and, and this is a funny part uh, that I won't reveal, but he brings the money box down. Well, I will reveal it, he says, uh, and it's empty, of course, and he says, uh, I owe you dollar uh, forty-two. I think, let me see what it says. But there's humor, dollar forty eight, I was close, Stanny Dumb, D U M. And he says, Yeah, I borrowed it. He says, I know you borrowed it. Uh, what'd you borrow for now that we don't have anywhere to live? He said, Well, I need some more peewees, which are these things. I've never seen this toy before. But it's like you hit it with a stick and it's kind of like a boomerang. Uh, it's amazing. Just in in some of the way it's used in the movies, worth watching. 
And on the rewatches, you know, they're, they're probably using some camera tricks, but also you see that Stan is actually hitting these things. Like you hit it and it flies up, and then you hit it again like a baseball. But Stan, then, then we get some more comedy because Ollie says, hey, I'm going to go I'll borrow the money at work. You know, I'll ask the toy maker. You know, we work at the toy shop. I'll, you know, we're, and you get some good, real good jokes in there. And and then that's like the audible jokes are topped out with more physical humor. And then they get out front and then we get a little comeuppance because he says, what's this peewee business you've been spending all your money on? And man, just watching these two physically, it's really, really great. Uh, and so Stan puts it down. And this is really impressive. Like, wow, I don't know how they would have. Oh, maybe it was on a string, maybe. I mean, when it's doing the boomerang, it's clear it's on a string. But uh, good physical comedy. It's also like uh, just watching their stuff going on in the background I just saw. So uh, whatever that's called where, uh, you know, there's visceral stuff or whatever. And then Ali says, well, whatever you can do, I can do better. Uh, so, and Stan's like, yeah, good luck. You got to hit this thing on the ground, bounce it up and hit it. It's not going to happen. And then you, you, there's so much in here. I can't even reveal the different funny things and just watching. And if you've got a kid, if it's, if you have a nine-year-old daughter, there's really a lot of giggles. So it's another level of visceral enjoyment laughing with your child while watching and it pretty much stood up. I mean, she mostly, I think she did pay attention through the whole thing. We took a break in the middle. And Ollie can't do it, which kids like when the know-it-all tries to do something and it humiliates themselves. And non-publicly, it's just the two of them. And he gets really mad uh, that he doesn't have the same physical skills as Stan. And then Stan says, well, let me show you how it's done. And uh, then he, uh, he he accidentally knocks Barnaby's hat off. Uh, let's see, peewee business, physical humor galore, knocks off Barnaby's hat. Barnaby comes, he comes after them. This is when he goes into the camera. He catch, catches him at the toy factory, breaks the peewee stick. Uh, he blames Ollie instead of Stan. He removes half of Stan's, uh, Ollie's mustache, which was... Uh, uh, terribly rude. And then they're late for work because uh, they've had so much, you know, they've been trying to help and then they were playing around. And uh, another funny thing, and this is stuff I do all the time, when, you, when you're late and you try to sneak in all smooth and then they knock like a bunch of stuff onto uh, a drum of all things. So then the boss yells at them, says you're late again. And they work in Santa's toy shop. Uh, probably like Santa's like subletting these because this couldn't be, this is a smaller operation, I guess. But this is Toyland. But maybe there's multiple Toylands. And their job, they're painting uh, a bunny. One of them is painting a wooden bunny. And the other one is painting a wooden horse head. Like for one of those horses you would ride around and pretend, I think. And then they they have a little dialogue exchange where Stan's pressuring Ollie to ask for the money. But, you know, the boss is in a bad mood, so Ollie tries to use, the, like, the old opposite rule on Stan and say, well, he likes you better than me anyway. So Stan then it backfires. Uh, what does this mean? Toymaker has a gate home to shut them up. Uh, I don't know what that means. Uh, uh his toy maker has a gate home to shut them up. Uh, but you Stan goes to, Ollie goes to ask after Stan entraps him. And then he says, you know, no, 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 no. Get back to work. And then Stan gets so nervous. Like while Ollie's asking, he's playing with a toy train, which he drops when the toy maker gets mad, which knocks paint off and spills on the toy maker. And then, of course, the toy maker's wicked annoyed. Uh, then we see Bo Peep who can't find her sheep anywhere and she's looking and looking and then she's kind of sad and defeated. And then we see Tom Tom, he's singing, oh, no, just some singing dude at first comes. And, and is it Tom Tom? I don't know. In these notes, it's not clear. And they ask Jack and Jill and then they ask Red Riding Hood. 
And the more I watched it, the more I like appreciated this song and how it really grows. Because uh, Bo Peep's looking for a sheep, and the the, the uh, chorus of the song go, goes, Don't cry, Bo Peep, don't cry. And then this community comes together to help her look for the sheep. Slowly, characters and characters uh, come together. They seek low and high. Uh, Mother Goose, Miss Moffat, never mind Bo Peep. That's another chorus part. Uh, really, really great music. I guess i got to look and see if I can listen to it online by itself. Uh, but you know when the musicals and the chorus is hitting hitting it together, it's really good. The whole town at some point comes together. Even the mime clowns are participating. And then they have this thing where the soldiers are going, ba, ba, ba. And everyone's calling for the sheep. And, uh, like, the, the, the they, go, they walk to the pond at the center of the town, and the voices are going back and forth. Uh, excellent, excellent musical stuff. And then there's a little comedy, like, because it's like this thing, this ongoing issue she has with how long it takes her to find her sheep. Uh, and then what happens is then, what's his name, Tom Tom, he makes, he, he, he says, uh, he says, well, geez, you know, uh, you need some help finding your sheep. It'd have to be like a, uh, the most unusual, resourceful, energetic, uh, uh, have a way with any mouth of practices. Uh, but it's really cute, actually, because uh, he's trying to, to kind of seduce her, and she's playing him off like, nope, not interested. And he's like, not even a little bit. And it was really fun with my daughter, too, the second time, like because uh, they're crossing their arms and looking away. And you know what's going to happen. And uh, they ba- they look back. And then they kiss, and then it actually was really. I saw. I saw it at least. It was. Uh, I think he says something to her. I will have to find my second notes or wait till. But then they kind of like. Uh, I mean, I think that there's an intonation, even though it's public and in the center of the square. He says something somewhat alluring, and she says, "Yeah, it okay, sounds good." And then we see just her toes kind of rubbing together. You know. Like, her toes are curling of the toes. And I don't even know if in the 1930s, you know, just, uh, I mean, I guess a big kiss can can curl your toes. Oh, and i watching them walk through the town now again, singing, Mother Goose is right with them. Uh, But then, like, uh, they pull back the camera, she sighs, and they hug after, you know, like a post-coital thing. And then the sheep are there, and, like, the camera pulls back, and the whole town's there watching them. And uh, everyone's laughing, and uh, she kind of shames the sheep. She says, she's, what are you doing? And then Tom Tom says, hey, this is the future Miss Piper, by the way. We're going to get married. And then there's this big party, because uh, everyone's celebrating. The Three Pigs band's playing. And the cat and the fiddle are playing, and even the cat shakes the mouse's hand. This is at thirty-six. This is tw- oh, twenty-six minutes. This this is the WTF moment for me. Twenty. If you only watch anything on this, it's at twenty-six minutes. Because uh, I still don't know how to make any sense of this, so even as a child and as an adult. Uh, and I, I think it's probably unfortunate. I said, "Geez, did they stuff some sort of uh, primate into a mouse suit?" Uh, but, but if you like, seriously, this is like a get, there's like a couple of gifable moments or gifable moments in this. And this is one of them. So do yourself a favor because you can get it on YouTube 26 minutes into this one. Uh, the cat's playing, the mouse is clapping and then the mouse just starts rolling around on like laying around and rolling around on the ground. And uh, it just doesn't mean it just it's just mind boggling. And it's kind of funny and strange. I mean, because they could have cut it out of the movie, obviously. So I didn't, like I still didn't know if it was a special effect or as a trained animal. Uh, but it's just, it's just awesome. I mean, it's just awesomely strange. Even my daughter, this was the second time she saw it, but it's been a few years. She was like, Kay, what's what's happening? And this is in front of the Toyland Inc. company. And then the mouse, like, does what mouse and cats do, like, just like Tom and Jerry, throws a brick at the cat. 
Uh, then Santa comes. Uh, Santa, this is when you get your ho- a little dose of holiday. And Santa's mobbed by the kids. And he, he, Santa says, well, I got to see the toy maker. Then we see the cat is chasing the mouse on the roof. Uh, as Santa goes into a, a toy workshop. Okay, I'm watching the cat and the thing. I still don't know what's happening. I mean, the cat is definitely a human. And the cat's really jamming on the fiddle. Uh, but I don't know what is happening with the mouse. And uh, it's like the mouse goes into fugue state in some strange way. Okay, but then we have Santa at the shop, uh, the toy ma- the toy makers, you know. And he says, I'm here to check in these toy soldiers. I want to see the ones I ordered. Is everything on schedule? Oh, yeah, no doubt. Ollie and Stan show Santa the wooden soldiers. And then we have the great music, the March of Wooden Soldiers music, as Stan and Ollie bring, or Ollie brings out a life-size, uh, like, toy soldier, like, uh, six, seven feet tall. And Santa says, oh, geez, I ordered 600 soldiers at one foot, uh, not 100 soldiers at six foot. And toy makers look, who took that order? And Stan's kind of like, ooh, uh, which brought up the issue of, like, how does Santa call in orders? You know, like, uh, he, is he calling there? And saying, oh, 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 I need a, which would be hard. I mean, you're on the phone with Santa. That's going to be stressful. Uh, but, yeah, like, uh, yeah, that's, uh, let's see. That's, like, uh, let's see. So they get fined or Anston. Oh, they get fired. Man, my handwriting really went off the rails here. Santa, oh, like the soldier even knocks into Santa, and Santa falls into a drum and laughs. Then they get fired. A disaster? I think maybe that's a, oh, another, this is another mess, fine mess you've gotten me into. He doesn't say that, but uh, he says, uh, this is another disaster or mess. Oh, this is another mess you've gotten us into. He does say that. And a soldier's on the loose, which is foreshadowing alert if you're taking notes. Oh, then Santa laughs and falls in a drum. Oh, no, Santa's laughing the whole time, I guess. Is the toy shop's totally destroyed by the soldier. And then the boss, this is a good one. He calls them blithering idiots, uh, which was great. And then Stan goes, uh, Ali, aren't you going to ask him for the money? And he goes, oh, boy. And then... Uh, you know, then we have Bo Peep at her mom's house. She says, good news, Mom, I'm marrying Tom Tom. My, may nothing uh, happen to mar your happiness, I think she says to them. And then dun-dun-dun, Barnaby shows up to ruin the day. And the mom's pretty confident, though, because she's like, he's like, hey, I'm here for the mortgage money. She goes, oh, the guys are just getting off work anyway. So she's expecting Ollie and Stan to save the day, and they roll in, and she goes, well, I got the money, haven't we, boys? And then uh, Ollie made a mistake. He says, uh, oh, Stan says, Ollie made a mistake. He said, hey, him and the toy maker are just like that. Uh, uh, Ollie tries to pick Barnaby's pocket, but there's a trap in there. He says, big bait catches big rat. Uh, and he says, uh, like, uh, Oh, Ali and Stan uh, also say, we'll get that old buzzard after Barnaby leaves. And then, like, Barnaby's listening while they're talking trash about him. So then Barnaby uh, kind of, uh, uh, I guess clunk, that's not a bad word, but, like clunks a Stan. And this is Jiffa Giffable moment number two, 33 minutes, right around 33 doubles, 33.30. This one I watched, I could watch it a thousand times. This is so good. It is such comedy gold. And I don't know if this was a happy accident, how many times they shot this scene. Uh, But this is 33 minutes into this movie, 33.30. Like, so Stan's been hit on the head and Barnaby leaves and Stan wakes up and then Stan says, uh, "Open." you know, they're talking about they've been defeated by the villain. Stan says, open up that window. And he picks up a rolling pin, and then he kind of does the thing he was doing with the peewees with, uh, I don't know what it is. Let me get, let me forward it here. Uh, But Barnaby's walking away down their thing. Yeah, so he grabs, uh, 
oh, a spoon, a big spoon, and then uh, like a rolling pin, and he whacks it out the window, and it, it, it clips Barnaby, but Barnaby falls like so perfectly. I mean, you want to talk about, I don't even know what Pratt fall means, but uh, one of the greatest Pratt falls I've ever seen, like just takes this uh, great comedy dive because it like he totally wasn't expecting it. I mean, I was feeling like a shod and Freud, uh, like for my schadenfreude or whatever you call it. Or, yeah, schadenfreude city. I mean, I was uh, laughing at it. Then Stan does this famous move where he itches his head with his whole hand, uh, which is always funny. Scratches his head. Then the scene cuts, and then we have this sneaky sound at the warehouse, and Stan is in disguise. And he brings this big present, which has Ollie in it. And he says, uh, take me to Barney's house, uh, Barnaby's house. It's like this big Christmas present. And this was just funny because it was ridiculous. Like Stan rings the bell at the house and Barnaby says, who is it? He's got like a candle and a stocking cap. And he says, oh, uh, Stan says, me, Stan, I got a Christmas present for you. And Barnaby says, I'll be right down. And he says, yeah, bring it on. He goes, well, this is nice of you. And he says, yeah, we want to apologize. Uh, but then there's a reveal, which you should just watch for yourself, uh, which gets Stan and Ollie busted because, uh, uh, like, for burglary, they, they get sentenced to dunking in exile. And Stan, Ollie says, good night, Ollie, because that's how Stan, when Stan was leaving, Ollie, the whole idea was that Ollie was going to steal the mortgage. He was hidden inside the box. Once Barnaby went to bed, it said, "Do not, it's July. Do not open the present till July, Christmas. So he would sneak out of the box, get the mortgage, and then Barnaby would know until the holidays, you know, how they got them, you know, or maybe, I don't know. Uh, but they get busted. There's a old King Cole, is, I guess, I think that's who was in charge of this village. Uh, what are we waiting for? Says the king, uh, king with the pipe. And then, so they're going to dunk Stan and Ollie in the lake or the little town pond. And, uh, so Ollie goes first. So he says, Hey, Stan, hold my watch. I don't want anything to happen to this. And then we have a pretty long sequence of Stan, of Ollie getting dunked and like just physical comedy, which is really good with Stan's reactions uh, it's pretty over the top, and then, but in a good way, especially for kids too. And then uh, stands, then the then, but then uh, Bo Peep's so upset that they would be exiled that she says, "Do you know what? I'll marry Barnaby if you don't exile my brothers or my, you know, friends." Uh, she says, "I'll become Miss Silas Barnaby." Uh, oh, also, so the, the comedy, though, at the end is that, like, so Stan was holding Ollie's watch, and then as Ollie gets out, you know, they say, well, you don't have to get dunked then, uh, Stan. And Stan says, Ollie, have a drink, and Ollie just goes to have a drink. Also, Stan's eating a loaf of bread the whole time, which is strange, or more just just hilarious, I guess, not strange. Uh, but, you know, then, like, so, oh, so I guess I'm trying to explain this joke, but Stan, Ollie pushes Stan into the lake because, you know, he's mad that uh, Stan's not going to get dunked, and that's when, but Ollie has uh, Stan's watch. Okay, so then, uh, and then Ollie just raises his hands. Then it's wedding day, so it's this wedding day comedy with Stan and Ollie eating, and Stan's kind of talking gibberish. I don't know what that means, uh. And Ollie's going to give Bo Peep away. I don't know if he's the best man or what. And Stan's so upset about it. He says, he says I'm so upset I'm housebroken, which was uh, funny. And he says, you can't turn blood into a stone. And he says, to Mother Goose says, I'm going to go talk to Barnaby. And he goes, well, you can't, you know, it's pouring one ear into another or something. It can't be done. I don't know. It's, you got to watch this movie. It's just so good. Uh, the mom goes to plead to, please to Barnaby, like, uh, please don't marry my daughter. You know, she's got a shot at happiness. And he calls her fool, which is, you know, not very nice. Uh, but then it's wedding time. Ollie shows up at the, uh, the, the, the bride. Tom Tom's watching through a window. And, you know, they, they go through the wedding and this time to kiss the bride. 
And then they say, have you forgotten something? And then Barnaby rips up the mortgage, and it's revealed that Stan's the bride. And Ollie laughs, and he says, big bait catches big rat, which was a great you know payoff from the other earlier joke. And, you know, Barnaby says, the king will hear about this. What does that mean, Olio? Uh, but the whole town, they start to celebrate, and everybody's dancing, and uh, uh, Tom Tom climbs the shoe to kiss uh, his lady. And then Ollie still dresses a bride, or Stan still dresses a bride, and Ollie says, Goodbye, Stan. And he says, What do you mean, goodbye? He goes, Well, you married, uh, he goes, You married him, so, you know, you're going to have to, uh, you know, it's good knowing you. It's just so funny. He goes, I don't want to stay with him. I don't love him. It's just really funny and genuine and not in an offensive way, like where you just say, geez, are they going to make some kind of uh, like offensive joke here? They don't. Uh, it's honestly like to Stan, he's like, well, I can't marry this man because I don't love him. Uh, it's just hilarious. I, I don't know. Like in the just the physical comedy, uh, don't have to worry. What does that say? I think that's Tom Tom to... He tells her, oh, he says, we're going to run away to some place, a castle in Spain. He sings a, a song on the side of a hill by some G city. My daughter said, well, the, now Barnaby will know where they live. Uh, he plays like shoelace guitar, which was cute. Oh, side of the hill by Granada. And you know, Barnaby's mad. He's muttering into a mirror at his house. He says, so they think they can outsmart Barnaby. Oh, there's got to be something, got to be something. And then he actually, his, his uh, house worker hits him in the face with a mop and then yells at the guy. And he says something about pigs. And he says, oh, wait a second, pigs. And he decides to frame Tom Tom for pig napping. And this was part as a kid I didn't really like, but he goes and the, goes to the pigs. And the, I don't know if the pigs have short memories because he's really like the pigs don't like him. And they try to hide. He can't get into the brick of the wooden house, so, but he blows away the straw house. And then he plants evidence at Tom Tom's house. And the, but then the pigs forgot because they're just sad and they're crying with a reef in front of their brother's house. And then we just see a proclamation, Tom Tom guilty of uh, you know, pig napping, and he's going to like be uh, like King Cole signs that it is King Cole. Um that he's, he's, he's exiled. And then Stan and Ollie are sitting in front of the police station. They're sad. They're talking. The cat's listening in, and they're talking about, uh, you know, stuff that were archetype. Like, this is a lot of archetype stuff. Like, they're like, you know, about exile. I don't want to get too deep into it. You know, it's a silly podcast. But and the cat's listening in. And then the cat and Stan or Ollie kind of play on Stan's fears. And someone even says, Tom, Tom, how could you? I think the king says that. And he says, I didn't do nothing. And he goes, well, what about the evidence? I don't know. It's some, since this was predating its time, like DNA, this, this is all planted. And then we, this strange thing happens. The police station, one of the cops goes out and kind of shakes his behind, like uh, like shakes his tail feather. And then he leaves the evidence with Stan and Ollie. And Ollie's like kind of like asleep and Stan's kind of eating the sausages, which were planted as proof. And Stan's like a sausage, like both these two are sausage experts, I guess, because Stan knows, he goes, this isn't pig, it's pork. And, uh, but Ali tastes it, he goes, yeah, so you're right, it's beef. And, and he says, I smell a rat. What does this say? Barnaby, lots of quiet jokes. Uh, but Bo Peep's begging for Tom Tom's release. Oh, I think just uh, Barnaby's, you know, saying bad stuff about Tom Tom. And then Tom Tom's escorted out. They get on a mossy raft and they go into the swamp. And uh, uh, you, you see different creatures that live in swamps. Nothing, you know, nothing like, you know, like uh, nice ones, like cuddle bears and stuff. And then, Bar oh, then Barnaby talks trash about uh, Tom Tom. Then Ollie and Stan come with Elmer. He was, they say, he was in Barnaby Cellar, and then the uh, city, uh, you know, everybody tries to mob Barnaby, and then the king says, I'll give you 50,000 Yeti or something to whoever catches him. Uh, Bo Peep heads out to the exile to save Tom Tom. 
uh, Stan and Ollie uh, go after Barnaby, and then the Barnaby goes down a well. Secret pass. Oh, he has a secret passage in the well, though, but Stan and Allie don't know that, so they wait him out at the top of the well. Uh, then Tom Tom and Bo Peep find one another, and they try to find their way out there in these kind of stalactite and stalagmite caves, and they start singing to one another. I think I saw a cypress tree. And then he sings like a lullaby, I go to sleep, Bo Peep, and she falls asleep, and then, like, uh, this really weird sequence happens that uh, still doesn't make any sense. But these transparent, uh, like, like uh, I didn't know if they were, like, supposed to be, like, like what is that movie, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves? I don't know what it was. Like, they're gnome, like garden gnomes uh, or something. And then there's, like, a wizard. I don't know if it was the sand man, like, who throws, like, sand over them, magic dust, and Tom Tom falls asleep. Uh, but it just didn't, I don't know. I was like, what does this all mean? And then the wizard just, they all run off. And I was like, WTF, double question mark. Uh, then Stan, we go to the well and Stan and Allie are asleep at the well. And they're like, did he come up? And they're like, no, 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 no. And then, so Allie says, well, I'll just take him, take him out in the well, put him to the big farm. So he throws a giant thing down the well. And then they go down and there's no Barnaby. And then we see Barnaby, like, uh, defines the sleeping Bo Peep and Tom Tom. He says, hey, Bo Peep, come with me. And then kind of him and Tom Tom have it out in a, like, a little action sequence. Uh, Tom Tom lands this, like, glass jaw move, which was pretty good on Barnaby. But Barnaby's got a cane, and then uh, Barnaby falls on a web covered in dust. And then Barnaby's so mad that... Uh, like, he starts banging on stalactites with his cane. There is, like, yes, yeah, a wooden stick. And then uh, all these Care Bears come, but they're not, the, they're like the Care Bears. Like, remember there was one Care Bear, I mean, it was a Care Bear movie. What are Care Bears? Good question. Caring Bears, but these are bears that no longer care. I guess these are, like, the apathetic ones. The bears that used to care, I guess. Care Bears were, big, like, when my sister was little. Like, they were bears that cared for you, whether you, you know, if you needed, like, a smile or whatever. They, they were there to care for those few because they lived in the forest of feelings. These apathetic bears, they don't care. The bears, they, they're, and they might be careless. There might be some that are careless, too. Uh, but Barnaby raises his club and says, let's, let's, let's not care. Let's be careless and not care. And leads them off, and then Stan and Ollie go through the passage into the caves in pursuit of Barnaby. And then you get kind of a classic chase sequence where you're running around corners, like, uh, and people are crossing paths, and there's all these different passages, and uh, everyone meets up. Stan and Ollie run into uh, Tom Tom and Little Bo Peep. And then they hide, and then they sneak back through the well, and then they've escaped. And then everyone's in their pajamas when they get there, the whole town. Well, maybe it's, it looks like children. I'm looking at the gnome sequence now. And, oh, but the wizard was flying. But the lizard, wizard does have a stocking cap on. So I guess it's like me. That's the, it doesn't make sense why the sequence is there even now. Uh, but everyone's in the PJs, and they're so happy that they're returned. Lots of nightgowns. Everyone's in a nightgown. But Barnaby and the bears that no longer care, They Barnaby grabs this torch, and they all have their torches, and they say, we're going to go to the city, and we're going to be careless in this city of caring, you know. We're going to counter the care with care. We don't, we don't care, and we're careless. Uh, so we'll see how you all fare, you know, without our care. Or something like that. I don't, I can't, you know. Uh, oh, but before they get there, Allie's bragging. Like, oh boy, did we do these Care Bears in. We showed them how to care. They were careless. We tied their shoes. They didn't care. We taught them about the issues, you know. Uh, they were apathetic and we appealed, you know, we appealed beyond uh, thought and, and, and to their feelings, you know, to the, the stuff inside. And he goes, we're heroes, kind of. And then they arrive, and Stan and Ollie run as everyone tries to run and hide. 
and this is kind of the pinnacle of the movie because uh, all the careless bears they come with Barnaby. They're up to no good. Seeing an alley run into the toy shop, and the care careless and the care, care bears that don't care, they don't care. Uh, but it gives you a lot of good physical comedy. Stan and, Stan and Ollie grab some darts, and Stan does the thing with the darts with a stick. And he's doing so many, you can see it's kind of a camera trip, but he's still hitting the darts. And then the mouse uh, steals a Zeppelin with, uh, like, these, uh, like, extra strength torpedoes. And then they start just taking, they, they just start in, injecting caring into the, they just start tying shoes, I guess, for the care bear, careless care bears or the bears that formerly cared or whatever. You know, there's a lot of special effects, like the mouse flying the Zeppelin is a cool special effect. And the mouse saves the cat who's stuck on a windmill. And Stan is like total money with this hitting the uh, the, the darts of caring. That's an injection of, I don't know if it was, whichever the empathy hormone is. And this, this is, I mean, it's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of visuals in the sequence. Uh uh, mouse at some point uh, Stan accidentally pops the zeppelin and the mouse has a parachute uh, mother's uh, mother goose's shoe or whoever the old woman's shoe is under siege we see some pig teamwork uh, and then Stan gets the idea for the wooden soldiers he says we've got all these wooden soldiers back here and then we get to one sequence that doesn't quite fit but it makes sense they have this stop motion sequence with all the the kind of special effects and a split screen, which is kind of advanced. Like there's spot stop motion uh, going by live action and the wooden soldiers come to town and they take, they take, they say, if you can't care. And I guess this isn't that, you know, this isn't about right or wrong. This is just this movie. They say, we'll escort you out of town. I think it was more about the carelessness though, than the not caring, I think. Cause they said, well, yeah, cause there's kids here. Your carelessness is, you know, danger to the kids. So they say they escort all the careless bears out of town. Uh, also, I'm looking now the mouse, and even the mouse has pajamas, which is funny. Um, and the great music is playing. Uh, and then they chase everybody out of town. And then there's one last comedy scene because they have a cannon full of darts of uh, the empathy. Uh, what did I say that was? A hormone? And they say, let's give him one parting shot. Uh, and actually, the parting shot ends up stands in charge. Of it. So it, of course, gets Ollie. And Ollie has so much empathy now that he can't he can't even be grouchy at Stan, which was, you know, wonderful. And then it says, and they lived happily ever after. And it's I think that's the end. And I guess the movie clocks in, it looks like, at around 117, 118. And uh, I've been talking for like an hour, it looks like. Uh, but yeah, I'm just going to watch the end. Is, uh, uh, it's just like a lot of everyone's laughing. And it says, yeah, and they lived happily ever after the end. It shows Mother Goose flying on a goose uh, over something. And then it says the date. Let me see. I just rewind. Like, uh, oh, 1991. That was when this version came out. Oh, that was the color version, which this was not the color version. But anyway, um, and that's uh, March of Wooden Soldiers, uh, Laurel and Hardy's and Walt's, Walt, March of Wooden Soldiers. Good night.